Full Cast Audio presents Graceling by Kristen Kishore. Part 1 The Lady Killer Chapter 1 In these dungeons, the darkness was complete. But Katza had a map in her mind, one that had so far proven correct, as all's maps tended to do. Katza ran her hand along the cold walls, and counted doors and passageways as she went, turning when it was time to turn, stopping finally before an opening that should contain a stairway leading down. She crouched and felt forward with her hands. There was a stone step, damp and slippery with moss, and another one below it. This was Al's staircase then. She only hoped that when he and Giddon followed her with their torches, they would see the moss slime, tread carefully, and not waken the dead by clattering headlong down the steps. Katza slunk down the stairway, one left turn and two right turns. She began to hear voices as she entered a corridor where the darkness flickered orange with the light of a torch set in the wall. Across from the torch was another corridor where, according to all, anywhere from two to ten guards should be standing watch before a certain cell at the passageway's end. These guards were Katz's mission. It was for them that she had been sent first. Katz crept toward the light and the sound of laughter. She could stop and listen to get a better sense of how many she would face, but there was no time. She pulled her hood down low and swung around the corner. She almost tripped over her first four victims, who were sitting on the floor across from each other, their backs against the wall, legs splayed, the air stinking with whatever strong drink they'd brought down here to pass the time of their watch. Katza kicked and struck at temples and necks, and the four men lay slumped together on the floor, before amazement had even registered in their eyes. There was only one more guard sitting before the cell bars at the end of the corridor. He scrambled to his feet and slid his sword from its sheath. Katza walked toward him, certain that the torch at her back hid her face, and particularly her eyes, from his sight. She measured his size, the way he moved, the steadiness of the arm that held the sword toward her. Stop there. It's clear enough what you are. His voice was even. He was brave, this one. He cut the air with his sword in warning. You don't frighten me. He lunged toward her. She ducked under his blade and whirled her foot out, clipping his temple. He dropped to the ground. She stepped over him and ran to the bars, squinting into the darkness of the cell. A shape huddled against the back wall, a person too tired or too cold to care about the fighting going on. Arms wrapped around legs, and head tucked between knees. He was shivering. She could hear his breath. She shifted, and the light glanced over his crouched form. His hair was white and cut close to his head. She saw the glimmer of gold in his ear. Al's maps had served them well, for this man was a Leonid. He was the one they were looking for. She pulled on the door latch. Locked. Well, that was no surprise, and it wasn't her problem. She whistled once, low, like an owl. She stretched the brave guard flat on his back and dropped one of her pills into his mouth. She ran up the corridor, turned the four unfortunates on their backs beside each other, and dropped a pill into each mouth. Just as she was beginning to wonder if Al and Giddon had lost themselves in the dungeons, they appeared around the corner and slipped past her. A quarter hour, no more, she said. A quarter hour, my lady. Al's voice was a rumble. Go safely. Their torchlight splashed the walls as they approached the cell. The leaned man moaned and drew his arms in closer. 
Katza caught a glimpse of his torn, stained clothing. She heard Giddens' ring of lockpicks click against itself. She would have liked to have waited to see that they opened the door, but she was needed elsewhere. She tucked her packet of pills into her sleeve and ran. <laughs> The cell guards reported to the dungeon guard, and the dungeon guard reported to the underguard. The underguard reported to the castle guard. The night guard, the king's guard, the wall guard, and the garden guard also reported to the castle guard. As soon as one guard noticed another's absence, the alarm would be raised, and if Katza and her men weren't far enough away, all would be lost. They would be pursued, it would come to bloodshed. They would see her eyes and she would be recognized. So she had to get them all, every guard. Al had guessed there would be twenty. Prince Raffin had made her thirty pills, just in case. Most of the guards gave her no trouble. If she could sneak up on them, or if they were crowded in small groups, they never knew what hit them. The castle guard was a bit more complicated, because five guards defended his office. She swirled through the lot of them, kicking and kneeing and hitting, and the castle guard jumped up from his guardhouse desk, burst through the door, and ran into the fray. I know a graceling when I see one. He jabbed with his sword, and she rolled out of the way. Let me see the colors of your eyes, boy. I'll cut them out. Don't think I won't. It gave her some pleasure to knock him on the head with the hilt of her knife. She grabbed his hair, dragged him onto his back, and dropped a pill onto his tongue. They would all say, when they woke to their headaches and their shame, that the culprit had been a Graceling boy, graced with fighting, acting alone. They would assume she was a boy, because in her plain trousers and hood she looked like one, and because when people were attacked, it never occurred to anyone that it might have been a girl. And none of them had caught a glimpse of Al or Giddon. She had seen to that. No one would think of her. Whatever the Graceling Lady Katza might be, she was not a criminal who lurked around dark courtyards at midnight, disguised. And besides, she was supposed to be en route east. Her uncle Randa, King of the Midlands, had seen her off just that morning, the whole city watching, with Captain Al and Giddon, Randa's underlord, escorting her. Only a day of very hard riding in the wrong direction could have brought her south to King Mergen's court. Katza ran through the courtyard, past flower beds, fountains, and marble statues of Mergen. It was quite a pleasant courtyard, really, for such an unpleasant king. It smelled of grass and rich soil and the sweetness of dew-dripped flowers. She raced through Mergen's apple orchard, a trail of drugged guards stretching out behind her. Drugged, not dead, an important distinction. Al and Giddon and most of the rest of the secret council had wanted her to kill them, but at the meeting to plan this mission, she'd argued that killing them would gain no time. What if they wake? Giddon had said. Prince Raffin had been offended. You doubt my medicine? They won't wake. It would be faster to kill them, Giddon had said, his brown eyes insistent. Heads in the dark room had nodded. I can do it in the time allotted, Katza had said. And when Giddon had started to protest, she'd held up her hand. Enough. I won't kill them. If you want them killed, you can send someone else. Al had smiled and clapped the young lord on the back. Just think, Lord Giddon. It'll make it more fun for us. The perfect robbery. Past all of Mergen's guards and nobody hurt. It's a good game. The room had erupted with laughter, but Katza hadn't even cracked a smile. She wouldn't kill, not if she didn't have to. A killing couldn't be undone, and she'd killed enough. Mostly for her uncle. King Randa thought her useful. When border ruffians were stirring up trouble, why send an army if you could send a single representative? It was much more economical. But she'd killed for the council, too, when it couldn't be avoided. This time it could be avoided. At the far end of the orchard, she came upon a guard who was old, as old, perhaps, as the Leonid. He stood in a grove of yearling trees, 
leaning on his sword, his back round and bent. She snuck up behind him and paused. A tremor shook the hands that rested on the hilt of his blade. She didn't think much of a king who didn't retire his guards in comfort when they'd gotten too old to hold a sword steady. But if she left him, he would find the others she'd felled and raise the alarm. She struck him once, hard, on the back of the head, and he slumped and let out a puff of air. She caught him and lowered him to the ground as gently as she could, and then dropped a pill into his mouth. She stood a moment to run her fingers along the lump forming on his skull. She hoped his head was strong. She had killed once by accident, a memory she held close to her consciousness. It was how her grace had announced its nature a decade ago. She'd been a child, barely eight years old. A man who was some sort of distant cousin had visited the court. She hadn't liked him, his heavy perfume, the way he leered at the girls who served him, the way his leer followed them around the room, the way he touched them when he thought no one was watching. When he'd started to pay Katza some attention, she had grown wary. Such a pretty little one, he'd said. Graceling eyes can be so very unattractive, but you, lucky girl, look better for it. What is your grace, my sweetness? Storytelling? Mind reading? I know. You are a dancer. Katza hadn't known what her grace was. Some graces took longer than others to surface. But even if she had known, she wouldn't have cared to discuss it with this cousin. She'd scowled at the man and turned away. But then his hand had slid toward her leg. And her hand had flown out and smashed him in the face. So hard and so fast that she'd pushed the bones of his nose into his brain. Ladies in the court had screamed. One had fainted. When they'd lifted him from the pool of blood on the floor and he'd turned out to be dead, the court had grown silent, backed away. Frightened eyes, not just those of the ladies now, but those of the soldiers, the sordid underlords, all directed at her. It was fine to eat the meals of the king's chef, who was graced with cooking, or send their horses to the king's graced horse doctor. But a girl graced with killing? This one was not safe. Another king would have banished her, or killed her, even if she was his sister's child. But Branda was clever. He could see that in time his niece might serve a practical purpose. He sent her to her chambers and kept her there for weeks as punishment but that was all. When she emerged, they all ran to get out of her path. They'd never liked her before, for no one liked the graced, but at least they'd tolerated her presence. Now there was no pretense of friendliness. Watch for the blue-eyed, green-eyed one, they would whisper to guests. She killed her cousin with one strike because he complimented her eyes. Even Randa kept out of her way. A murderous dog might be useful to a king, but he didn't want it sleeping at his feet. Prince Raffin was the only one who sought her company. You won't do it again, will you? I don't think my father will let you kill anyone you want. I never meant to kill him. What happened? Katza sent her mind back. I felt like I was in danger, so I hid him. Prince Raffin shook his head. You need to control a grace. Especially a killing grace. You must, or my father will stop us seeing each other. This was a frightening notion. I don't know how to control it. Raffin considered this. You could ask all. The king's spies know how to hurt without killing. It's how they get information. Raffin was eleven, three years Katz's senior, and by her young standards, very wise. She took his advice and went to Al, King Randa's graying captain and his spymaster. Al wasn't foolish. He knew to fear the quiet girl with one eye blue and one eye green. But he also had some imagination. He wondered, as it had occurred to no one else to wonder, whether Katza hadn't been just as shocked by her cousin's death as everyone else. And the more he thought about it, the more curious he became about her potential. He started their training by setting rules. 
She would not practice on him, and she would not practice on any of the king's men. She would practice on dummies that she made out of sacks, sewn together and filled with grain. She would practice on the prisoners that all brought to her, men whose deaths were already decreed. She practiced every day. She learned her own speed and her own explosive force. She learned the angle, position, and intensity of a killing blow versus a maiming blow. She learned how to disarm a man and how to break his leg and how to twist his arms so severely that he would stop struggling and beg for release. She learned to fight with a sword and with knives and daggers. She was so fast and focused, so creative, she could find a way to beat a man senseless with both arms tied to her sides. Such was her grace. In time, her control improved, and she began to practice with Randa's soldiers, eight or ten at a time and in full suits of armor. Her practices were a spectacle, grown men grunting and clattering around clumsily, an unarmed child whirling and diving among them, knocking them down with a knee or a hand that they didn't see coming until they were already on the floor. Sometimes members of the court would come by to watch her practices, but if she caught their gaze, their eyes would drop and they would hurry on. King Randa had not minded the sacrifice of all's time. He thought it necessary. Katza wouldn't be useful if she remained uncontrolled. And now, in King Mergen's courtyard, no one could criticize her control. She moved across the grass beside the gravel paths swiftly, soundlessly. By now, Al and Giddon must almost have reached the garden wall, where two of Mergen's servants, friends of the council, guarded their horses. She was nearly there herself. She saw the dark line ahead, black against a black sky. Her thoughts rambled, but she wasn't daydreaming. Her senses were sharp. She caught the fall of every leaf in the garden, the rustle of every branch. And so she was astonished when a man stepped out of the darkness and grabbed her from behind. He wrapped his arm around her chest and held a knife to her throat. He started to speak, but in an instant she had deadened his arm, wrenched the knife from his hand, and thrown the blade to the ground. She flung him forward, over her shoulders. He landed on his feet. Her mind raced. He was graced, a fighter. That much was clear, and unless he had no feeling in the hand that had raked her chest, he knew she was a woman. He turned back to face her. They eyed each other warily, each no more than a shadow to the other. He spoke. I've heard of a lady with this particular grace. His voice was gravelly and deep. There was a lilt to his words. It was not an accent she knew. She must learn who he was, so that she could know what to do with him. I can't think what that lady would be doing so far from home, running through the courtyard of King Mergen at midnight, he said. He shifted slightly, placed himself between her and the wall. He was taller than she was, and smooth in his movements, like a cat, deceptively calm, ready to spring. A torch on the path nearby caught the glimmer of small gold hoops in his ears, and his face was unbearded, like a leanid. She shifted and swayed, her body ready, like his. She didn't have much time to decide. He knew who she was, but if he was a leanid, she didn't want to kill him. Don't you have anything to say, lady? Surely you don't think I'll let you pass without an explanation. There was something playful in his voice. She watched him quietly. He stretched his arms in one fluid motion, and her eyes unraveled the bands of gold that gleamed on his fingers. It was enough. The hoops in his ears, the rings, the lilt in his words. It was enough. You're a leanid. You have good eyesight. Not good enough to see the colors of your eyes. He laughed. I think I know the colors of yours. Common sense told her to kill him. You're one to speak of being far from home. What's a leanid doing in the court of King Mergen? I'll tell you my reasons if you'll tell me yours. I'll tell you nothing, and you must let me pass. Must I? If you don't. 
I'll have to force you. Do you think you can? She faked to her right, and he swung away easily. She did it again, faster. Again, he escaped her easily. He was very good. But she was Katza. I know I can. Ah. His voice was amused. But it might take you hours. Why was he playing with her? Why wasn't he raising the alarm? Perhaps he was a criminal himself, a Graceling criminal. And if so, did that make him an ally or an enemy? Wouldn't a Lenid approve of her rescue of the Lenid prisoner? Yes, unless he was a traitor. Or unless this Lenid didn't even know the contents of Mergen's dungeons. Mergen had kept the secret well. The council would tell her to kill him. The council would tell her she put them at risk if she left a man alive who knew her identity. But he was unlike any thug she'd ever encountered. He didn't feel brutish or stupid or threatening. She couldn't kill one Lenid while rescuing another. She was a fool, and she would probably regret it, but she wouldn't do it. I trust you, he said suddenly. He stepped out of her path and waved her forward. She thought him very strange and impulsive, but she saw he'd relaxed his guard, and she wasn't one to waste an opportunity. In an instant, she swung her boot up and clipped him on the forehead. His eyes opened wide with surprise, and he dropped to the ground. Maybe I didn't have to do that. She stretched him out, his sleeping limbs heavy. But I don't know what to think of you, and I've risked enough already letting you live. She dug the pills out of her sleeve, dropped one into his mouth. She turned his face to the torchlight. He was younger than she'd thought, not much older than she, nineteen or twenty at most. A trickle of blood ran down his forehead, past his ear. The neck of his shirt was open, and the torchlight played along the line of his collarbone. What a strange character. Maybe Raffin would know who he was. She shook herself. They would be waiting. She ran. They rode hard. They tied the old man to his horse, for he was too weak to hold himself up. They stopped only once to wrap him in more blankets. Katza was impatient to keep moving. Doesn't he know it's midsummer? He's frozen through, my lady, Al said. He's shivering. He's ill. It's no use if our rescue kills him. They talked about stopping, building a fire, but there was no time. They had to reach Randa City before daybreak or they would be discovered. Perhaps I should have killed him, she thought as they thundered through the dark forests. Perhaps I should have killed him. He knew who I was. But he hadn't seemed threatening or suspicious. He'd been more curious than anything. He'd trusted her. Then again, he hadn't known about the trail of drugged guards she'd left in her wake, and he wouldn't trust her once he woke to that welt on his head. If he told King Mergen of their encounter, and if Mergen told King Randa, things could get very tricky for the Lady Katza. Randa knew nothing of the Lenid prisoner, much less of Katza moonlighting as rescuer. Katza shook herself in frustration. These thoughts were no help, and it was done now. They needed to get the grandfather to safety and warmth and Raffin. She crouched lower in her saddle and urged her horse north. Chapter 2 It was a land of seven kingdoms, seven kingdoms and seven thoroughly unpredictable kings. Why in the name of all that was reasonable would anyone kidnap Prince Tilif, the father of the Lenid king? He was an old man, he had no power, he had no ambition, he wasn't even well. Word was, he spent most of his days sitting by the fire or in the sun, looking out at the sea, playing with his great-grandchildren, and bothering no one. The Lenid people didn't have enemies. 
They shipped their gold to whoever had the goods to trade for it. They grew their own fruit and bred their own game. They kept to themselves on their island, an ocean removed from the other six kingdoms. They were different. They had a distinctive dark-haired look and distinctive customs, and they liked their isolation. King Roar of Lenid was the least troublesome of the seven kings. He made no treaties with the others, but he made no war, and he ruled his own people fairly. That the council's network of spies had traced King Roar's father to King Mergen's dungeons in Sunder answered nothing. Mergen tended not to create trouble among the kingdoms, but often enough he was a party to the trouble, the agent of another man's crime, as long as the money was good. Without a doubt, someone had paid him to hold the Lenid grandfather. The question was, who? Katz's uncle, Randa, king of the Midlands, was not involved in this particular trouble. The council could be certain of this, for Al was Randa's spymaster and his confidant. Thanks to Al, the council knew everything there was to know about Randa. In truth, Randa usually took care not to involve himself with the other kingdoms. His kingdom sat between Estel and Wester on one axis, and between Nander and Sunder on the other. It was a position too tenuous for alliances. The kings of Wester, Nander, and Estel, they were the source of most of the trouble. They were cast from the same hot-headed mold, all ambitious, all envious, all thoughtless and heartless and inconstant. King Byrne of Wester and King Drowden of Nander might form an alliance and pummel Estel's army on the northern borders, but Wester and Nander could never work together for long. Suddenly one would offend the other, and Wester and Nander would become enemies again, and Estel would join Nander to pound Wester. And the kings were no better to their own people than they were to each other's. Katza remembered the farmers of Estel that she and Al had lifted secretly from their makeshift prison in a cowshed weeks before. Estel and farmers, who could not pay the tithe to their king, Thigpen, because Thigpen's army had trampled their fields on its way to raid a Nandarin village. Thigpen should have been the one to pay the farmers. Even Randa would have conceded this, had his own army done the damage. But Thigpen intended to hang the farmers for non-payment of the tithe. Yes. Burn, Drowden, and Thigpen kept the council busy. It had not always been like this. Wester, Nander, Estel, Sunder, and the Midlands, the five inner kingdoms, had once known how to coexist peacefully. Centuries back, they had all been of the same family, ruled by three brothers and two sisters, who had managed to negotiate their jealousies without resorting to war but any acknowledgment of that old family bond was long gone now. The kingdom's people were at the mercy of the natures of those who rose to be their rulers. It was a gamble, and the current generation did not make for a winning hand. The seventh kingdom was Monsi. The mountains set Monsi apart from the others, as the ocean did for Lenid. Lek, king of Monsi, was married to Ashen, the sister of King Roar of Lenid. Lek and Roar shared a dislike for the squabbles of the other kingdoms, but this didn't forge an alliance, for Monsi and Lenid were too far removed from each other, too independent, too uninterested in the doings of the other kingdoms. Not much was known about the Monsian court. King Lek was well liked by his people, and had a great reputation for kindness to children, animals, and all helpless creatures. The Monsian queen was a gentle woman. Word was she'd stopped eating the day she'd heard of the Lenid grandfather's disappearance, for, of course, the father of the Lenid king was her father as well. It had to be Wester or Nander or Estel who had kidnapped the Lenid grandfather. Katza could think of no other possibility, unless Lenid itself was involved, a notion that might seem ridiculous if it hadn't been for the leaned man in Mergen's courtyard. His jewelry had been rich. He was a noble of some sort, and any guest of Mergen's warranted suspicion. 
but Katza didn't feel he was involved. She couldn't explain it, but it was what she felt. Why had Grandfather Teelef been stolen? What conceivable importance could he have? They reached Randa City before the sun did, but only just. When the horses' hooves clattered onto the stones of city roads, they slowed their pace. Some in the city were already awake. They couldn't tear through the narrow streets. They couldn't make themselves conspicuous. The horses carried them past wooden shacks and houses, stone foundries, shops with their shutters closed. The buildings were neat, and most of them had recently been painted. There was no squalor in Randa City. Randa didn't tolerate squalor. When the streets began to rise, Katza dismounted. She passed her reins to Giddon and took the reins of Tilif's horse. Giddon and all turned down a street that led east to the forest, leading Katza's horse behind them. This was the arrangement. A grandfather on horseback and a boy at his side climbing to the castle were less likely to be noticed than four horses and four riders. Al and Giddon would ride out of the city and wait for her in the trees. Katza would deliver Tilif to Prince Raffin through a high doorway in a defunct section of the castle wall, the existence of which Al kept carefully from Randa's notice. Katza pulled the old man's blankets more firmly around his head. It was still fairly dark, but if she could see the hoops in his ears, then others would be able to see them as well. He lay on the horse, a huddled shape, whether asleep or unconscious she did not know. If he was unconscious, then she couldn't think how they were going to manage the last leg of the journey, up a crumbling staircase in Randa's wall, where the horse couldn't go. She touched his face. He shifted and began to shiver again. You must wake, Lord Prince. I can't carry you up the steps to the castle. The gray light reflected in his eyes as they opened, and his voice shook with coldness. Where am I? This is Randa City in the Midlands. We're almost to safety. I didn't think Randa the type to conduct rescue missions. She hadn't expected him to be so lucid. He isn't. Hmm. Well, I'm awake. You'll not have to carry me. The Lady Katza, is it? Yes, Lord Prince. I've heard you have one eye green as the Midlands grasses, and the other eye blue as the sky. Yes, Lord Prince. I've heard you could kill a man with the nail of your smallest finger. She smiled. Yes, Lord Prince. Does it make it? Easier? She squinted at his form, hunched in the saddle. I don't understand you. To have beautiful eyes. Does it lighten the burden of your grace to know you have beautiful eyes? She laughed. No, Lord Prince. I'd happily do without both. I suppose I owe you my gratitude, he said and then settled into silence. She wanted to ask, For what? From what have we rescued you? But he was ill and tired, and he seemed asleep again. She didn't want to pester him. She liked this leaned grandfather. There weren't many people who wanted to talk about her grace. They climbed past shadowed roofs and doorways. She was beginning to feel her sleepless night and she would not rest again for hours. She replayed the grandfather's words in her mind. His accent was like the man's, the leaned man's in the courtyard. In the end, she did carry him, for when the time came, she couldn't wake him up. She passed the horse's reins to a child crouched beside the wall, a girl whose father was a friend of the council. Katza tipped the old man over her shoulder and staggered one step at a time up the rubble of the broken stairway. 
the final stretch was practically vertical. Only the threat of the lightning sky kept her going. She'd never imagined that a man who looked like he was made of dust could be so heavy. She had no breath to produce the low whistle that was to be her signal to Raffin, but it didn't matter. He heard her approach. The whole city has likely heard your approach, he whispered. Honestly, Cat, I wouldn't have expected you to be capable of such a racket. He bent down and eased her load onto his own thin shoulders. She leaned against the wall and caught her breath. My grace doesn't give me the strength of a giant. You one grace don't understand. You think if we have one grace, we have them all. I've tasted your cakes, and I remember the needlework you used to do. I've no question a good number of graces have passed you over. He laughed down at her in the gray light, and she smiled back. It went as planned? She thought of the Leonid in the courtyard. Yes, for the most. Go now, and safely. I'll take care of this one. He turned and crept inside with his living bundle. She raced down the broken steps and slipped onto a pathway leading east. She pulled her hood low and ran toward the pink sky. <laughs> Chapter 3 Katza ran past houses and work shacks, shops and inns. The city was waking, and the streets smelled of baking bread. She ran past the milkman, half asleep on his cart, his horse sighing before him. She felt light without her burden, and the road sloped downward. She ran quietly and fast into the eastern fields and kept running. A woman carried buckets across a farmyard, the handles hanging from a yoke balanced on her shoulder. When the trees began, Katza slowed. She had to move carefully now, lest she break branches or leave boot prints and create a trail straight to the meeting place. Already the way looked a bit traveled. Al and Giddon and the others on the council were never as careful as she, and of course the horses couldn't help creating a path. They would need a new meeting place soon. By the time she broke into the thicket that was their hideout, it was daylight. The horses grazed. Giddon lay on the ground. Ah leaned against a pile of saddlebags. Both men were asleep. Katza choked down her annoyance and passed to the horses. She greeted the animals and lifted their hooves one by one to check for cracks and gravel. They'd done well, the horses and at least they knew better than to fall asleep in the forest, so close to the city and such a great distance from where Randa supposed them to be. Her own mount wickered, and all stirred behind her. And if someone had discovered you, sleeping at the edge of the forest when you were supposed to be halfway to the eastern border? She spoke into her saddle and scratched her horse's shoulder. What explanation would you have given? I didn't mean to sleep, my lady, Al replied. That's no comfort. We don't all have your stamina, my lady, especially those of us with gray hair. Come now, no harm was done. He shook Giddon, who responded by covering his eyes with his hands. Wake up, my lord. We'd best be moving. Katza said nothing. She hung her saddlebags and waited by the horses. Al brought the remaining saddlebags and fastened them in place. Prince Tilif is safe, my lady? He's safe. Giddon stumbled over, scratching his brown beard. He unwrapped a loaf of bread and held it out to her. But she shook her head. I'll eat later. Giddon broke off a piece and handed the loaf to Al. Are you angry that we weren't performing strength exercises when you arrived, Katza? Should we have been doing gymnastics in the treetops? You could have been caught, Giddon. You could have been seen, and then where would you be? You would have thought of some story. You would have saved us like you do everyone else. He smiled, his warm eyes lighting up a face that was confident and handsome, but that failed to please Katza at the moment. Giddon was younger even than Raffin, strong and a good rider. He had no excuse for sleeping. Come, my lord. Let's eat our bread in the saddle. Otherwise, Our Lady will leave without us. She knew they teased her. She knew they thought her too critical. 
but she also knew she wouldn't have allowed herself to sleep when it was unsafe to do so. Then again, they would never have allowed the Graceling Lenid to live. If they knew, they'd be furious, and she wouldn't be able to offer any rational excuse. They wound their way to one of the forest paths that paralleled the main road and set out eastward. They pulled their hoods low and pushed the horses hard. After a few minutes, the pounding of hooves surrounding her, Katz's irritation diminished. She couldn't be worried for long when she was moving. The forests of the southern Midlands gave way to hills, low hills at first, that would grow as they neared Estel. They stopped only once at midday to change their horses at a secluded inn that had offered its services to the council. With fresh horses they made good time, and by nightfall they approached the Estelin border. With an early start they could reach the Estelin estate that was their destination by mid-morning, do their business for Randa, and then turn back. They could travel at a reasonable pace and still return to Randa City before nightfall of the following day, which was when they were expected. And then Katza would know whether Prince Raffin had learned anything from the Lenid grandfather. They made camp against an enormous rock crag that broke through the base of one of the eastern hills. There was a chill to the night, but they decided against a fire. Mischief hid in the hills along the Estelin border and though they were safe with two sordid men and Katza, there was no reason to attract trouble. They ate a supper of bread, cheese, and water from their flasks, and then they climbed into their bedrolls. I'll sleep well tonight, Giddon said, yawning. It's lucky that inn came forward to the council. We would have ridden the horses into the ground. It surprises me, the friends the council is finding. Giddon propped himself up onto his elbow. Did you expect it, Katza? Did you think your council would spread as it has? What had she expected when she'd started the council? She'd imagined herself alone, sneaking through passageways and around corners, an invisible force working against the mindlessness of the kings. I never even imagined it spreading beyond me. And now we have friends in almost every kingdom. People are opening their homes. Did you know one of the Nandarin border lords brought an entire village behind his walls? when the council learned of a Westeran raiding party. The village was destroyed, but every one of them lived. He settled down onto his side and yawned again. It's heartening. The council does some good. Katza lay on her back and listened to the men's steady breathing. The horses, too, slept, but not Katza. Two days of hard riding and a sleepless night between, and she was awake. She watched clouds flying across the sky, blotting out the stars and revealing them again. The night air puffed and set the hill grass rustling. The first time she'd hurt someone for Randa had been in a border village not far from this camp. An underlord of Randa's had been exposed as a spy on the payroll of King Thigpen of Estel. The charge was treason, and the punishment was death. The underlord had fled toward the Estelin border. Katza had been all of ten years old. Randa had come to one of her practice sessions and watched her, an unpleasant smile on his face. Are you ready to do something useful with your grace, girl? He called out to her. Katza stopped her kicking and whirling and stood still struck by the notion that her grace could have any beneficial use. Hmm, Randa said, smirking at her silence. Your sword is the only bright thing about you. Pay attention, girl. I'm sending you after this traitor. You're to kill him in public, using your bare hands, no weapons, just him, no one else. I'm sure we all hope you've learned to control your bloodlust by now. Katza shrank suddenly, too small to speak, even if she'd had something to say. She understood his order. He refused her the use of weapons because he didn't want the man to die cleanly. Randa wanted a bloody, anguished spectacle, and he expected her to furnish it. <laughs> 
Katza set out with Al and a convoy of soldiers. When the soldiers caught the underlord, they dragged him to the square of the nearest village, where a scattering of startled people watched, slack-jawed. Katza instructed the soldiers to make the man kneel. In one motion, she snapped his neck. There was no blood. There was no more than an instant's pain. Most in the crowd didn't even realize what had happened. When Randa heard what she'd done, he was angry, angry enough that he called her to his throne room. He looked down at her from his raised seat, his eyes blue and hard, his smile nothing more than a baring of teeth. What's the point of a public execution if the public misses the part where the fellow dies? I can see that when I give orders, I shall have to compensate for your mental ineptitude. After that, his commands included specifics, blood and pain, for this or that length of time. There was no way around what he wanted. The more Katza did it, the better she got at it. And Randa got what he wished, for her reputation spread like a cancer. Everyone knew what came to those who crossed King Randa of the Midlands. After a while, Katza forgot about defiance. It became too difficult to imagine. On their many travels to perform Randa's errands, all told the girl of things Randa's spies learned when they crossed into the other kingdoms, young girls who had disappeared from an Estelin village and reappeared weeks later in a western whorehouse. A man held in an Andoran dungeon as punishment for his brother's thievery, for his brother was dead, and someone had to be punished. A tax that the king of Wester had decided to levy on the villages of Estel, a tax Wester's soldiers saw fit to collect by slaying Estelin villagers and emptying their pockets. All these stories Randa's spies reported to their king, and all of them Randa ignored. Now, a Midlands lord who had hidden the majority of his harvest in order to pay a smaller tithe than he owed? Here was worthwhile news. Here was a problem relevant to the Midlands. Randa sent Katza to crack the lord's head open. Katza couldn't say where the notion had come from, but once it pushed its way into her mind, it would not leave. What might she be capable of if she acted of her own volition? and outside Randa's domain. It was something she thought about, something to distract herself as she broke fingers for Randa and twisted men's arms from their sockets. And the more she considered the question, the more urgent it became, until she thought she would blaze up and burn from the frustration of not doing it. In her sixteenth year, she brought the idea to Raffin. It just might work, he said. I'll help you, of course. Next, she went to Al. Al was skeptical, even alarmed. He was used to bringing his information to Randa, so Randa could decide what action to take. But he saw her side of it eventually, slowly, once he understood that Katza was determined to do this thing with or without him, and once he convinced himself that it would do the king no harm not to know every move his spymaster made. In her very first mission, Katza intercepted a small company of midnight looters that the Estelin king had set on his own people and sent them fleeing into the hills. It was the happiest and headiest moment of her life. Next, Katza and all rescued a number of western boys enslaved in a Nandran iron mine. One or two more escapades, and the news of their missions began to trickle into useful channels. Some of All's fellow spies joined the cause, and one or two underlords at Randa's court, like Gidden, All's wife, Bertel, and other women of the castle. They established regular meetings that took place in secluded rooms. There was an atmosphere of adventure at the meetings, of dangerous freedom. It felt like play, too wonderful, Katza thought sometimes, to be real. Except that it was real. They didn't just talk about subversion. They planned it and carried it out. Inevitably, over time, they attracted allies outside the court, the virtuous among Randa's border lords 
who were tired of sitting around while neighboring villages were plundered, lords from the other kingdoms and their spies, and bit by bit the people, innkeepers, blacksmiths, farmers, everyone was tired of the fool kings. Everyone was willing to take some small risk to lessen the damage of their ambition and disorder and lawlessness. Tonight, in her camp on the Estelin border, Katza blinked at the sky, wide awake, and thought about how large the council had become, how fast it had spread, like one of the vines in Randa's forest. It was out of her control now. Missions were carried out in the name of the council in places she'd never been, without her supervision, and all of it had become dangerous. One careless word spoken by the child of some innkeeper, one unlucky encounter across the world between two people she'd never met, and everything would come crashing down. Her missions would end. Randa would see to it. And then, once again, she would be no more than the king's strong arm. She shouldn't have trusted the strange Lenid. Katza crossed her arms over her chest and stared at the stars. She would like to take her horse and race around the hills in circles. That would calm her mind, tire her out. But it would tire her horse as well, and she wouldn't leave Al and Giddon alone. And besides, one didn't do such things. It wasn't normal. She snorted and then listened to make sure that no one woke. Normal. She wasn't normal. A girl graced with killing? A royal thug? A girl who didn't want the husbands Randa pushed on her? Perfectly handsome and thoughtful men? A girl who panicked at the thought of a baby at her breast or clinging to her ankles? She wasn't natural. If the council were discovered, she would escape to a place where she wouldn't be found, Lenid or Monsi. She'd live in a cave, in a forest. She'd kill anyone who found her and recognized her. She wouldn't relinquish the small amount of control she'd taken over her life. She must sleep. Sleep, Katza, she told herself. You need to sleep to keep your strength. And suddenly, tiredness swept over her, and she was asleep. Chapter 4 In the morning they dressed like themselves, Giddon in traveling clothes befitting a Midlands underlord, and Al in his captain's uniform. Katza changed into a blue tunic lined with the orange silk of Randa's courts and the matching trousers she wore to perform Randa's errands, a costume to which she consented only because she was abusive to any dresses she wore while riding. Randa didn't like to think of his graceling killer doling out punishment in torn and muddy skirts. It was undignified. Their business in Estel was with an Estelan border lord who had arranged to purchase lumber from the southern forests of the Midlands. He had paid the agreed price, but then he'd cleared more than the agreed number of trees. Randa wanted payment for the additional lumber, and he wanted the lord punished for altering the agreement without his permission. I give you both fair warning, Al said as they cleared the camp of their belongings. This lord has a daughter graced with mind-reading. Why should you warn us? Isn't she at Thigpen's court? King Thigpen has sent her home to her father. Katza yanked hard on the straps that attached her bag to her saddle. Are you trying to pull the horse down, Katza, or just break your saddle bag? Katza scowled. No one told me we'd be encountering a mind-reader. I'm telling you now, my lady, and there's no reason for concern. She's a child. Most of what she comes up with is nonsense. Well, what's wrong with her? What's wrong with her is that most of what she comes up with is nonsense. Or useless, irrelevant, and she blurts out everything she sees. She's out of control. She was making Thigpen nervous. So he sent her home, my lady, and told her father to send her back when she became useful. In Estel, as in most of the kingdoms, Gracelings were given up to the king's use by law. The child whose eyes settled into two different colors weeks, months, or on the rarest occasions, years after its birth, 
was sent to the court of its king and raised in its king's nurseries. If its grace turned out to be useful to the king, the child would remain in his service. If not, the child would be sent home, with the court's apologies, of course, because it was difficult for a family to find use for a graceling, especially one with a useless grace, like climbing trees, or holding one's breath for an impossibly long time, or talking backward. The child might fare well in a farmer's family, working among the fields with no one to see or know. But if a king sent a graceling home to the family of an innkeeper or a storekeeper in a town with more than one inn or store to choose from, business was bound to suffer. It made no difference what the child's grace was. People avoided a place if they could, if they were likely to encounter a person with eyes that were two different colors. Thigpen's a fool not to keep a mind reader close just because she's not useful yet. They're too dangerous. What if she falls under someone else's influence? Giddon was right, of course. Whatever else the mind readers might be, they were almost always valuable tools for a king to wield. But Katza couldn't understand why anyone would want to keep them close. Randa's chef was graced, and his horse handler, and his winemaker, and one of his court dancers. He had a juggler who could juggle any number of items without dropping them. He had several soldiers, no match for Katza, but graced with sword fighting. He had a man who predicted the quality of the next year's harvest. He had a woman brilliant with numbers, the only woman working in a king's counting house in all seven kingdoms. He also had a man who could tell your mood just by putting his hands on you. He was the only graceling of Randa's who repelled Katza, the only person in court besides Randa himself whom she took pains to avoid. Foolish behavior on the part of Thigpen is never particularly surprising, my lord. What kind of mind reader is she? They're not sure, my lady. She's so unformed. And you know how the mind readers are. Their grace is always changing and so hard to pin down. Adults before they've grown into their full power. But it seems as if this one reads desires. She knows what it is other people want. Then she'll know I'll want to knock her senseless if she so much as looks at me. Katza spoke the words into the mane of her horse. They were not for the ears of her companions, for them to pull apart and make a joke of. Is there anything else I need to know about this border lord? She asked aloud as she stepped into her stirrup. Perhaps he has a guard of a hundred graced fighters, a trained bear to protect him. Anything else you've forgotten to mention? There's no need to be sarcastic, my lady. Your company this morning is as pleasant as always, Katza. Katza spurred her horse forward. She didn't want to see Giddens' laughing face. The Lord's Holding stood behind gray stone walls at the crest of a hill of waving grasses. The man who ushered them through the gate and took their horses told them that his Lord sat at his breakfast. Katza, Giddon, and all stepped directly into the great hall without waiting for an escort. The Lord's courtier moved forward to block their entrance into the breakfast room. Then he saw Katza. He cleared his throat and opened the grand doors. Some representatives from the court of King Randa, my lord, he said. He slipped behind them without waiting for a response from his master and scampered away. The Lord sat before a feast of pork, eggs, bread, fruit, and cheese with a servant at his elbow. Both men looked up as they entered, and both men froze. A spoon clattered from the Lord's hand onto the table. Good morning, my lord. We apologize for interrupting your breakfast. Do you know why we're here? The Lord seemed to struggle to find his voice. I haven't the slightest idea, he said, his hand at his throat. No? Perhaps the Lady Katza could help you bring it to mind. Lady? Katza stepped forward. All right, all right. The Lord stood. His legs jarred the table and a glass overturned. He was tall and broad-shouldered, larger even than Giddon or All, clumsy now with his fluttering hands and his eyes that flitted around the room but always avoided Katza. A bit of egg clung to his beard. So foolish, such a big man, so frightened. 
Katza kept her face expressionless so that none of them would know how much she hated this. Ah, you've remembered, have you? You've remembered why we're here. I believe I owe you money. I imagine you've come to collect your debt. Very good. Giddon spoke as if to a child. And why do you owe us money? The agreement was for how many acres of lumber? Remind me, Captain. Twenty acres, my lord. And how many acres did the Lord remove, Captain? Twenty-three acres, my Lord. Twenty-three acres. That's rather a hefty difference, wouldn't you agree? A terrible mistake. The Lord's attempt at a smile was pained. We never realized we'd need so much. Of course, I'll pay you immediately. Just name your price. You've caused King Randa no small inconvenience. You've decimated three acres of his forest. The king's forests are not limitless. No, of course not. Terrible mistake. We've also had to travel for days to settle this matter. Our absence from court is a great nuisance to the king. Of course, of course. I imagine if you doubled your original payment, it would lessen the strain of inconvenience for the king. The lord licked his lips. Double the original payment. Yes, that seems quite reasonable. Giddon smiled. Very good. Perhaps your man will lead us to your counting house? Certainly. The Lord gestured to the servant at his side. Quickly, man, quickly. Lady Katza, Giddon said as he and all turned toward the door. Why don't you stay here? Keep his lordship company. The servant led Giddon and all from the room. The big doors swung shut behind them. Katza and the Lord were alone. She stared at him. His breath was shallow his face pale. He didn't look at her. He seemed as if he were about to collapse. Sit down. He fell into his chair and let out a small moan. Look at me. His eyes flicked to her face and then slid to her hands. Randa's victims always watched her hands, never her face. They couldn't hold her eyes, and they expected a blow from her hands. Katza sighed. He opened his mouth to speak, but nothing came out but a croak. I can't hear you. He cleared his throat. I have a family. I have a family to care for. Do what you will, but I beg you not to kill me. You don't want me to kill you for the sake of your family? A tear ran into his beard. And for my own sake, I don't want to die. Of course he didn't want to die, for three acres of wood. I don't kill men who steal three acres of lumber from the king and then pay for it dearly in gold. It's more the sort of crime that warrants a broken arm or the removal of a finger. She moved toward him and pulled her dagger from its sheath. He breathed heavily, staring at the eggs and fruit on his plate. She wondered if he would vomit or begin to sob. But then he moved his plate to the side and his overturned glass and his silver. He stretched his arms onto the table before him. He bent his head and waited. A wave of tiredness swept over her. It was easier to follow Randa's orders when they begged or cried, when they gave her nothing to respect. And Randa didn't care about his forests. He only cared about the money and the power. Besides, the forests would grow back one day. Fingers didn't grow back. She slipped her dagger back into its sheath. It would be his arm, then, or his leg, or perhaps his collarbone, always a painful bone to break. But her own arms were as heavy as iron, and her legs didn't seem to want to propel her forward. The Lord drew one shaky breath, but he didn't move or speak. He was a liar and a thief and a fool. Somehow, she could not get herself to care. Katza sighed sharply. I grant that you're brave, though you didn't seem it at first. She sprang to the table and struck him on the temple, just as she'd done with Mergen's guards. He slumped and fell from his chair. She turned and went to wait in his great stone hall for Giddon and all to return with the money. He would wake with a headache, but no more. If Randa heard what she had done, he'd be furious. But perhaps Randa wouldn't hear. 
or perhaps she could accuse the Lord of lying to save face, in which case Randa would insist she return with proof in the future, a collection of shriveled fingers and toes, what that would do for her reputation. It didn't matter. She didn't have the strength today to torture a person who didn't deserve it. A small figure came tripping into the hall then. Katzen knew who she was even before she saw the girl's eyes, one yellow as the squash that grew in the north and one brown as a patch of mud. This girl she would hurt. This girl she would torture if it would stop her from taking Katz's thoughts. Katza caught the child's eyes and stared her down. The girl gasped and backed up a few steps, then turned and ran from the hall. Chapter 5 They made good time, though Katza chafed at their pace. Katza feels that to ride a horse at anything but breakneck speed is a waste of the horse, Giddon said. I only want to know if Raffin has learned anything from the Lenid grandfather. Don't worry, my lady. We'll reach the court by evening tomorrow, as long as the weather holds. The weather held through the day and into the night, but sometime before dawn, clouds blotted out the stars above their camp. In the morning they broke camp quickly and set out with some trepidation. Shortly thereafter, as they rode into the yard of the inn that kept their horses, raindrops plopped onto their arms and faces. They'd only just made it to the stables when the skies opened and water poured down. Rushing streams formed between the hills around them. It became an argument. We can ride in the rain. They stood in the stables, the inn ten steps away, but invisible through a wall of water. At the risk of the horses, at the risk of catching our deaths. Don't be foolish, Katza. It's only water. Tell that to a drowning man. He glared down at her, and she glared back. A raindrop from a crack in the roof splashed onto her nose, and she wiped at it furiously. My lady, my lord! Katza took a deep breath, looked into his patient face, and prepared herself for disappointment. We don't know how long the storm will last. If it lasts a day, we'd best not be in it. There's no reason to ride in such weather. He held up his hand as Katza started to speak. No reason we could give to the king without him thinking us mad. But perhaps it'll only last an hour, in which case we'll only have lost an hour. Katza crossed her arms and forced herself to breathe. It doesn't look like the kind of storm that lasts an hour. Then I'll inform the innkeeper we're in need of food and rooms for the night. The inn was some distance from any of the Midlands hill towns, but still in summer it had decent custom from merchants and travelers. It was a simple square structure, with kitchen and eating room below, and two floors of rooms above. Plain, but neat and serviceable. Katza would have preferred no fuss to have been made over their presence. But of course, the inn was unaccustomed to housing royalty, and the entire family threw itself into a dither in an attempt to make the king's niece, the king's underlord, and the king's captain comfortable. Against Katza's protests, a visiting merchant was moved from his room, so that she might have the view from his window, a view invisible now, but which she imagined could only be the same hills they'd been looking at for days. Katza wanted to apologize to the merchant for uprooting him. She sent Al to do so at the midday meal. When Al directed the man's attention to Katz's table, she raised her cup to him. He raised his cup back and nodded his head vigorously, his face white and his eyes wide as plates. When you send all to speak for you, you do seem so dreadfully superior, your ladyship, Giddon said, smiling around his mouthful of stew. Katza didn't answer. He knew perfectly well why she'd sent all. If the man was like most people, it would frighten him to be approached by the lady herself. <laughs>
The child who served them was painfully shy. She spoke no words, just nodded or shook her head in response to their requests. Unlike most, she seemed unable to keep her eyes away from Katz's face. Even when the handsome Lord Gidden addressed her, her eyes slid to Katz's. The girl thinks I'll eat her. I think not. Her father's a friend to the council. It's possible you're spoken of differently in this household than you are in others, my lady. She'll still have heard the stories. Possibly. But I think she's fascinated by you. Gidden laughed. You do fascinate, Katza. When the girl came around again, he asked her name. Lainey? She whispered, and her eyes flicked to Katza's once again. Do you see Our Lady Katza, Lainey? The girl nodded. Does she frighten you? The girl bit her lip and didn't answer. She wouldn't hurt you. Do you understand that? But if someone else were to hurt you, Lady Katza would likely hurt that person. Katza put her fork down and looked at Gidden. She hadn't expected this kindness from him. Do you understand? Gidden asked the girl. The child nodded. She peeked at Katza. Perhaps you'd like to shake hands. The girl paused. Then she leaned and held her hand out to Katza. Something welled up inside Katza, something she couldn't quite name, a sort of sad gladness at this little creature who wanted to touch her. Katza reached her hand out and took the child's thin fingers. It's a pleasure to meet you, Laney. Laney's eyes grew wide, and then she dropped Katza's hand and ran to the kitchen. All and Gidden laughed. Katza turned to Gidden. I'm very grateful. You do nothing to dispel your ogreish reputation. You know that, Katza. It's no wonder you haven't more friends. How like him. It was just like him to turn a kind gesture into one of his criticisms of her character. He loved nothing more than to point out her flaws, and he knew nothing of her if he thought she desired friends. Katza attacked her meal and ignored their conversation. The rain didn't stop. Gidden and all were content to sit in the main room and talk with the merchants and the innkeeper, but Katza thought the inactivity would set her screaming. She went out to the stables, only to frighten a boy, little bigger than Laney, who stood on a stool in one of the stalls and brushed down a horse. Her horse, she saw, as her eyes adjusted to the dim light. I didn't mean to startle you. I'm only looking for a space to practice my exercises. The boy climbed from his stool and fled. Katza threw her hands into the air. Well, at least she had the stable to herself now. She moved bales of hay, saddles, and rakes to clear a place across from the stalls and began a series of kicks and strikes. She twisted and flipped, conscious of the air, the floor, the walls around her, the horses. She focused on her imaginary opponents, and her mind calmed. At dinner, Al and Gidden had interesting news. King Mergen has announced a robbery. Three nights passed. Has he? Katza took in Al's face and then Gidden's. They both had the look of a cat that's cornered a mouse. And what does he say was robbed? He says only that a grand treasure of the court was stolen. Great skies! And who's said to have robbed him of this treasure? Some say it was a graceling boy, some kind of hypnotist who put the king's guards to sleep. Others talk about a graceling man the size of a monster, a fighter who overcame the guards one by one. Gidden laughed outright, and all smiled into his supper. What interesting news. And then, hoping she sounded innocent. Did you hear anything else? Their search was delayed for hours because at first they assumed someone at court was to blame, a visiting man who happened to be a Graceling fighter. He lowered his voice. Can you believe it? What luck for us. Katza kept her voice calm. What did he say, this Graceling? Apparently nothing helpful. He claimed to know nothing of it. What did they do to him? I've no idea. He's a Graceling fighter. I doubt they are able to do much of anything. Who is he? 
Where is he from? No one said. Gidden elbowed her. Katsa, come on. You're missing the point. It makes no difference who he is. They lost hours questioning this man. By the time they began to look elsewhere for the thieves, it was too late. Katza thought she knew, better than Gidden or Al could, why Mergen had spent so much time grilling this particular Graceling, and also why he'd taken pains not to publicize from where the Graceling came. Mergen wanted no one to suspect that the stolen treasure was Tealith, that he'd held Tealith in his dungeons in the first place. And why had the leaned Graceling told Mergen nothing? Was he protecting her? This cursed rain had to stop so that they could return to court and to Raffin. Katza drank, then lowered her cup to the table. What a stroke of luck for the thieves. Gidden grinned. Indeed. Have you heard any other news? The innkeeper's sister has a baby of three months. They had a scare the other morning. They thought one of its eyes had darkened, but it was only a trick of the light. Fascinating. Katza poured gravy onto her meat. The Monsian queen is grieving terribly for Grandfather Tealith. A Monsian merchant spoke of it. I'd heard she wasn't eating. It seemed to her a foolish way to grieve. There's more. She's closed herself and her daughter into her rooms. She permits no one but her handmaiden to enter, not even King Lek. That seemed not only foolish but peculiar. Is she allowing her daughter to eat? The handmaiden brings them meals but they won't leave the rooms. Apparently the king is being very patient about it. It will pass. There's no saying what grief will do to a person. It will pass when her father is found. The council would keep the old man hidden for his own safety until they learned the reason for his kidnapping. But perhaps a message could be sent to the Monsian queen to ease her strange grief? Katza determined to consider it. She would bring it up with Gidden and Al, when they could talk safely. She's leaned. They're known to be odd people. It seems very odd to me, Katza said. She'd never felt grief, or if she had, she didn't remember. Her mother, Randa's sister, had died of a fever before Katza's eyes had settled, the same fever that had taken Raffin's mother, Randa's queen. Her father, a northern Midlands border lord, had been killed in a raid across the border, it had been a western raid on a Nandarin village. It hadn't been his responsibility, but he'd taken up the defense of his neighbors and gotten himself killed in the process. She hadn't even been of speaking age. She didn't remember him. If her uncle died, she didn't think she would grieve. She glanced at Gidden. She wouldn't like to lose him, but she didn't think she would grieve his loss either. All was different. She would grieve for all and her lady servant Helda, and Raffin. Raffin's loss would hurt more than a finger sliced off, or an arm broken, or a knife in her side. But she wouldn't close herself in her rooms. She would go out and find the one who had done it, and then she'd make that person feel pain as no one had ever felt pain before. Gidden was speaking to her, and she wasn't listening. She shook herself. What did you say? I said... Lady Dreamer, that I believe the sky is clearing. We'll be able to set out at dawn, if you like. They would reach court before nightfall. Katza finished her meal quickly and ran to her room to pack her bags. Chapter 6 The sun was well on its way across the sky when their horses clattered onto the marble floor of Randa's inner courtyard. Around them on all sides, the white castle walls rose and stood brightly against the green marble of the floor. Balconied passageways lined the walls above, so that the people of the court could look down into the courtyard as they moved from one section of the castle to another and admire Randa's great garden of crawling vines and pink flowering trees. A statue of Randa stood in the center of the garden, a fountain of water flowing from one outstretched hand and a torch in the other. It was an attractive garden, if one did not dwell on the statue, and an attractive courtyard, but not a peaceful or private one. 
with the entire court roaming the passageways above. This was not the only such courtyard in the castle, but it was the largest, and it was the entrance point for any important residents or visitors. The green floor was kept to such a shine that Katza could see herself and her horse reflected in its surface. The white walls were made of a stone that sparkled, and they rose so high that she had to crane her neck to find the tops of the turrets above. It was very grand, very impressive, as Randall liked it. The noise of their horses and their shouts brought people to the balconies to see who had come. A steward came out to greet them. A moment later, Raffin came flying into the courtyard. You've arrived! Katza grinned up at him. Then she looked closer, stood on her toes, for he was so very tall. She grabbed a handful of his hair. Raff, what have you done to yourself? Your hair is positively blue. I've been trying a new remedy for headache, to be massaged into the scalp. Yesterday, I thought I felt a headache coming on, so I tried it. Apparently, it turns fair hair blue. She smiled. Did it cure the headache? Well, if I had a headache, then it did. But I'm not convinced I had one to begin with. Do you have a headache? Your hair's so dark, it wouldn't turn nearly as blue. I don't. I never do. What does the king think of your hair? Raffin smirked. He's not speaking to me. He says it's appalling behavior for the son of the king. Until my hair is normal again, I'm not his son. Al and Giddon greeted Raffin and handed their reins to a boy. They followed the king's steward into the castle, leaving Katza and Raffin alone in the courtyard, near the garden and the splashing of Randa's fountain. Katza lowered her voice and pretended to focus on the straps that tied her saddlebags to her horse. Any news? He hasn't woken. Not once. She was disappointed. She kept her voice low. Have you heard of a leaned noble graced with fighting? You saw him, did you? Raffin said, and she swung her eyes to his face, surprised. As you came into the courtyard? He's been lurking around. Hard to look that one in the eyes, eh? He's the son of the leaned king. He was here? She hadn't expected that. She focused on her saddlebags once more. Roar's heir? Great hills, no. He has six older brothers. His name is the silliest I've heard for the seventh heir to a throne. Prince Greening Grandamelian. Raffin smiled. Have you ever heard the like? Why is he here? Ah, it's quite interesting, really. He claims to be searching for his kidnapped grandfather. Katza looked up from her bags into his laughing blue eyes. You haven't... Of course not. I've been waiting for you. A boy came for her horse and Raffin launched into a monologue about the visitors she'd missed while she was gone. Then a steward approached from one of the entrances. He'll be for you, for I'm not my father's son at the moment, and he doesn't send stewards for me. He laughed, then left her. I'm glad you're back, he called to her, and he disappeared through an archway. The steward was one of Randa's dry, sniffy little men. Lady Katza, he said, welcome back. The king wishes to know if your business in the east was successful. You may tell him it was successful. Very good, my lady. The king wishes you to dress for dinner. Katza narrowed her eyes at the steward. Does the king wish anything else? No, my lady. Thank you, my lady. The man bowed and scampered away from her gaze as quickly as possible. Katza lifted her bags onto her shoulder and sighed. When the king wished her to... Dress for dinner. It meant she was to wear a dress and arrange her hair and wear jewels in her ears and around her neck. It meant the king planned to sit her next to some underlord who wished a wife, though she was probably not the wife he had in mind. She would ease the poor man's fears quickly, and perhaps she could claim not to feel well enough to sit through the entire meal. She could claim a headache. She wished she could take Raffin's headache remedy and turn her hair blue. It would give her a respite from Randa's dinners. Raffin appeared again, a floor above her, on the balconied passageway that ran past his workrooms. He leaned over the railing and called down to her. Cat! What is it? You look lost. Have you forgotten the way to your rooms? I'm stalling. How long will you be? I'd like to show you a couple of my new discoveries. 
I've been told to make myself pretty for dinner. He grinned. Well, in that case, he'll be ages. <laughs> His face dissolved into laughter, and she tore a button from one of her bags and hurled it at him. He squealed and dropped to the floor, and the button hit the wall right where he'd been standing. When he peeked back over the railing, she stood in the courtyard with her hands on her hips, grinning. I missed on purpose. Show off. Come if you've time. He waved and turned into his rooms. And that's when the presence in the corner of Katz's eye took shape. He was standing a floor above her, to her left. He leaned his elbows on the railing, the neck of his shirt open, and watched her. The gold hoops in his ears and the rings on his fingers, his hair dark, a tiny welt visible on his forehead, just beside his eye. His eyes. Katza had never seen such eyes. One was silver and the other gold. They glowed in his sun-darkened face, uneven and strange. She was surprised that they hadn't shone in the darkness of their first meeting. They didn't seem human. She couldn't stop looking at them. A steward of the court came to him then and spoke to him. He straightened, turned to the man, and said something in response. When the steward walked away, the Leonid's eyes flashed back to Katz's. He leaned his elbows on the railing again. Katz knew she was standing in the courtyard's center, staring at this Leonid. She knew she should move, but she found that she couldn't. Then he raised his eyebrows a hair, and his mouth shifted into the hint of a smirk. He nodded at her, just barely, and it released her from her spell. Cocky, she thought. Cocky and arrogant, this one. And that was all there was to make of him. Whatever game he was playing, if he expected her to join him, he would be disappointed. Greening Grandamalian, indeed. She tore her eyes away from his, hitched her bags higher, and pushed herself forward into the castle, all the while conscious of the strange eyes burning into her back. Chapter 7 Helda had come to work in Randa's nurseries around the same time Katza began to dole out Randa's punishments. It was hard to know why she'd been less frightened of Katza than others were. Perhaps it was because she had borne a graceling child of her own. Not a fighter, only a swimmer, a skill that was of no use to the king. So the boy had been sent home, and Helda had seen how the neighbors avoided and ridiculed him simply because he could move through the water like a fish or because he had one eye black and the other blue. Perhaps this was why, when the servants had warned Helda to avoid the king's niece, Helda had reserved her opinion. Of course, Katza had been too old for the nurseries when Helda arrived, and the children of the court had kept Helda busy. But she'd come to Katza's training sessions when she could. She'd sat and watched the child beat the stuffing out of a dummy, grain bursting from cracks and tears in the sack, and slapping onto the floor like spurting blood. She'd never stayed long, because she always needed to return to the nursery. But still Katza had noticed her, as she noticed anyone who didn't try to avoid her. Had noticed and noted her, but hadn't troubled herself with curiosity. Katza had had no reason to interact with a woman's servant. But one day, Helda had come when all was away, and Katza was alone in the practice rooms and when the child had paused to set up a new dummy, Helda had spoken. In court they say you're dangerous, my lady. Katza considered the old woman for a moment, her gray hair and gray eyes and her soft arms folded over a soft stomach. The woman held her gaze, as no one other than Raffin, all, or the king did. Then Katza shrugged, hoisted a sack of grain onto her shoulder, and hung it from a hook on a wooden post, standing in the center of the practice-room floor. The first man you killed, my lady, that cousin, did you mean to kill him? It was a question no one had ever actually asked her. 
Again the girl looked into the face of the woman, and again the woman held her eyes. Katzis sensed that this question was inappropriate coming from a servant, but she was so unused to being talked to that she didn't know the right way to proceed. No, I only meant to keep him from touching me. Then you are dangerous, my lady, to people you don't like. But perhaps you'd be safe as a friend. It's why I spend my days in this practice room. Mastering your grace. Yes, all gracelings must do so. This woman knew something about the graces, and she wasn't afraid to say the word. It was time for Katza to begin her exercises again, but she paused, hoping the woman would say something more. My lady, if I may ask you a nosy question? Katza waited. She couldn't think of a question more nosy than the one the woman had already asked. Who are your servants, my lady? Katza wondered if this woman was trying to embarrass her. She drew herself up and looked the woman straight in the face, daring her to laugh or smile. I don't keep servants. When a servant is assigned to me, she generally chooses to leave the service of the court. Helda didn't smile or laugh. She merely looked back at Katza, studied her for a moment. Have you any female caretakers, my lady? I have none. Has anyone spoken to you of a woman's bleedings, my lady, or of how it is with a man and a woman? Katza didn't know what she meant, and she had a feeling this old woman could tell. Still, Helda didn't smile or laugh. She looked Katza up and down. What's your age, my lady? Katza raised her chin. I'm nearly eleven. And they were going to let you learn it on your own, and probably tear through the castle like a wild thing, because you didn't know what attacked you. Katza raised her chin another notch. I always know what attacks me. My child, my lady, would you allow me to serve you on occasion, when you need service, and when my presence is not required in the nurseries? Katza thought it must be very bad to work in the nurseries, if this woman wished to serve her instead. I don't need servants, but I can have you transferred from the nurseries if you're unhappy there. Katza thought she caught the hint of a smile. I'm happy in the nurseries. Forgive me for contradicting such a one as yourself, my lady, but you do need a servant, a woman servant, because you have no mother or sisters. Katza had never needed a mother or sisters or anyone else either. She didn't know what one did with a contradictory servant. She guessed that Randa would go into a rage, but she was afraid of her own rages. She held her breath, clenched her fists, and stood as still as the wooden post in the center of the room. The woman could say what she wanted. They were only words. Helda stood and smoothed her dress. I'll come to your rooms on occasion, my lady. Katza made her face like a rock. If you ever wish a break from your uncle's state dinners, you may always join me in my room. Katza blinked. She hated the dinners, with everyone's sideways glances, and the people who didn't want to sit near her, and her uncle's loud voice. Could she really skip them? Could this woman's company be better? I must return to the nurseries, my lady. My name is Helda. And I come from the Western Midlands. Your eyes are so very pretty, my dear. Goodbye. Helda left before Katza was able to find her voice. Katza stared at the door that closed behind her. Thank you, she said, though there was no one to hear, and though she wasn't sure why, her voice seemed to think she was grateful. Katza sat in the bath and tugged at the knots in her tangle of hair. She heard Helda in the other room, rustling through the chests and drawers, unearthing the earrings and necklaces Katza had thrown among her silk undergarments and her horrid bone chest supports the last time she'd been required to wear them. Katza heard Helda muttering and grunting, on her knees most likely, looking under the bed for Katza's hairbrush or her dinner shoes.
What dress shall it be tonight, my lady? Helda called out. You know I don't care. There was more muttering in response to this. A moment later, Helda came to the door carrying a dress bright as the tomatoes Randa imported from Lenid, the tomatoes that clustered on the vine and tasted as rich and sweet as his chef's chocolate cake. Katza raised her eyebrows. I'm not going to wear a red dress. It's the color of sunrise. It's the color of blood. Sighing, Helda carried the dress from the bathing room. It would look stunning, my lady, with your dark hair and your eyes. Katza yanked at one of the more stubborn knots in her hair. She spoke to the bubbles gathered on the surface of the water. If there's anyone I wish to stun at dinner, I'll hit him in the face. Helda came to the doorway again, this time with her arms full of a soft green silk. Is this dull enough for you, my lady? Have I no grays or browns? Helda set her face. I'm determined that you wear a color, my lady. Katza scowled. You're determined that people notice me. She held a tangle of hair before her eyes and pulled at it savagely. I should like to cut it all off. It's not worth the nuisance. Helda put the dress aside and came to sit on the edge of the bath. She lathered her fingers up with soap and took the tangled hair out of Katz's hands. She worked the curls apart, bit by bit, gently. If you ran a brush through it once every day while you were traveling, my lady, this wouldn't happen. Katza snorted. Gidden would get a good laugh out of that. My attempts to beautify myself. That knot untangled, Helda moved to another. Don't you think Lord Gidden finds you beautiful, my lady? Helda, how much time do you suppose I spend wondering which of the gentlemen finds me beautiful? Not enough, Helda said, nodding emphatically. A hiccup of laughter rose into Katza's throat. Dear Helda, she saw what Katza was and what she did, and Helda didn't deny that Katza was that person. But she couldn't fathom a lady who didn't want to be beautiful, who didn't want a legion of admirers. And so she believed Katza was both people, though Katza couldn't imagine how she reconciled them in her mind. In the great dining hall, Randa presided over a long, high table that might as well have been a stage at the head of the room. Three low tables were arranged around the perimeter to complete the sides of a square, giving the guests an unobstructed view of the king. Randa was a tall man, taller even than his son, and broader in the shoulders and the neck. He had Raffin's yellow hair and blue eyes, but they weren't laughing eyes like Raffin's. They were eyes that assumed you would do what he told you to do, eyes that threatened to bring you unhappiness if he didn't get what he wanted. It wasn't that he was unjust, except perhaps to those who wronged him. It was more that he wanted things the way he wanted them, and if things weren't that way, he might decide that he'd been wronged. And if you were the person responsible, well, then you had reason to fear his eyes. At dinner he wasn't fearsome. At dinner he was arrogant and loud. He brought whomever he wanted to sit with him at the high table, often Raffin, though Randa spoke over him and never cared to hear what he had to say. Rarely Katza. Randa kept his distance from her. He preferred to look down on his lady killer and call out to her, because his yelling brought the attention of the entire room to his niece, his prized weapon, and the guests would be frightened and everything would be as Randa liked it. Tonight she sat at the table to the right of Randa's, her usual position. She wore the soft green silk and fought the urge to tear off the sleeves that widened at her wrists and hung over her hands and dragged across her plate if she wasn't careful. At least this dress covered her breasts, mostly. Not all of them did. Helda paid her no attention when she gave instructions about her wardrobe. Gidden sat to her left. The lord to her right, whom she supposed to be the eligible bachelor, was a man not old but older than Gidden, a small man whose bugged eyes and stretched mouth gave him the appearance of a frog. His name was Davit, and he was a border lord from the Midlands' northeast corner, at the border of both Nander and Estel. His conversation wasn't bad. He cared a great deal about his land, his farms, his villages, 
and Katza found it easy to ask questions that he was eager to answer. At first, he sat on the farthest edge of his chair and looked at her shoulder and her ear and her hair as they talked, but never her face. But he grew calmer as the dinner progressed and Katza didn't bite him. His body relaxed, he settled into his chair, and they spoke easily. Katza thought him unusually good dinner company, this Lord Davit of the Northeast. At any rate, he made it easier for her to resist tearing out the hairpins that dug into her scalp. The Leonid Prince was also a distraction, no matter how much she willed him not to be. He sat across the room from her and was always in the corner of her eye, though she tried not to look at him directly. She felt his eyes on her at times. Bold he was, and entirely unlike the rest of the guests, who carefully pretended she wasn't there, as they always did. It occurred to her that it wasn't just the strangeness of his eyes that disconcerted her. It was that he wasn't afraid to hold hers. She glanced at him once when he wasn't looking. He raised his eyes to meet her gaze. David had asked the same question twice before Katza heard him and turned from the Leonid's uneven stare to answer. She supposed she would have to face those eyes soon. They would have to talk. She would have to decide what to do with him. She thought that Lord David would be less nervous if he knew there was no chance of Randa offering him her suit. Lord David, have you a wife? He shook his head. It's the only thing my estate lacks, my lady. Katza kept her eyes on her venison and carrots. My uncle is very disappointed in me, because I intend never to marry. Lord David paused and then spoke. I doubt your uncle is the only man who finds that disappointing. Katza considered his pointy face and could not stop herself from smiling. Lord David, you're a perfect gentleman. The Lord smiled in return. You think I didn't mean it, my lady, but I did. Then he leaned in and ducked his head. My lady, I wish to speak with the council. The voices of the dinner guests were lively, but she heard him perfectly. She pretended to focus on her dinner. She stirred her soup. Sit back. Act as if we were only talking. Don't whisper, for it draws attention. The Lord settled back into his seat. He raised his finger for a serving girl who brought him more wine. He ate a few bites of his venison and turned to Katza once more. The weather has been very kind to my aging father this summer, my lady. He suffers in the heat, but it's been cool in the northeast. I'm happy to hear it. Is it information or a request? The Lord spoke around his mouthful of carrots. Information? He sliced another piece of venison. It becomes more and more difficult to care for him, my lady. Why is that? The elderly are prone to discomforts. It's our duty to keep them comfortable and safe. Katza nodded. True words indeed. She kept her face even, but excitement rattled at the edges of her mind. If he had information about the kidnapping of the Leonid grandfather, they would all want to hear it. She reached under the heavy tablecloth and rested her hand on Giddon's knee. He leaned toward her slightly, without turning away from the lady on his other side. You're a man of great information, Lord Davit, she said to the Lord, or rather to her plate, so that Giddon could hear. I hope we'll have the opportunity to speak with you more during your stay at court. Thank you, my lady, Lord Davit said. I hope so, too. Giddon would spread the word. They would meet that night in her own rooms, because they were secluded and because they were the only rooms not traveled by servants. If she could, she'd find Raffin beforehand. She'd like to visit Grandfather Tealeth. Even if he was still sleeping, it would be good to see with her own eyes how he was faring. Katza heard the king speak her name, and her shoulders stiffened. She didn't look at him, for she didn't wish to encourage him to draw her into his conversation. She couldn't make out his words. Most likely he was telling some guest the story of something she'd done. His laughter rolled across the tables in the great marble hall. Katza tried to push back the scowl that rose to her face.
the leaned prince was watching her. She felt that, too. Heat licked at her neck and crawled along her scalp. My lady, Lord Davit said, are you quite all right? You look a bit flushed. Giddon turned to her then, his face flashing with concern. He reached for her arm. You aren't ill. She pulled back, away from him. I'm never ill, she snarled, and she knew suddenly that she must leave the hall. She must leave the clatter of voices and the sound of her uncle's laugh, Giddon's smothering concern, the Leonid's burning eyes. She must get outside, find Raffin, or be on her own. She must, or she would lose her temper, and something unthinkable would happen. She stood, and Giddon and Lord Davit stood with her. Across the room, the Leonid prince stood. One by one, the rest of the men saw her standing and rose. The room quieted, and everyone was looking at her. What is it, Katza? Giddon asked, reaching for her arm again. So that he wouldn't be shamed before everyone in the hall, she allowed him to take it, though his hand was like a brand that burned into her skin. It's nothing. I'm sorry. She turned to the king, the only man in the room who wasn't on his feet. Forgive me, Lord King. It's nothing. Please sit down. She waved her hand around the tables. Please. Slowly the gentlemen sat, and the voices picked up again. The king's laugh rang out, directed at her, she was sure. Katza turned to Lord Davit. Please excuse me, my lord. She turned to Giddon, whose hand still grasped her elbow. Let go, Giddon. I want to take a walk outside. I'll go with you. He started to rise, but at the warning in her eyes, he sat back again. Very well, Katza. Do what you will. There was an edge to his voice. She had probably been rude, but she didn't care. All that mattered was that she leave this room and go to a place where she couldn't hear the drone of her uncle's voice. She turned, careful not to catch the eyes of the leaned. She forced herself to walk slowly, calmly, to the doorway at the foot of the room. Once through the doorway, she ran. She ran through corridors, around corners, past servants who flattened themselves trembling against walls as she flew by. Finally she burst into the darkness of the courtyard. She crossed the marble floor, pulling pins from her hair. She sighed as her curls fell around her shoulders and the tension left her scalp. It was the hairpins and the dress and the shoes that pinched her feet. It was having to hold her head still and sit straight. It was the infuriating earrings that brushed against her neck. That was why she couldn't stand to spend one moment longer at her uncle's fine dinner. She took off her earrings and hurled them into her uncle's fountain. She didn't care who found them. But that was no good, because then people would talk. The entire court would speculate about what it meant that she'd thrown her earrings into her uncle's fountain. Katza kicked off her shoes, hitched up her skirt, and climbed into the fountain, sighing as the cold water ran between her toes and lapped at her ankles. It was a great improvement over her shoes. She would not put them on again tonight. She waded out to the glimmers she saw in the water and retrieved her earrings. She dried them on her skirt, dropped them into the bodice of her dress for safekeeping, and stood in the fountain, enjoying the coolness enveloping her feet. The drifting air of the courtyard, the night noises, until a sound from inside reminded her of how much the court would talk if she were found waiting, barefoot and wild-haired, in King Randa's fountain. They would think her mad. And perhaps she was mad. A light shone from Raffin's workrooms, but it wasn't his company she sought after all. She didn't want to sit and talk. She wanted to move. Movement would stop the whirring of her mind. Katza climbed out of the fountain and hung the straps of her shoes over her wrists. She ran. Chapter 8 The archery range was empty and dark except for the lone torch that glowed outside the equipment room 
Katza lit the torches along the back of the range so that when she returned to the front, the man-shaped dummies stood black against the brightness behind them. She grabbed a bow randomly from the supplies and collected handfuls of the lightest colored arrows she could find. Then she drove arrow after arrow into the knees of her targets, then the thighs, then the elbows, then the shoulders, until she'd emptied her quiver. She could disarm or disable any man with this bow at night. That was clear enough. She exchanged the bow for another. She yanked the arrows from the targets. She began again. She'd lost her temper at dinner, and for no reason. Randa hadn't spoken to her, hadn't even looked at her, had only said her name. He loved to brag of her, as if her great ability were his doing, as if she were the arrow and he the archer whose skill drove her home. No, not an arrow. That didn't quite capture it. A dog. To Randa, she was a savage dog he'd broken and trained. He set her on his enemies and allowed her out of her cage to be groomed and kept pretty, to sit among his friends and make them nervous. Katza didn't notice her heightened speed and focus, the ferocity with which she was now whipping arrows from her quiver, the next arrow notched in the string before the first had hit home. Not until she sensed the presence behind her shoulder did she stir from her preoccupation and realize how she must look. She was savage. Look at her speed, look at her accuracy, and with a poor bow, curved badly, strung badly. No wonder Randa treated her so. She knew it was the Leonid who stood behind her. She ignored him, but she slowed her movements, made a show of taking aim at thighs and knees before she fired. She became conscious of the dirt under her feet and remembered, too, that she was barefoot with her hair falling around her shoulders and her shoes in a pile somewhere near the equipment room. He would have noticed. She doubted there was much those eyes didn't notice. Well, he wouldn't have kept such stupid shoes on his feet either, or left pins in his hair if his scalp were screaming. Or perhaps he would. He seemed not to mind his own fine jewelry, in his ears and on his fingers. They must be a vain people, the Leonid. Can you kill with an arrow, or do you only ever wound? She remembered his raspy voice from Mergen's courtyard, and it was taunting her now, as it had done then. She didn't turn to him. She simply took two arrows from her quiver, notched them together, pulled, and released. One flew to her target's head, and the other to its chest. They hit with a satisfying thud and glowed palely in the flickering torchlight. I'll never make the mistake of challenging you to an archery match. There was laughter in his voice. She kept her back to him and reached for another arrow. You didn't forfeit our last match so easily. Ah, but that's because I have your fighting skill. I lack your skill with a bow and arrow. Katza couldn't help herself. She found that interesting. She turned her eyes to him his face in shadows. Is that true? My grace gives me skill at hand-to-hand -hand combat, or sword-to-sword. -sword. It does little for my archery. He leaned back against the great slab of stone that served as a table for the equipment of the archers. His arms were crossed. She was becoming accustomed to this look, this lazy look, as if he could nod off to sleep at any moment. But it didn't fool her. She thought if she were to spring at him, He'd react quickly enough. Then you need to be able to grapple with your opponent to have an advantage. He nodded. I may be quicker to dodge arrows than someone ungraced, but in my own attack, my skill is only as good as my aim. Hmm. Katza believed him. The graces were odd like that. They didn't touch any two people in quite the same way. Can you throw a knife as well as you shoot an arrow? Yes. You're unbeatable, Lady Katza. She heard the laughter in his voice again. She considered him for a moment, and then turned away and walked down the course to the targets. She stopped at one, the one she'd killed, and yanked the arrows from its thighs, its chest, its head. He sought his grandfather, and Katza had what he sought. But he didn't feel safe to her, this one. He didn't feel quite trustworthy.
She walked from target to target, pulling out arrows. He watched her, she felt it, and the knowledge of his eyes on her back drove her to the back of the range, where she put the torches out, one by one. As she extinguished the last flame, darkness enveloped her, and she knew she was invisible. She turned to him then, thinking to examine him in the light of the equipment room without his knowing. But he slouched, arms crossed, and stared straight at her. He couldn't see her. It wasn't possible. But his gaze was so direct that she couldn't hold it, even knowing he didn't know she stared. She walked across the range and stepped into the light, and his eyes seemed to change focus. He smiled at her ever so slightly. The torch caught the gold of one eye and the silver of the other. They were like the eyes of a cat or a night creature of some kind. Does your grace give you night vision? He laughed. Hardly. Why do you ask? She didn't answer. They looked at each other for a moment. The flush began to rise into her neck again, and with it a surging irritation. She'd grown far too used to people avoiding her eyes. He would not rattle her so, simply by looking at her. She wouldn't allow it. I'm going to return to my rooms now. He straightened. Lady, I have questions for you. Well, and she knew they must have this conversation eventually, and she preferred to have it in the dark, where his eyes wouldn't unnerve her. Katza pulled the quiver over her head and laid it on the slab of stone. She placed the bow beside it. Go on. He leaned back against the stone. What did you steal from King Mergen, lady? Four nights past? Nothing that King Mergen had not himself stolen. Ah, stolen from you? Yes, from me, or from a friend. Really? He crossed his arms again, and in the torchlight he raised an eyebrow. I wonder if this friend would be surprised to hear himself so called? Why should he be surprised? Why should he think himself an enemy? Ah, but it's just that. I thought the Midlands had neither friends nor enemies. I thought King Randa never got involved. I suppose you're wrong. No, I'm not wrong. He stared at her, and she was glad for the darkness that kept his strange eyes dim. Do you know why I'm here, lady? I was told you're the son of the Leaned King. I was told you seek your grandfather who's disappeared. Why you've come to Randa's court, I couldn't say. I doubt Randa is your kidnapper. He considered her for a moment, and a smile flickered across his face. Katza knew she wasn't fooling him. It didn't matter. He may know what he knew, but she had no intention of confirming it. King Mergen was quite certain I was involved in the robbery. He seemed quite sure I knew what object had been stolen. And that's natural. The guards had seen a Graceling fighter. And you're no other than a Graceling fighter. No. Mergen didn't believe I was involved because I was graced. He believed I was involved because I'm leaned. Can you explain that? And of course, she would give him no answer to that question, this smirking leaned. She noticed that the neck of his shirt was now fastened. I see you close your shirt for state dinners. She heard herself saying, though she didn't know where such a senseless comment came from. His mouth twitched, and his words, when he spoke, did not conceal his laughter. I didn't know you were so interested in my shirt, lady. Her face was hot, and his laughter was infuriating. This was absurdity, and she would put up with it no longer. I'm going to my rooms now, she said, and she turned to leave. In a flash, he stood and blocked her path. You have my grandfather. Katza tried to step around him. I'm going to my rooms. He blocked her path again, and this time he raised his arm in warning. Well, at least they were relating now in a way she could understand. Katza cocked her head upward and looked into his eyes. I'm going to my rooms, and if I must knock you over to do so, I will. I won't allow you to go until you tell me where my grandfather is. She moved again to pass him, and he moved to block her, and it was almost with relief that she struck out at his face. It was just a feint, 
and when he ducked, she jammed at his stomach with her knee. But he twisted so that the blow didn't fall true, and came back with a fist to her stomach. She took the blow, just to see how well he hit, and then wished she hadn't. This wasn't one of the king's soldiers, whose blows hardly touched her, even with ten of them on her at once. This one could knock the wind out of her. This one could fight, and so a fight was what she would give him. She jumped and kicked at his chest. He crashed to the ground, and she threw herself on top of him, struck him in the face once, twice, three times, and kneed him in the side before he was able to throw her off. She was on him again like a wildcat, but as she tried to trap his arms, he flipped her onto her back and pinned her with the weight of his body. She curled her legs up and heaved him away, and then they were on their feet again, crouching, circling, striking at each other with hands and feet. She kicked at his stomach and barreled into his chest, and they were on the ground again. Katza didn't know how long they'd been grappling when she realized he was laughing. She understood his joy, understood it completely. She'd never had such a fight. She'd never had such an opponent. She was faster than he was offensively, much faster. But he was stronger, and it was as if he had a premonition of her every turn and strike. She'd never known a fighter so quick to defend himself. She was calling up moves she hadn't tried since she was a child, blows she'd only ever imagined having the opportunity to use. They were playing. It was a game. When he pinned her arms behind her back, grabbed her hair, and pushed her face into the dirt, she found that she was laughing as well. Surrender. Never. She kicked her feet up at him and squirmed her arms out of his grasp. She elbowed him in the face, and when he jumped to avoid the blow, she flew at him and flattened him to the ground. She pinned his arms as he had just done and pushed his face into the dirt. She dug one knee into the small of his back. You surrender, for you're beaten. I'm not beaten, and you know it. You'll have to break my arms and legs to beat me. And I will if you don't surrender. But there was a smile in her voice, and he laughed. Katza, Lady Katza, I'll surrender on one condition. And the condition? Please, please, tell me what's happened to my grandfather. There was something mixed in with the laughter in his voice, something that caught at Katza's throat. She didn't have a grandfather, but perhaps this grandfather meant to the Leonid prince what all, or Helda or Raffin, meant to her. Katza, he said into the dirt, I beg you to trust me as I've trusted you. She held him down for just a moment, and then she let his arms go. She slid from his back and sat in the dirt beside him. She rested her chin in her palm, considering him. Why do you trust me? When I left you lying on the floor of Mergen's courtyard. He rolled over and sat up, groaning. He massaged his shoulder. Because I woke up. You could have killed me, but you didn't. He touched his cheekbone and winced. Your face is bleeding. He stretched out his hand to her jaw, but she waved it aside and stood. It doesn't matter. Come with me, Prince Greening. He heaved himself to his feet. It's Poe. Poe? My name. It's Poe. Katza watched him for a moment as he swung his arms and tested out his shoulder joints. He pressed his side and groaned. His eye was swelling and blackening, she thought, though it was hard to tell in the darkness. His sleeve was torn, and he was covered with dirt, absolutely smeared from head to foot. She knew she looked the same, worse, really, with her messy hair and bare feet but it only made her smile. Come with me, Poe. I'll take you to your grandfather. Chapter 9 when they walked into the light of Raffin's workrooms, his blue head was bent over a bubbling flask. He added leaves to the flask from a potted plant at his elbow. He watched the leaves dissolve and muttered something at the result. Katza cleared her throat. Raffin looked up at them and blinked. 
I take it you've been getting to know each other. It must have been a friendly fight if you've come to meet together. Are you alone? Yes, except for Ban, of course. I've told the prince about his grandfather. Raffin looked from Katza to Poe and back to Katza again. He raised his eyebrows. He's safe. I'm sorry for not consulting you, Raff. Cat, if you think he's safe, even after he's bloodied your face and... He glanced at her tattered dress. Rolled you around in a puddle of mud. Then I believe you. Katza smiled. May we see him? You may. And I have good news. He's awake. Randa's castle was full of secret inner passageways. It had been that way since its construction so many generations before. They were so plentiful that even Randa didn't know of all of them. No one did, really, although Raffin had had the mind as a child to notice when two rooms came together in a way that seemed not to match. Katza and Raffin had done a fair bit of exploring as children, Katza keeping guard, so that anyone who came upon one of Raffin's investigations would scuttle away at the sight of her small, glaring form. Raffin and Katza had chosen their living quarters because a passageway connected them, and because another passageway connected Raffin to the science libraries. Some of the passageways were secret, and some were known by the entire court. The one in Raffin's workrooms was secret. It led from the inside of a storage room in a back alcove, up a stairway, and to a small room set between two floors of the castle. It was a windowless room, dark and musty, but it was the only place in the castle that they could be sure no one would find, and that Raffin and Ban could stay so near to most of the time. Ban was Raffin's friend of many years, a young man who had worked in the libraries as a boy. One day Raffin had stumbled across him, and the two children had fallen to talking about herbs and medicines and about what happened when you mixed the ground root of one plant with the powdered flower of another. Katza had been amazed that there could be more than one person in the Midlands who found such things interesting enough to talk about, and relieved that Raffin had found someone other than her to bore. Shortly thereafter, Raffin had begged Ban's help with a particular experiment, and from that time on had effectively stolen Ban for himself. Ban was Raffin's assistant in all things. Raffin ushered Katza and Poe through the door in the back of the storage room, a torch in his hand. They slipped up the steps that led to the secret chamber. Has he said anything? Nothing. Other than that, they blindfolded him when they took him. He's still very weak. He doesn't seem to remember much. Do you know who took him? Poe said. Was Mergen responsible? We don't think so. But all we know for sure is that it wasn't Randa. The stairs ended at a doorway. Raffin fiddled with a key. Randa doesn't know he's here, Poe said. It was more of a statement than a question. Randa doesn't know. He must never know. Raffin opened the door then, and they crowded into the tiny room. Ban sat in a chair beside a narrow bed, reading in the dim light of a lamp on the table beside him. Prince Tealiff lay on his back in the bed, his eyes closed and his hands clasped over his chest. Upon their entrance, Ban stood. He seemed unsurprised as Poe rushed forward. He only stepped aside and offered his chair. Poe sat and leaned toward his grandfather, looked into his sleeping face, simply looked at him, and did not touch him. Then Poe took the man's hands and bent his forehead to them, exhaling slowly. Katza felt as if she were intruding on something private. She dropped her eyes until Poe sat up again. Your face is turning purple, Prince Greening. You're on your way to a very black eye. Poe. Call me Poe. Poe. I'll get you some ice from the vault. Come, Ban. Let's get some supplies for our two warriors. Raffin and Ban slipped through the doorway, and when Katza and Poe turned back to Tealiff, the old man's eyes were open. Grandfather. Poe? His voice rasped with the effort of speaking. Poe. He struggled to clear his throat, and then lay still for a moment, exhausted. Great seas, boy. I suppose I shouldn't be surprised to see you. I've been tracking you down, grandfather. 
Move that lamp closer, boy. What in the name of Leonid have you done to your face? It's nothing, Grandfather. I've only been fighting. With what? A pack of wolves? With the Lady Katza. He cocked his head at Katza, who stood at the foot of the bed. Don't worry, Grandfather. It was only a friendly scuffle. Hmm. A friendly scuffle? You look worse than she does, Poe. Poe burst into laughter. He laughed a lot, this leaned prince. I've met my match, Grandfather. More than your match, it looks to me. Come here, child, he said to Katza. Come to the light. Katza approached the other side of the bed and knelt beside him. Tilif turned to her, and she became suddenly conscious of her dirty, bloody face, her tangled hair. How dreadful she must look to this old man. My dear, I believe you saved my life. Lord Prince, if anyone did that, it was my cousin Raffin with his medicines. Yes, Raffin's a good boy. He patted her hand. But I know what you did, you and the others. You've saved my life, though I can't think why. I doubt any Leonid has ever done you a kindness. I'd never met a Leonid, before you, Lord Prince. But you seem very kind. Tilif closed his eyes. He seemed to sink into his pillows. His breath was a drawn-out sigh. He falls asleep like that, Raffin said from the doorway. His strength will come back, with rest. He carried something wrapped in a cloth, which he handed to Poe. Ice. Hold it to that eye. Looks like she cracked your lip, too. Where else does it hurt? Everywhere. I feel as if I've been run over by a team of horses. Honestly, Katza, were you trying to kill him? If I'd been trying to kill him, he'd be dead, Katza said, and Poe laughed again. He wouldn't be laughing if it were that bad. It wasn't that bad, or at least Raffin was able to determine that none of his bones were broken and that he'd sustained no bruises that wouldn't heal. Then Raffin turned to Katza. He examined the scratch that stretched across her jaw and wiped dirt and blood from her face. It's not very deep, this scratch. Any other pains? None. I don't even feel the scratch. I suppose you'll have to retire this dress. Helda will give you a terrible scolding. Yes, I'm devastated about the dress. Raffin smiled. He took hold of her arms and held her out from him so that he could look her up and down. He laughed. What can be so funny to a prince who's turned his hair blue? You look like you've been in a fight for the first time in your life. Katza had five rooms. Her sleeping room, decorated with dark draperies and wall hangings that Helda had chosen because Katza had refused to form an opinion on the matter. Her bathing room, white marble, large and cold, functional. Her dining room, with windows looking onto the courtyard and a small table where she ate, sometimes with Raffin or Helda, or with Gidden when he wasn't driving her to distraction. Her sitting room, full of soft chairs and pillows that Helda again had chosen. She didn't use the sitting room. The fifth room used to be her workroom, but she couldn't remember the last time she'd embroidered or crocheted or darned a stocking. She couldn't remember the last time she'd worn a stocking, truth be told. She'd turned the room into a place for the storage of her weapons. Swords, daggers, knives, bows, and staffs lined the walls. She'd fitted the room with a solid square table, and now the council meetings were held there. Katza bathed for the second time that day and knotted her wet hair behind her head. She fed her dress to the sleeping room fire and watched its smoky demise with great satisfaction. A boy arrived who was to keep watch during the council meeting. Katza went into the weapons room and lit the torches that hung on the walls between her knives and bows. Raffin and Poe were the first to arrive. Poe's hair was damp from his own bath. The skin had blackened around his eye, the gold eye, and made his gaze even more rakish and uneven than it had been before. He slouched against the table with his hands in his pockets. His eyes flashed around the room, taking in Katz's collection of weapons. 
Ho was wearing a new shirt, open at the neck, and with the sleeves rolled to the elbows. His forearms were as sun-darkened as his face. She didn't know why she should notice. She found herself frowning. Sit, your high majestic lord princes. She yanked a chair from the table and sat down herself. You're in a fine temper. Your hair is blue, Katza snapped back. Al strode into the room. At the sight of the scratch on Katza's face, his mouth dropped open. He turned to Poe and saw the black eye. He turned back to Katza. He began to chuckle. He slapped his hand on the table, and the chuckle turned into a roar. How I would love to have seen that fight, my lady. Oh, how I would love to have seen it. Poe was smiling. The lady won, which I doubt will surprise you. Katza glowered. It was a draw. No one won. I say. It was Giddens' voice, and as he entered the room and looked from Katza to Poe, his eyes grew dark. He put his hand to his sword. He whirled on Poe. I don't see where you come off fighting the Lady Katza. Giddon, don't be ridiculous. Giddon turned to her. He had no right to attack you. I struck the first blow, Giddon. Sit down. If you struck the first blow, then he must have insulted you. Katza jumped up from her seat. That's enough, Giddon. If you think I need you to defend me. A guest to this court, a total stranger. Giddon! Lord Giddon. Poe had risen to his feet, and his voice cut through hers. If I've insulted your lady, you must forgive me. I rarely have the pleasure of practicing with someone of her caliber, and I couldn't resist the temptation. I can assure you she did more damage to me than I did to her. Giddon didn't take his hand from his sword, but his grimace lessened. I'm sorry to have insulted you as well. I see now I should have taken greater care of her face. Forgive me. It was unpardonable. He reached his hand across the table. Giddon's angry eyes grew warm again. He reached out and shook Poe's hand. You understand my concern? Of course. Katza looked from one of them to the other, the two of them shaking hands, understanding each other's concern. She didn't see where Giddon came off feeling insulted. She didn't see how Giddon had any place in it at all. Who were they to take her fight away from her and turn it into some sort of understanding between themselves. He should have taken more care of her face. She would knock his nose from his face. She would thump them both, and she would apologize to neither. Poe caught her eyes then, and she did nothing to soften the silent fury she sent across the table to him. Shall we sit? Someone said. Poe held her eyes as they sat. There was no trace of humor in his expression no trace of the arrogance of his exchange with Giddon. And then he mouthed two words. It was as clear as if he'd said them aloud. Forgive me. Well, Giddon was still a horse's ass. Sixteen council members attended the meeting, in addition to Poe and Lord Davit. Katza, Raffin, Giddon, All and All's wife, Bertel, two soldiers under All's command, two spies who worked with him, three underlords of Giddon's rank, and four servants, one a woman who worked in the kitchens of the castle, one a stable hand, one a washerwoman, and one a clerk in Randa's counting house. There were others in the castle involved with the council, but most nights these were their representatives, along with Ban, when he could get away. Since the meeting had been called to hear Lord Davit's information, the council wasted no time. I regret I can't tell you who kidnapped Prince Telef, David said. You would, of course, prefer that type of information. But I may be able to tell you who didn't. My lands border Estel and Nander. My neighbors are the border lords of King Thigpen and King Drowden. These border lords have worked with the council, and some of them are in the confidence of Thigpen's and Drowden's spies. Prince Raffin, these men are certain that neither King Thigpen nor King Drowden was involved in the kidnapping of the Lenid. Raffin and Katza caught each other's eyes. Then it must be King Byrne of Wester, Raffin said. And so it must, though Katza couldn't imagine the motive. Tell us your sources and your sources' sources. We'll look into it.
If this turns out to be true information, we'll be that much closer to an explanation. The meeting did not go on long. The seven kingdoms had been quiet, and Davit's news was enough to occupy Al and the other spies for the time being. It would help us, Prince Greening, Raffin said. If you'd allow us to keep your grandfather's rescue a secret for now, we can't guarantee his safety if we don't even know who attacked him. Of course, Poe said. I agree. But perhaps a cryptic message to your family to say that all's well with him. Yes, I think I could fashion such a message. Excellent. Raffin clapped his hands on the table. Anything else? Katza? I've nothing. Good. Raffin stood. Until we hear some news, then, or until Grandfather Tilif remembers more, Giddin, will you take Lord Davit back to his rooms? All, Horan, Waller, Bertle, will you come with me? I wish a moment. We'll take the inner passage, Katza, if you don't mind a parade through your sleeping room. Go ahead. It's better than a parade through the corridors. The prince, Katza, will you take the prince? Yes, go on. Raffin turned away with Al and the spies. The soldiers and the servants said their goodbyes and departed. I trust you've recovered from your illness at dinner, Katza, if you've been starting fights. Indeed, it sounds as if you're back to your normal self. She would be civil to him in front of Poe and Lord Davit, though he laughed now in her face. Yes. Thank you, Giddon. Good night to you. Giddon nodded and left with Lord Davit. Poe and Katza were alone. Poe leaned back against the table. Am I not trusted to find my way through the halls by myself? He meant for me to take you through an inner passageway. If you're seen wandering around the hallways of Randus Court at this hour, people will talk. This court will turn the most mundane thing into something to talk about. Yes, I believe that's the case with most courts. Do you plan to stay long at the court? I should like to stay until my grandfather's feeling better. Then we'll have to come up with an excuse for your presence. For isn't it generally known that you seek your grandfather? Poe nodded. If you agreed to train with me, that might serve as an excuse. She began to put out the torches. What do you mean? People would understand if I stayed in order to train with you. They must see that in our view, it's a valuable opportunity for both of us. She paused before the last torch and considered his proposal. She understood him completely. She was tired of fighting nine or ten men at once, fully armored men, none of them able to touch her, and she always tempering her blows. It would be a thrill, a pure thrill, to fight Poe again, to fight him regularly, a dream. Wouldn't it seem as if you'd given up the search for your grandfather? I've already been to Wester and Sunder. I can travel to Nander and Estel under the guise of seeking information, can't I, using this city as my base? No city's more central than Randa's. He could do that, and no one would have reason to question it. She put out the last torch and walked back to him. Half of his face was lit by the light in the hall outside the door. It was his gold eye, his blackened eye, that was illuminated. She looked up at him and set her chin. I'll train with you. But don't expect me to take more care of your face than I did today. He burst into laughter, but then his eyes sobered and he looked at the floor. Forgive me for that, Katza. I wish to make an ally of Lord Giddon, not an enemy. It seemed the only way. Katza shook her head with impatience. Giddon is a fool. He reacted naturally enough, considering his position. He brought his fingertips to her chin suddenly. She froze forgetting the question she'd been about to ask regarding Giddon and what in the Midlands his position should be. He tilted her face to the light. It was my ring. She didn't understand him. It was my ring that scratched you. Your ring? Well, one of my rings. It was one of his rings that scratched her, and now his fingertips touched her face. His hand dropped, returning to his side, and he looked at her calmly, as if this were normal, as if friends she'd only just made always touched her face with their fingertips, as if she ever made friends, as if she had any basis for comparison, to decide what was normal when one made friends and what was not. 
She was not normal. She marched to the doorway and grabbed the torch from the wall. Come. For it was time to get him out of here, this strange person, this cat-eyed person who seemed created to rattle her. She would knock those eyes out of his face the next time they fought. She would knock the hoops from his ears and the rings from his hands. It was time to get him out of here so that she could return to her rooms and return to herself. Chapter 10 He was a marvelous opponent. She couldn't get to him. She couldn't hit him where she meant to, or as hard as she wanted. He was so quick to block or to twist, so quick to react. She couldn't knock him from his feet. She couldn't trap him when their fight had devolved into a wrestling match on the floor. He was so much stronger than she, and for the first time in her life, she found her lesser strength to be a disadvantage. No one had ever gotten close enough to her for it to matter. Before this, he was so finely tuned to his surroundings and to her movements, and that was also part of the challenge. He always seemed to know what she was doing, even when she was behind him. I'll grant you don't have night vision if you'll grant you have eyes in the back of your head, she said once, when she'd entered the practice room and he'd greeted her without looking round to identify her. What do you mean? You always know what's happening behind you. Katza, do you never notice the noise you make when you burst into a room? No one flings doors open the way you do. Perhaps your grace gives you a heightened sense of things. He shook his head. Perhaps, but no more than your own. He still got the worst of their fights, because of her flexibility and her tireless energy, and mostly because of her speed. She might not hit him how she wanted, but she still hit him. And he suffered pain more. He stopped the fight once, while she grappled to pin his arm and his legs and his back to the ground and he hit her repeatedly in the ribs with his one free hand. Doesn't that hurt? He said, gasping with laughter. Don't you feel it? I've hit you possibly twelve times and you don't even flinch. She sat up on her heels and felt the spot below her breast. It hurts, but it's not bad. Your bones are made of rock. You walk away from these fights without a sore spot, while I limp away and spend the day icing my bruises. He didn't wear his rings while they fought. He'd come without them the first day. When she'd protested that it was an unnecessary precaution, his face had assumed a mask of innocence. I promised Gidden, didn't I? He'd said. And that fight had begun with Poe ducking and laughing as Katza swung at his face. They didn't wear their boots either, not after Katza accidentally clipped him on the forehead. He had dropped to his hands and knees, and she saw at once what had happened. Call Raph! She'd cried to all who watched on the side. She'd sat Poe on the floor, ripped off her own sleeve, and tried to stop the flow of blood that ran into his dazed eyes. When Raffin had given him the go-ahead to fight a few days later, she'd insisted they fight barefoot, and in truth, she had taken more care of his face since then. They almost always practiced in front of an audience, a scattering of soldiers or underlords, all whenever he could, for the fights gave him so much pleasure. Gidden, though he always seemed to grow grumpy as he watched, and never stayed long. Even Helda came on occasion, the only woman who did, and sat with wide eyes that grew wider the longer she sat. Randa did not come, which was pleasant. Katza was glad of his tendency to keep her at arm's length. They ate together most days, after practicing, in her dining room, alone, or in Raffin's workrooms, with Raffin and Ban. Sometimes at a table Raffin had brought into Tealiff's room. The grandfather was still very ill, but company seemed to cheer and strengthen him. When they sat together talking, sometimes the silver and gold of Poe's eyes caught her off guard. She could not become used to his eyes. They muddled her. But she met them when he looked at her, and she forced herself to breathe and talk and not become overwhelmed. They were eyes. They were only his eyes, and she wasn't a coward. And besides, she didn't want to behave toward him as the entire court behaved toward her.
avoiding her eyes, awkwardly, coldly. She didn't want to do that to a friend. He was a friend, and in the final few weeks of summer, for the first time in her life, Randa's court became a place of contentment for Katza, a place of good hard work and of friends. All spies moved steadily, learning what they could from their travels to Nander and Estel. The kingdoms, amazingly, were at peace. The heat and the closeness of the air seemed to bring a lull to Randa's cruelty as well, or perhaps he was merely distracted by the flood of foods and wares that always washed into the city from every trade route at that time of year. Whatever the reason, Randa did not summon Katza to perform any of his nasty errands. Katza found herself daring to relax into summer's end. She never ran out of questions for Poe. Where do you get your name? She asked him one day as they sat in the grandfather's room, talking quietly so as not to wake him. Poe wound a cloth wrapped with ice around his shoulder. Which one? I've got lots to choose from. Katza reached across the table to help him tie the cloth tight. Poe, does everyone call you that? My brothers gave me that name when I was little. It's a kind of tree in Leonid, the Poe tree. In autumn, its leaves turn silver and gold. Inevitable nickname, I guess. Katza broke a piece of bread. She wondered if the name had been given fondly, or if it had been an attempt by Poe's brothers to isolate him, to remind him always that he was a Graceling. She watched him pile his plate high with bread, meat, fruit, and cheese, and smiled as the food began to disappear almost as fast as he'd piled it up. Katza could eat a lot. But Poe was something else altogether. What is it like to have six older brothers? I don't think it was for me what it would be for most others. Hand fighting is revered and leaned. My brothers are great fighters, and of course I was able to hold my own with them, even though I was small, and eventually surpass them, every one of them. They treated me like an equal, like more than an equal. And were they also your friends? Oh yes, especially the younger ones. Perhaps it was easier then to be a Graceling fighter if one was a boy, or in a kingdom that revered hand fighting, or perhaps Poe's grace had announced itself less drastically than Katza's had. Perhaps if Katza had six older brothers, she would also have six friends. Or maybe everything was different in Leonid. I've heard the Leonid castles are built on mountain peaks so high that people have to be lifted up to them by ropes. Poe grinned. Only my father's city has the ropes. He poured himself more water and turned back to the food on his plate. Well, are you going to explain them to me, Katza? Is it too much for you to understand that a man might be hungry after you've beaten him half to death? I'm beginning to think it's part of your fighting strategy, keeping me from eating. You want me weak and faint. For someone who's Leonid's finest fighter, you have a delicate constitution. He laughed and put his fork down. All right, all right. How can I describe this? He picked his fork up again and used it to draw a picture in the air as he spoke. My father's city sits at the top of this enormous tall rock, tall as a mountain, that rises straight up from the plains below. There are three ways up to the city. One is a road built into the sides of the rock that winds around and around it slowly. The second is a stairway built into one side of the rock. It bends back and forth on itself until it reaches the top. It's a good approach if you're strong and wide awake and don't have a horse, though most who choose that route eventually tire and end up begging a ride from someone on the road. My brothers and I race it sometimes. Who wins? Where's your confidence in me that you need to ask that question? You would beat us all, of course. My ability to fight has no bearing on my ability to run up a flight of stairs. Nonetheless, I can't imagine you allowing anyone to beat you at anything. Katza snorted. And the third way? The third way is the ropes. But how do they work? Poe scratched his head. Well, it's fairly simple, really. They hang from a great wheel that sits flat on its side at the top of the rock. They dangle down over the edge of the rock, and at the bottom they're attached to platforms. Horses turn the wheel. The wheel pulls the ropes, and the platforms rise. It seems a terrible amount of trouble. Mostly, everyone uses the road. The ropes are only for great shipments of things. And the whole city sits up in the sky. Poe broke himself another piece of bread and nodded.
But why would they build a city in such a place? Po shrugged. I suppose because it's beautiful. What do you mean? Well, you can see forever from the edges of the city, the fields, the mountains and hills, to one side, the sea. The sea. The sea put an end to her questions for a moment. Katza had seen the lakes of Nander, some of them so wide she could barely make out the opposite shore. But she'd never seen the sea. She couldn't imagine that much water. Nor could she imagine water that rocked and crashed against the land, as she'd heard the sea did. She stared absently at the walls of Tilif's small room and tried to think of it. You can see two of my brother's castles from the city, in the foothills of the mountains. The other castles are beyond the mountains, or too far to see. How many castles are there? Seven, just as there are seven suns. Then one is yours. The smallest one. Do you mind that yours is the smallest? Poe chose an apple from the bowl of fruit on the table. I'm glad mine is the smallest, though my brothers don't believe me when I say so. She didn't blame them for disbelieving. She'd never heard of a man, not even her cousin, who didn't want as large a holding as he could have. Giddon was always comparing his estate to that of his neighbors. And when Raffin listed his complaints about Thigpen, he never neglected to mention a certain disagreement over the precise location of the Midlands' eastern border. She'd thought all men were like that. She'd thought she wasn't like that because she wasn't a man. I don't have the ambitions of my brothers. I've never wanted a large holding. I've never wanted to be a king or an overlord. No, nor have I. I've thanked the hills countless times that Raffin was born the son of Randa, and I only his niece, and his sister's daughter at that. My brothers want all that power. They love to get wrapped up in the disputes of my father's court. They actually revel in it. They love managing their own castles and their own cities. I do believe sometimes that they all wish to be king. He leaned back in his chair and absently ran his fingers along his sore shoulder. My castle doesn't have a city. It's not far from a town, but the town governs itself. It doesn't have a court, either. Really, it's just a great house that'll be my home for the times when I'm not traveling. Katza took an apple for herself. You intend to travel? I'm more restless than my brothers. But it's so beautiful, my castle. It's the most wonderful place to go home to. It sits on a cliff above the sea. There are steps down to the water, cut into the cliff, and balconies hanging over the cliff. You feel as if you'll fall if you lean too far. At night, the sun goes down across the water, and the whole sky turns red and orange, and the sea to match it. Sometimes there are great fish out there, fish of impossible colors. They come to the surface and roll about. You can watch them from the balconies. And in winter, the waves are high, and the wind will knock you down. You can't go out to the balconies in winter. It's dangerous and wild. Grandfather, he said suddenly. He jumped up and turned to the bed. Informed that his grandfather had awoken, Katza thought wryly, by the eyes in the back of his head. You speak of your castle, boy. Grandfather, how are you feeling? Katza ate her apple and listened to them talk. Her head was full of the things Poe had said. She hadn't known there were sights in the world so beautiful a person would want to spend an age staring at them. Poe turned to her then and a torch on the wall caught the gleam of his eyes. She focused on breathing. I have a weakness for beautiful sights. My brothers tease me. Your brothers are the foolish ones for not seeing the strength in beautiful things. Come here, child, he said to Katza. Let me see your eyes, for they make me stronger and his kindness brought a smile to her face, though his words were nonsense. She went to sit beside Grandfather Tilif, and he and Poe told her more about Poe's castle and Poe's brothers and Roar's city in the sky. Chapter 11
How far is Giddens' estate from Randa City? Poe asked her late one morning. They sat on the floor of their practice room, drinking water and resting. It had been a good session. Poe had returned the day before from a visit to Nander, and Katza thought the time apart had been good for them. They came together again with a new sharpness. It's near, in the west. A day's journey, perhaps. Have you seen it? Yes. It's large and very grand. He doesn't get home often, but he still manages to keep it well. I'm sure he does. Gidden had come to their practice today. He'd been the only visitor, and he hadn't stayed long. She didn't know why he came, when it always seemed to put him in a bad humor. Katza lay on her back and looked up at the high ceiling. The light poured into the room from the great east-facing windows. The days were beginning to shorten. The air would crispen soon, and the castle would smell of wood burning in the fireplaces. The leaves would crackle under her horse's hooves when she went riding. It had been such a quiet couple of weeks. She would like a council task. She'd like to get out of the city and stretch her legs. She wondered if Al had any news about Grandfather Teleth yet. Maybe she could go to Wester herself and poke around for information. How will you answer Giddon when he asks you to marry him? Will you accept? Katza sat up and stared at him. That's an absurd question. Absurd? Why? His face was clear of its usual smiles. She didn't think he was teasing her. Why in the Midlands would Giddon ask me to marry him? His eyes narrowed. Katza, you're not serious. She looked at him blankly. And now he did begin to smile. Katza, don't you know Giddon's in love with you? Katza snorted. Don't be ridiculous. Giddon lives to criticize me. Poe shook his head, and his laugh began to rumble from his chest. Katza, how can you be so blind? He's completely smitten. Don't you see how jealous he is? Don't you remember how he reacted when I scratched your face? An unpleasant feeling began to gather in her stomach. I don't see what that has to do with it. And besides, how would you know? I don't believe Lord Giddon confides in you. He laughed. No, no, he certainly doesn't. Giddon trusts me about as much as he trusts Mergen. I imagine he thinks any man who fights you as I do is no better than an opportunist, and no worse than a thug. You're deceived. Giddon feels nothing for me. I can't make you see it, Katza, if you're determined not to see it. Poe stretched onto his back and yawned. All the same, I might think up a response if I were you, just in case he were to propose. He laughed again. I'll have to ice my shoulder as usual. I'd say you won again today, Katza. She jumped to her feet. Are we done here? I suppose so. Are you hungry? She waved him off and marched to the door. She left him lying on his back in the light of the windows and ran to find Raffin. Katza burst into Raffin's workrooms. Raffin and Ban sat at a table, huddled together over a book. Are you alone? They looked up, surprised. Yes? Is Gidden in love with me? Raffin blinked, and Ban's eyes widened. He's never spoken to me about it. But, yes. I think anyone who knows him would say he's in love with you. Katza slapped her hand to her forehead. Of all the fool... How can he... She paced to the table. She turned and paced back to the door. Has he said something to you? No, Poe told me. She spun toward Raffin. And why did you never tell me? Cat. He sat back from his book. I thought you knew. I don't see how you could not... He makes himself your escort every time the king's business takes you away from the city. He always sits beside you at dinner. Randa decides where we sit at dinner. Well, and Randa probably knows Giddon hopes to marry you. Katza paced to the table again, clutching her hair. Oh, this is dreadful. Whatever shall I do? If he asks you to marry him, you'll say no. You'll tell him it's nothing to do with him. You'll tell him you're determined not to marry, that you don't wish children. Whatever you need to say so he understands, it's nothing to do with him. I wouldn't marry Giddon to save my life. Not even to save yours. Well, Raffin's eyes were full of laughter. I'd leave that part out. Katza sighed and walked again to the door. <laughs>
You're not the most perceptive person I've ever known, Cat. If you don't mind my saying so, your capacity for missing the obvious is astonishing. She threw her arms into the air. She turned to go. She turned back to him suddenly at a shocking thought. You're not in love with me, are you? He stared at her for a moment, speechless. Then he burst into laughter. Ban laughed too, though he tried valiantly to hide it behind his hand. Katza was too relieved to be offended. All right, all right. I suppose I deserve that. My dear Katza, Gidden is so very handsome. Are you sure you won't reconsider? Raffin and Ban clutched their stomachs and guffawed. Katza waved their nonsense away. They were hopeless. She turned to go. Council meeting tonight. Raffin said to her back. She raised her hand to show she'd heard. She closed the door on their laughter. There's very little happening in the Seven Kingdoms. Al said. We've called this meeting only because we have some information about Prince Tilif we can't make any sense of. We're hoping you'll have some ideas. Ban had joined them for this meeting because the grandfather was well enough now to be left alone on occasion. Katza had taken advantage of Ban's broad chest and shoulders and seated him between herself and Gidden. Gidden could not possibly see her, but just in case she'd positioned Raffin between them as well. Al and Poe were across from her. Poe sat back in his chair, his eyes glimmering in the corner of her vision, no matter which way she looked. Lord Davit gave us true information. Neither Nander nor Estel knows anything of the kidnapping. Neither was involved. But now we're almost certain that King Byrne of Wester is also innocent. Could it be Mergen then? But with what motive? He has no motive, Raffin said. But then, he has no less motive than anyone else. It's what we keep coming up against. There is no motive for anyone to have done this. Even Poe, Prince Greening, has been able to come up with none. Poe nodded. My grandfather's only importance is to his family. And if someone had it in mind to provoke the Leaned royal family, wouldn't they reveal themselves eventually? Otherwise, the power play becomes pointless. Has Tilif said anything more? He said they blindfolded him and drugged him. He said he was on a boat for a long time and their land travel was shorter in comparison, which suggests his captors took him east by boat from Leenid, possibly to one of the southern Sundaran ports, and then up through the forests to Mergen City. He said that when he heard them speak, he believed their accents to be southern. It does suggest Sunder and Mergen. But it didn't make sense. None of the kings had reason, but Mergen even less. Mergen worked for others and his sole motivation was money. Everyone at the table, everyone in the council knew that. Poe, your grandfather had no argument with your father or any of your brothers. Your mother? None. I'm sure of it. I don't see how you can be so sure. Poe's eyes flashed to him. You'll have to take my word, Lord Gidden. Neither my father, nor my brothers, nor my mother, nor anyone else at the Leonid court was involved in the kidnapping. Poe's word is good enough for the council, Raffin said. And if it wasn't Byrne, Drowden, Figpen, Randa, or Roar, that leaves Mergen. Poe raised his eyebrows. Have none of you considered the king of Monsi? A king with a reputation for kindness to injured animals and lost children? Come out of his isolation to kidnap his wife's aging father? A bit unlikely, don't you think? We've made inquiries and uncovered nothing. King Lek is a peace-loving man. Either it's Mergen, or one of the kings is keeping a secret even from his own spies. It may have been Mergen, or it may not. Either way, Mergen knows who's responsible. If Mergen knows, then the people closest to him know. Couldn't we find one of Mergen's people? I could make him talk. Not without revealing your identity, my lady. But she could kill him after she questioned him. Now hold on. Katza held up her hand. I said nothing of killing. But it's not worth the information, Katza, for you to interrogate someone who'll recognize you and speak of it to Mergen afterward. Greening should be the one to do it anyway, Gidden said, and Poe's cool eyes flicked to him again. Mergen wouldn't question the motivation of a leaned prince. Mergen would expect it of him. In fact, I don't see why you haven't done it already, Gidden said to Poe. 
if you wish so much to know who's responsible. Katza was too irritated to care about her strategic seeding plan. She leaned around Raffin and Ban to address Giddon. It's because Mergen can't know that Poe knows Mergen is involved. How would Poe explain that knowledge without incriminating us? But that's just why you can't question Mergen's people, Katza, unless you're willing to kill afterwards. Giddon thumped his hand on the table and glared at her. All right, all right. We're going in circles. Katza sat back, seething. Katza, the information isn't worth the risk to you or to the Council, nor, I think, is it worth the violence. She sighed inwardly. He was right, of course. Perhaps it'll be worth it some day in the future. But for now, Grandfather Teleth is safe, and we've seen no sign from Mergen or from anyone else that he's being targeted again. Poe, if there are steps you wish to take, that's your affair, though I'd ask you to discuss it with us first. I must think on it. Then the matter is closed for now, until we learn something new or until Poe comes to a decision. All, is there anything else on the table? All began to speak then of a western village that had met a Nandrin raiding party with a pair of catapults given to them by a western lord who was friend to the council. The Nandrin raiders had fled, thinking they were being attacked by an army. There was laughter at the table, and Al began another story. But Katz's thoughts wandered to Mergen and his dungeons, to the Sundaran forests that likely held the secrets of the kidnapping. She felt Poe's gaze, and she glanced at him across the table. His eyes were on her, but he didn't see her. His mind was elsewhere. He got that look sometimes when they sat together after their fights. She watched his face. The cut on his forehead was no more than a thin red line now. It would leave a scar. She wondered if that would rankle his leaned vanity, but then she smiled within herself. He wasn't really vain. He hadn't cared a bit when she'd blackened his eye. He'd done nothing to hide the gash on his forehead. And besides, no vain person would choose to fight her day after day. No vain person would put his body at the mercy of her hands. His sleeves were rolled to his elbows again. His manners were so careless. Her eyes rested on the shadows in the hollows of his neck, then rose to his face again. She supposed he would have reason to be vain. He was handsome enough, as handsome as Giddon or Raffin, with his straight nose and the set of his mouth and his strong shoulders and even those gleaming eyes, even they might be considered handsome. His eyes came back into focus then and looked into hers, and then something mischievous in his eyes, and a grin, almost as if he knew exactly what she was thinking, exactly what she'd decided about his claims to vanity. Katz's face closed, and she glowered at him, the meeting ended, and chairs scraped. Raffin pulled her aside to speak of something. She was grateful for the excuse to turn away. She wouldn't see Poe again until their next fight. And the fights always returned her to herself. Chapter 12 The next morning, Randa came to their practice for the first time. He stood at the side so that everyone in the room was compelled to stand as well and watch him instead of the fighters they'd come to see. Katza was glad to fight, glad for the excuse to ignore him, except that she couldn't ignore him. He was so tall and broad and he stood against the white wall in bright blue robes. His lazy laugh carried into every corner of the room. She couldn't shake the sense of him, and there must be something he wanted. He never sought out his lady killer unless there was something he wanted. She had been running through a drill with Poe when Randa had arrived, a drill that was giving her some trouble. It began with Katza on her knees and Poe behind her, pinning her arms behind her back. Her task was to break free of Poe's grip and then grapple with him, 
until she had trapped him in the same position. She could always fight her way free of Poe's grip. That wasn't the problem. It was the counterpin that frustrated her. Even if she managed to knock him to his knees and trap his arms, she couldn't keep him down. It was a matter of brute strength. If he tried to muscle himself to his feet, she didn't have the force to stop him, not unless she knocked him unconscious or injured him seriously, and that wasn't the point of the exercise. She needed to find a holding position that would make the effort of rising too painful to be worth his while. They began the drill again. She knelt with Poe at her back, and Poe's hands tightened around her wrists. Randa's voice rose and fell, and one of the stewards responded, flattering, fawning. Everyone flattered Randa. Katza was ready for Poe this time. She twisted out of his grip and was on him like a wildcat. She pummeled his stomach, hooked her foot between his legs, and battered him to his knees. She yanked at his arms, his right shoulder. That was the one he was always icing. She twisted his right arm and leaned all her weight against it, so that any attempt to move would require him to wrench his shoulder and bring more pain to it than she was already causing him to feel. I surrender. She released him, and he heaved himself to his feet. He massaged his shoulder. Good work, Katza. Again. They ran through the drill again, and then once more, and both times she trapped him easily. You've got it. Good. What next? Shall I try it? Her name cut through the air then, and her hackles rose. She'd been right. He hadn't come only to watch. And now, before all these people, she must act pleasant and civil. She fought against the frown that rose to her face and turned to the king. It's so amusing, Randa said, to see you struggling with an opponent, Katza. I'm glad it gives you amusement, Lord King. Prince Greening, how do you find our lady killer? She's the superior fighter by far, Lord King. If she didn't hold herself back, I'd be in great trouble. Randa laughed. Indeed. I've noticed it's you who comes to dinner with bruises, and not she. Pride in his possession. Katza forced herself to unclench her fists. She forced herself to breathe, to hold her uncle's gaze even though she wanted to scratch the leer from his face. Katza, come to me later today. I have a job for you. Yes, Lord King. Thank you, Lord King. Randa leaned back on his heels and surveyed the room. Then, with his stewards rushing into their places behind him, he exited with a great swish of blue robes and Katza stared after him until he and his entourage had vanished. And then she stared at the door the stewards slammed behind him. Around the room, slowly, lords and soldiers sat down. Katza was vaguely aware of their movements, vaguely aware of Poe's eyes on her face, watching her silently. What's it to be now, Katza? She knew what she wanted. She felt it shooting down her arms and into her fingers, tingling in her legs and feet. A straight fight. Anything fair. Until one of us surrenders. Poe narrowed his eyes. He considered her tight fists and her hard mouth. We'll have that fight, but we'll have it tomorrow. We're done for today. No, we fight. Katza, we're done. She stalked up to him close so that no one else could hear. What's the matter, Poe? Do you fear me? Yes, I fear you as I should when you're angry. I won't fight you when you're angry, nor should you fight me when I'm angry. That's not the purpose of these practices. And when he told her she was angry, she realized it was true. And just as quickly, her anger fizzled into despair. Randa would send her on another strong-arm mission. He would send her to hurt some poor, petty criminal some fool who deserved to keep his fingers, even if he was dishonorable. He would send her, and she must go. For the power sat with him. They ate in her dining room. Katza stared at her plate. He was talking about his brothers, 
how his brothers would love to see their practices. She must come to Lenid one day and fight with him for his family. They'd be amazed by her skill, and they'd honor her greatly. And he could show her the most beautiful sights in his father's city. She wasn't listening. She was picturing the arms she'd broken for her uncle. The arms bent the wrong way at the elbow, bone splinters sticking through the skin. He said something about his shoulder, and she shook herself and looked at him. What did you say? About your shoulder? I'm sorry. He dropped his gaze and fiddled with his fork. Your uncle has quite an effect on you. You haven't been yourself since he walked into the practice room. Or maybe I have been myself. And the other times I'm not myself. What do you mean? My uncle thinks me savage. He thinks me a killer. Well, isn't he right? Didn't I become savage when he entered the room? And what is it we're practicing every day? She tore apart a piece of bread and threw it onto her plate. She glared at her meal. I don't believe you're savage. She sighed sharply. You haven't seen me with Randa's enemies. He raised his cup to his lips and drank, then lowered it, watching her. What will he ask you to do this time? She pushed the fire down that rose up from her stomach. She wondered what would happen if she slammed her plate on the ground, how many pieces it would break into. It'll be some lord who owes him money, or who refused to agree to some bargain, or who looked at him wrong. I'll be told to hurt the man, enough so that he never dishonors my uncle again. And you'll do what he tells you to do? Who are these fools who continue to resist Randa's will? Haven't they heard the stories? Don't they know he'll send me? Isn't it in your power to refuse? How can anyone force you to do anything? The fire burst into her throat and choked her. He is the king. And you're a fool, too, if you think I have choice in the matter. But you do have choice. He's not the one who makes you savage. You make yourself savage when you bend yourself to his will. She sprang to her feet and swung at his jaw with the side of her hand. She lessened the force of the blow only at the last instant, when she realized he hadn't raised his arm to block her. Her hand hit his face with a sickening crack. She watched, horrified, as his chair toppled backward and his head slammed against the floor. She'd hit him hard. She knew she'd hit him hard, and he hadn't defended himself. She ran to him. He lay on his side, both hands over his jaw. A tear trickled from his eye, over his fingers, and onto the floor. He grunted or sobbed. She didn't know which. She knelt beside him and touched his shoulder. Did I break your jaw? Can you speak? He shifted then, pushed himself up to a sitting position. He felt at the side of his jaw and opened and closed his mouth. He moved his jaw left and right. I don't think it's broken. His voice was a whisper. She put her hand to his face and felt the bones under his skin. She felt the other side of his face to compare. She could tell no difference, and she caught her breath with relief. It's not broken, though it seems it should be. I pulled back when I realized you weren't fighting me. She reached up to the table and dipped her hands into the water pitcher. She scooped blocks of ice onto a cloth and wrapped them up. She brought the ice to his jaw. Why didn't you fight back? He held the ice to his face and groaned. This'll hurt for days. Paul. He looked at her and sighed. I told you before, Katza. I won't fight when you're angry. I won't solve a disagreement between us with blows. He lifted the ice and fingered his jaw. He moaned and held the ice to his face again. What we do in the practice rooms, that's to help each other. We don't use it against each other. We're friends, Katza. Shame pricked behind her eyes. It was so elemental, so obvious. It wasn't what one friend did to another. Yet she'd done it. We're too dangerous to each other, Katza. And even if we weren't, it's not right. I'll never do it again. I swear to it. He caught her eyes then and held them. I know you won't, Katza. Wildcat. Don't blame yourself. You expected me to fight back. You wouldn't have struck me otherwise. But still, she should have known better.
It wasn't even you who angered me. It was him. Poe considered her for a moment. What do you think would happen if you refused to do what Randa ordered? She didn't know, really. She only imagined him sneering at her, his words crackling with contempt. If I don't do what he says, he'll become angry. When he becomes angry, I'll become angry. And then I'll want to kill him. Hmm. He worked his mouth back and forth. You're afraid of your own anger. She stopped then and looked at him, because that seemed right to her. She was afraid of her own anger. But Randa isn't even worth your anger. He's no more than a bully. Katza snorted. A bully who chops off people's fingers or breaks their arms. Not if you stop doing it for him. Much of his power comes from you. She was afraid of her own anger. She repeated it in her mind. She was afraid of what she would do to the king, and with good reason. Look at Poe, his jaw red and beginning to swell. She'd learned to control her skill, but she hadn't learned to control her anger. And that meant she still didn't control her grace. Should we move back to the table? He said, for they were still sitting on the floor. You should probably go see Rath, just to be sure nothing's broken. Her eyes dropped. Forgive me, Poe. Poe heaved himself to his feet. He reached for her hand and pulled her up. You're forgiven, lady. She shook her head, disbelieving his kindness. You lean it are so odd. Your reactions are never what mine would be. You, so calm when I've hurt you so badly. Your father's sister, so strange in her grief. Poe narrowed his eyes then. What do you mean? About what? Isn't the Queen of Mansi your father's sister? What's she done, my father's sister? The word is she stopped eating when she heard of your grandfather's disappearance. You didn't know? And then she closed herself and her child into her rooms, and wouldn't let anyone enter, not even the king. She wouldn't let the king enter, he repeated, puzzlement in his voice. Nor anyone else, except a handmaiden to bring them meals. Why did no one tell me about this before? I assumed you knew, Poe. I'd no idea it would matter so much to you. Are you close to her? Poe stared at the table, at the mess of melting ice and their half-eaten meal. His mind was elsewhere, his brow furrowed. Poe, what is it? He shook his head. It's not how I would have expected Ashen to behave. But it's no matter. I must find Raffin, or Ban. She watched his face then. There's something you're not telling me. He wouldn't meet her eyes. How long will you be away on Randa's errand? It's not likely to be more than a few days. When you return, I must speak with you. Why don't you speak with me now? He shook his head. I need to think. I need to work something out. Why were his eyes so uneasy? Why was he looking at the table and the floor, but never into her face? It was concern for his father's sister. It was worry for the people he cared about. For that was his way, this leaned. His friendship was true. He looked at her then. The smallest of smiles flickered across his face, but it didn't reach his eyes. Don't feel too kindly toward me, Katza. Neither of us is blameless as a friend. He left her then to find Raffin. She stood and stared at the place where he'd just been, and tried to shake off the eerie sense that he had just answered something she'd thought, rather than something she'd said. Chapter 13 Not that it was the first time he'd left her with that feeling. Poe had a way about him. He knew her opinions, sometimes before she expressed them. He looked at her from across a table and knew she was angry, and why, or that she'd decided he was handsome. Raffin had told her she wasn't perceptive. Poe was perceptive, and talkative. Perhaps 
That was why they got along so well. She didn't have to explain herself to Poe, and he explained himself to her without her having to ask. She'd never known a person with whom she could communicate so freely. So unused was she to the phenomenon of friendship. She mused about this as the horses carried them west, until the hills began to even out and give way to great grassy flatlands, and the pleasure of smooth, hard riding distracted her. Giddon was in good humor, for this was his country. They would visit his estate on their way to one just beyond his. They would sleep in his castle, first on their outward journey and then again on their return. Giddon rode eagerly and fast, and though Katza didn't relish his company, for once she couldn't complain of their pace. It's a bit awkward, isn't it? Al said when they stopped at midday to rest. For the king to have asked you to punish your neighbor? It is awkward, Giddon said. Lord Ellis is a good neighbor. I can't imagine what has possessed him to create this trouble with Randa. Well, he's protecting his daughters. No man can fault him for that. It's Ellis's bad luck that it puts him at odds with the king. Randa had made a deal with a Nandaran underlord. The underlord couldn't attract a wife, because his holding was in the south-central region of Nander, directly in the path of Western and Estelan raiding parties. It was a dangerous place, especially for a woman. And it was a desolate holding, without even sufficient servants, for the raiders had killed and stolen so many. The underlord was desperate for a wife, so desperate that he was willing to forego her dowry. King Randa had offered to take the trouble to find him a bride, on the condition that her dowry went to Randa. Lord Ellis had two daughters of marriageable age, two daughters and two very great dowries. Randa had ordered Ellis to choose which daughter he would prefer to send as a bride to Nander. Choose the daughter who is stronger in spirit, Randa had written, for it is not a match for the weak-hearted. Lord Ellis had refused to choose either daughter. Both of my daughters are strong in spirit, he wrote to the king. But I will send neither to the wastelands of Nander. The king has greater power than any, but I do not think he has the power to force an unsuitable marriage for his own convenience. Katza had gasped when Raffin told her what Lord Ellis said in his letter. He was a brave man, as brave as any Randa had come up against. Randa wanted Giddon to talk to Ellis, and if talk didn't work, he wanted Katza to hurt Ellis, in the presence of his daughters, so that one of them would step forward and offer herself to the marriage to protect her father. Randa expected them to return to his court with one or the other of the daughters and her dowry. This is a gruesome task we're asked to perform. Even without Ellis being your neighbor, it's gruesome. It is but I see no way around it. They sat on an outcropping of stone and ate bread and fruit. Katza watched the long grass moving around them. The wind pushed it, attacked it, struck it in one place and then another. It rose and fell and rose again. It flowed like water. Is this what the sea is like? Katza asked, and they both turned to her, surprised. Does the sea move the way this grass moves? It is like this, my lady, but different. The sea makes rushing noises, and it's gray and cold. But it does move a bit like this. I should like to see the sea. Giddon's eyes on her were incredulous. What? Is it such a strange thing to say? It's a strange thing for you to say. He shook his head. He gathered their bread and fruit, then rose. The leaned fighter is filling your mind with romantic notions. He went to his horse. She ignored him so that she didn't have to think about his own notions of romance or his suit or his jealousy. She rode hard across the flatlands, and imagine she rode across the sea. It was more difficult to ignore the reality of Giddon once they'd reached his castle. The walls were great, gray, and impressive. The servants flowed into the sunny courtyard to greet their lord and bow to him, and he called them by name, 
and asked after the grain in the storehouses, the castle, the bridge that was being repaired. He was king here, and she could see that he was comfortable with this, and that his servants were happy to see him. Giddens' servants were always attentive to Katza whenever she was at his court. They approached her to ask if she needed anything. They lit a fire for her and brought her water so she could wash. When she walked past them in the hallways, they greeted her. She wasn't treated this way anywhere else, not even in her own home. It occurred to her now that, of course, Giddon had specifically ordered his servants to treat her like a lady, not to fear her, or if they did fear her, to pretend they didn't. All of this Giddon had done for her. She realized his servants must look upon her as their future mistress, for if all of Randa's court knew Giddon's feelings, then surely Giddon's servants had interpreted them as well. She didn't know how to be at Giddon's court now, realizing they all expected something of her she would never give. She thought they'd be relieved to know she wouldn't marry Giddon. They would exhale and smile and prepare cheerfully for whatever kind, harmless lady was his second choice. But perhaps they only hoped for their lord what he hoped for himself. Giddon's hope bewildered her. She couldn't fathom his foolishness to fall in love with her. And she still didn't entirely believe it to be true. Al grew increasingly morose about Lord Ellis. It's a cruel task the king has asked us to perform, he said at dinner, in Giddon's private dining room, where the three of them ate with a pair of servants to attend to them. I can't remember if he's ever asked us to perform a task so cruel. He has, and we've performed it. And you've never spoken like this before. It just seems... Al broke off to stare absently at Giddon's walls, covered with rich tapestries in red and gold. It just seems that this is a task the council wouldn't condone. The council would send someone to protect these daughters, from us. Giddon pushed potatoes onto his fork and chewed. He considered Al's words. We can't do any work for the council if we don't also follow Randa's commands. We're no use to anyone if we're sitting in the dungeons. Yes, but still, it doesn't seem right. By the end of the meal, Giddon was as morose as all. Katza watched Al's craggy face and his unhappy eyes. She watched Giddon eating his knife reflecting the gold and red of the walls as he cut his meat. His voice was low, and he sighed. They both sighed, Al and Giddon, as they talked and ate. They didn't want to perform this task for Randa. As Katza watched them and listened, the fingers of her mind began to open and reach around for some means by which they might thwart Randa's instructions. Poe had said it was in her power to refuse Randa, and maybe it was in her power, as it was not in Al's or Giddens, because Randa could punish them in ways he couldn't punish her. Could he punish her? He could use his entire army, perhaps, to force her into his dungeons. He could kill her, not in a fight, but he could poison her one night at dinner. If he thought her a danger or didn't think her useful, he would certainly have her imprisoned or killed. And what if his anger, when she returned to court without Ellis's daughter, inflamed her own? What would happen at court if she stood before Randa and felt an anger in her hands and feet she couldn't contain? What would she do? It didn't matter. When Katza awoke the next morning in her comfortable bed in Giddens' castle, she knew it didn't matter what Randa might do to her or what she might do to Randa. If she were forced to injure Lord Ellis today, as Randa wished, it would set her into a rage. She sensed the rage building, just at the thought of it. Her rage if she hurt Lord Ellis would be no less catastrophic than her rage if she didn't, and Randa retaliated. She would not do it. She wouldn't torture a man who was only trying to protect his children. She didn't know what would happen because of this, but she knew that today she would hurt no one. She threw back her blankets 
and thought only of today. Giddon and Al dragged their feet as they prepared their bags and their horses. Perhaps we'll be able to talk him into an agreement, Giddon said lamely. Huh, was Al's only response. Ellis's castle was a few short hours' ride distant. When they arrived, a steward showed them into the great library, where Ellis sat writing at a desk. The walls were lined with books, some so high they could only be reached by ladders made of fine dark wood that leaned against the shelves. Lord Ellis stood as they entered, his eyes bold and his chin high. He was a small man, with a thatch of black hair and small fingers which he spread across the top of his desk. I know why you're here, Giddon. Giddon cleared his throat uncomfortably. We wish to talk with you, Ellis, and with your daughters. I will not bring my daughters into present company, Ellis said, his eyes flicking to Katza. He didn't flinch under her gaze, and he went up another notch in her estimation. Now was the time for her to act. She counted three servants standing rigidly against the walls. Lord Ellis, if you care at all for the safety of your servants, you'll send them from this room. Giddon glanced at her, surprise apparent on his face, for this was not their usual mode of operation. Katza! Don't waste my time, Lord Ellis. I can remove them myself if you will not. Lord Ellis waved his men to the door. Go, he said to them. Go. Allow no one to enter. See to your duties. Their duties most likely involved removing the Lord's daughters from the grounds immediately, if the daughters were even at home. Lord Ellis struck Katza as the type to have prepared for this. When the door had closed, she held her hand up to silence Giddon. He shot her a look of puzzled irritation, which she ignored. Lord Ellis, the king wishes us to talk you into sending one of your daughters to Nander. I imagine we're unlikely to succeed. Ellis's face was hard, and still he held her eyes. Correct. Katza nodded. Very well. That failing, Randa wishes me to torture you until one of your daughters steps forward and offers herself to the marriage. Ellis's face didn't change. I suspected as much. Giddon's voice was low. Katza, what are you doing? The king, Katza said, and then she felt such a rush of blood to her head that she touched the desk to steady herself. The king is just in some matters. In this matter, he is not. He wishes to bully you, but the king doesn't do his own bullying. He looks to me for that, and I... Katza felt strong suddenly. She pushed away from the desk and stood tall. I won't do what Randa says. I won't compel you or your daughters to follow his command. My lord, you may do what you will. The room was silent. Ellis's eyes were big with astonishment, and he leaned heavily on the desk now, as if danger had strengthened him before and its lack now made him weak. Beside Katza, Giddon didn't seem to be breathing, and when she glanced at him, his mouth hung slightly ajar. Al stood a little aside, his face kind and worried. Well, this is quite a surprise, my lady. I thank you, my lady. Indeed, I can't thank you enough. Katza didn't think a person should thank her for not causing pain. Causing joy was worthy of thanks, and causing pain worthy of disgust. Causing neither was neither, it was nothing, and nothing didn't warrant thanks. You don't owe me gratitude, and I fear this won't put an end to your troubles with Randa. Katza? It was all. Are you certain this is what you want? What will Randa do to you? Whatever he does. We'll support you. No, you won't support me. I must be on my own in this. Randa must believe that you and Giddon tried to force me to follow his order but couldn't. She wondered if she should injure them to make it more convincing. But we don't want to perform this task any more than you do. It's our talk that propelled you to make this choice. 
We can't stand by and let you... Katza spoke deliberately. If he knows you disobeyed him, he'll imprison you or kill you. He can't hurt me the way he can hurt you. I don't think his entire guard could capture me. And if they did, at least I don't have a holding that depends on me as you do, Gidden. I don't have a wife as you do, all. Gidden's face was dark. He opened his mouth to speak, but Katza cut through his words. You two are no use if you're in prison. Raffin needs you. Wherever I may be, I will need you. Gidden tried to speak. I won't. She would make him see this. She would cut through his obtuseness and make him see this. She slammed her hand on the desk so hard that papers cascaded onto the floor. I'll kill the king. I'll kill the king unless you both agree not to support me. This is my rebellion and mine alone. And if you don't agree, I swear to you on my grace, I will murder the king. She didn't know if she would do it, but she knew she seemed wild enough for them to believe she would. She turned to all. Say you agree. All cleared his throat. It will be as you say, my lady. She faced Gidden. Gidden? I don't like it. Gidden? It will be as you say, he said, his eyes on the floor and his face red and gloomy. Katza turned to Ellis. Lord Ellis, if Randa learns that Captain All or Lord Gidden agreed to this willingly, I'll know that you spoke. I'll kill you. I'll kill your daughters. Do you understand? I understand, my lady. And again, I thank you. Something caught in her throat at this second thanks, when she'd threatened him so brutally. When you're a monster, she thought, you are thanked and praised for not behaving like a monster. She would like to restrain from cruelty and receive no admiration for it. And now in this room, with only ourselves present, we'll work out the details of what we'll claim happened here today. They ate dinner in Gidden's dining room, in Gidden's castle, just as they had the night before. Gidden had given her permission to cut his neck with her knife, and Al had allowed her to bruise his cheekbone. She would have done it without their permission, for she knew Randa would expect evidence of a scuffle. But Al and Gidden had seen the wisdom of it, or perhaps they'd guessed she would do it whether or not they agreed. They'd stood still and bravely. She hadn't enjoyed the task, but she'd caused them as little pain as her skill allowed. There was not much conversation at dinner. Katza broke bread, chewed, and swallowed. She stared at the fork and knife in her hands. She stared at her silver goblet. The Estelin Lord. The men's eyes jumped up from their plates. The Lord who took more lumber from Randa than he should have. You remember him? They nodded. I didn't hurt him. That is, I knocked him unconscious, but I didn't injure him. She put her knife and fork down and looked from Gidden to all. I couldn't. He more than paid for his crime in gold. I couldn't hurt him. They watched her for a moment. Gidden's eyes dropped to his plate. All cleared his throat. Perhaps the council work has put us in touch with our better natures. Katza picked up her knife and fork cut into her mutton, and thought about that. She knew her nature. She would recognize it if she came face to face with it. It would be a blue-eyed, green-eyed monster, wolf-like and snarling, a vicious beast that struck out at friends in uncontrollable anger, a killer that offered itself as the vessel of the king's fury. But then it was a strange monster, for beneath its exterior it was frightened and sickened by its own violence. It chastised itself for its savagery, and sometimes it had no heart for violence and rebelled against it utterly. A monster that refused sometimes to behave like a monster. When a monster stopped behaving like a monster, did it stop being a monster? Did it become something else? Perhaps she wouldn't recognize her own nature after all. 
There were too many questions and too few answers at this dinner table in Giddens Castle. She would like to be traveling with Raffin or Poe rather than Al and Giddon. They would have answers of one kind or another. She must guard against using her grace in anger. This was where her nature's struggle lay. After dinner, she went to Giddon's archery range, hoping the thunk of arrows into a target would calm her mind. There he found her. She had wanted to be by herself, but when Giddon stepped out of the shadows, tall and quiet, she wished they were in a great hall with hundreds of people, a party even, she in a dress and horrible shoes, a dance, any place other than alone with Giddon, where no one would stumble upon them and no one would interrupt. You're shooting arrows at a target in the dark. She lowered her bow. She supposed this was one of his criticisms. Yes, she said, for she could think of no other response. Are you as good a shot in the dark as you are in the light? Yes, she said, and he smiled, which made her nervous. If he was going to be pleasant, then she feared where this was heading. She would much prefer him to be arrogant and critical and unpleasant if they must be alone together. There's nothing you cannot do, Katza. Don't be absurd. But he seemed determined not to argue. He smiled again and leaned against the wooden railing that separated her lane from the others. What do you think will happen at Randa's court tomorrow? Truly, I don't know. Randa will be very angry. I don't like that you're protecting me from his anger, Katza. I don't like it at all. I'm sorry, Giddon, as I'm sorry for the cut on your neck. Shall we return to the castle? She lifted the strap of the quiver over her head and set it on the ground. He watched her quietly, and a small panic began to stir in her chest. You should let me protect you. You can't protect me from the king. It would be fatal to you and a waste of your energies. Let's go back to the castle. Marry me, and our marriage will protect you. Well then, he had said it, as Poe had predicted, and it hit her like one of Poe's punches to the stomach. She didn't know where to look. She couldn't stand still. She put her hand to her head. She put it to the railing. She willed herself to think. Our marriage wouldn't protect me. Randa wouldn't pardon me simply because I married. But he would be more lenient. Our engagement would offer him an alternative. It would be dangerous for him to try to punish you, and he knows that. If we say we're to be married, then he can send us away from court. He can send us here, and he'll be out of your reach and you out of his. And there will be some pretense of good feeling between you. And she would be married, and to Giddon. She would be his wife, the lady of his house. She'd be charged with entertaining his wretched guests, expected to hire and dismiss his servants based on their skill with a pastry or some such nonsense, expected to bear him children and stay at home to love them. She would go to his bed at night, Giddon's bed, and lie with a man who considered a scratch to her face an affront to his person, a man who thought himself her protector, her protector, when she could outduel him if she used a toothpick to his sword. She breathed it away, breathed away the fury. He was a friend and loyal to the council. She wouldn't speak what she thought. She would speak what Raffin had told her to speak. Giddon, surely you've heard I don't intend to marry. But would you refuse a suitable proposal? And you must admit, it seems a solution to your problem with the king. Giddon. He stood before her, his face even, his eyes warm. So confident. He didn't imagine she could refuse him. And perhaps that was forgivable, for perhaps no other woman would. Giddon, you need a wife who will give you children. I've never wished children. You must marry a woman who wishes babies. You're not an unnatural woman, Katza. You can fight as other women can't, but you're not so different from other women. 
You'll want babies, I'm certain of it. She hadn't expected to have such an immediate opportunity to practice containing her temper, for he deserved a thumping, to knock his certainty out of his head and onto the ground where it belonged. I can't marry you, Giddon. It's nothing to do with you. It's only to do with me. I won't marry, not anyone, and I won't bear any man children. He stared at her then, and his face changed. She knew that look on Giddon's face, the sarcastic curl of his lip and the glint in his eye. He was beginning to hear her. I don't think you've considered what you're saying, Katza. Do you expect ever to receive a more attractive proposal? It's nothing to do with you, Giddon. It's only to do with me. Do you imagine there are others who would form an interest in a lady killer? Giddon. You are hoping the Leonid will ask for your hand. He pointed at her, his face mocking. You prefer him, for he's a prince, and I'm only a lord. Katza threw her arms in the air. Giddon, of all the preposterous— He won't ask you, and if he did, you'd be a fool to accept. He's about as trustworthy as Mergen. Giddon, I assure you— Nor is he honorable. A man who fights you as he does is no better than an opportunist and no worse than a thug. She froze. She stared at Giddon and didn't even see his finger jabbing in the air, his puffed-up face. Instead, she saw Poe, sitting on the floor of the practice room, using the exact words Giddon had just used, before Giddon had used them. Giddon, have you spoken those words to Poe? Katza, I've never even had a conversation with him when you were not present. What about to anyone else? Have you spoken those words to anyone else? Of course not. If you think I waste my time— Are you certain? Yes, I'm certain. What does it matter? If he asked me, I would not be afraid to tell him what I think. She stared at Giddon, disbelieving, defenseless against the realization that trickled into her mind and clicked into place. She put her hand to her throat. She couldn't catch her breath. She asked the question she felt she had to ask and cringed against the answer she knew she would receive. Have you had those thoughts before? Had you thought those things while you were in his presence? That I don't trust him? That he's an opportunist and a thug? I think of it every time I look at him. Giddon was practically spitting, but Katza didn't see. She bent her knees and set her bow on the ground, slowly, deliberately. She stood and turned away from him. She walked one step at a time. She breathed in and breathed out and stared straight ahead. You're afraid I'll cause him offense, Giddon yelled after her. Your precious, leaned prince. And perhaps I will tell him my opinion. Perhaps he'll leave more quickly if I encourage him. She didn't listen, she didn't hear, for there was too much noise inside her head. He had known Giddon's thoughts, and he had known her own. She knew he had, when she'd been angry, when she thought highly of him. Other times, too. There must be other times, though her head screamed too much for her to think of them. She had thought him a fighter, just a fighter, and in her foolishness she had thought him perceptive, had even admired him for his perceptiveness. She admire a mind-reader. She had trusted him. She had trusted him and she should not have. He had misrepresented himself, misrepresented his grace. And that was the same as if he'd lied. Chapter 14 She burst into Raffin's workrooms, and he looked up from his work, startled. Where is he? She demanded, and then she stopped in her tracks, because he was there. Right there, sitting at the edge of Raffin's table, his jaw purple and his sleeves rolled up. There's something I must tell you, Katza. You're a mind reader. You're a mind reader and you lied to me. Raffin swore shortly and jumped up. He ran to the door behind her and pushed it closed. Poe's face flushed, but he held her gaze. I'm not a mind reader. And I'm not a fool. So stop lying to me. 
Tell me, what have you learned? What thoughts of mine have you stolen? I'm not a mind reader. I sense people. And what's that supposed to mean? It's people's thoughts that you sense. No, Katza, listen. I sense people. Think of it as my night vision, Katza, or the eyes in the back of my head you've accused me of having. I sense people when they're near me, thinking and feeling and moving around, their bodies, their physical energy. It is only... He swallowed. It is only when they're thinking about me that I also sense their thoughts. And that's not mind reading? She screamed it so loudly that he flinched, but still he held her gaze. All right. It does involve some mind reading, but I can't do what you think I can do. You lied to me. I trusted you. Raffin's soft voice broke through her distress. Let him explain, Katza. She turned to Raffin, incredulous, flabbergasted that he should know the truth and still take Poe's side. She whirled back on Poe, who still dared to hold her eyes, as if he'd done nothing wrong, nothing completely and absolutely wrong. Please, Katza, please hear me. I can't sit and listen in to whatever thoughts I want. I don't know what you think of Raffin, or what Raffin thinks of Ban, or whether Al enjoys his dinner. You can be behind the door running in circles and thinking about how much you hate Randa, and all I'll know is that you're running in circles. Until your thoughts turn to me, only then do I know what you're feeling. This was what it felt like to be betrayed by a friend. No, by a traitor pretending to be a friend. Such a wonderful friend he'd seemed. So sympathetic, so understanding. And no wonder, if he'd always known her thoughts, always known her feelings. The perfect pretense of friendship. No, no. I have lied, Katza, but my friendship has not been a pretense. I've always been your true friend. Even now he was reading her mind. Stop it! She spat out. Stop it! How dare you, you traitor! Imposter, you... She couldn't find words strong enough. But his eyes dropped from hers now, miserably, and she saw that he felt her full meaning. She was cruelly glad his grace communicated to him what she couldn't verbalize. He slumped against the table, his face contorted with unhappiness, his voice, when he spoke, toneless. Only two people have known this is my grace, my mother and my grandfather. And now Raffin and you. My father doesn't know, nor my brothers. My mother and my grandfather forbade me to tell anyone the moment I revealed it to them as a child. Well, she would take care of that problem. For Giddon was right, though he couldn't have realized why. Poe was not to be trusted. People must know. And she would tell everyone. If you do, you'll take away any freedom I have. You'll ruin my life. She looked at him then, but his image blurred behind tears that swelled into her eyes. She must leave. She must leave this room because she wanted to hit him, as she had sworn she never would do. She wanted to cause him pain for taking a place in her heart that she wouldn't have given him if she'd known the truth. You lied to me. She turned and ran from the room. Helda took her damp eyes and her silence in stride. I hope no one is ill, my lady. She sat beside Katz's bath and worked soap through the knots in Katz's hair. No one is ill. Then something has upset you. It'll be one of your young men. One of her young men. One of her friends. Her list of friends was dwindling from few to fewer. I've disobeyed the king. He'll be very angry with me. Yes, but that doesn't account for the pain in your eyes. That will be the doing of one of your young men. Katza said nothing. Everyone in this castle was a mind reader. Everyone could see through her, and she saw nothing. If the king is angry with you, and if you're having trouble with one of your young men... Then we'll make you especially beautiful for the evening. You'll wear your red dress. <laughs>
Katza almost laughed at that bit of Helda logic, but the laugh got caught in her throat. She would leave the court after this night, for she didn't want to be here any longer, with her uncle's fury, Giddens' sarcastic hurt pride, and most of all, Poe's betrayal. Later, when Katza was dressed and Helda grappled with her wet hair before the fire, there was a knock at her entrance. Katza's heart flew into her throat, for it would be a steward, summoning her to her uncle. Or even worse, Poe, come to read her mind and hurt her again with his explanations and his excuses. But when Helda went to the door, she came back with Raffin. He's not the one I expected. She folded her hands across her stomach and clucked. Katza pressed her fingers to her temples. I must speak to him alone, Helda. Helda left. Raffin sat on her bed and curled his legs up, as he had done when he was a child, as they both had done so many times, sitting together on her bed, talking and laughing. He didn't laugh now, and he didn't talk. He only sat, all arms and legs, and looked at her in her chair by the fire, his face kind and dear and open with worry. That dress suits you, Cat. Your eyes are very bright. Helda imagines that a dress will solve all my problems. Your problems have multiplied since you last left the court. I spoke to Giddon. Giddon. His very name made her tired. Yes, he told me what happened with Lord Ellis. Honestly, Katza, it's quite serious, isn't it? What will you do? I don't know. I haven't decided. Honestly, Katza. Why do you keep saying that? I suppose you think I should have tortured the fellow for doing no wrong? Of course not. You did right. Of course you did right. And the king won't control me anymore. I won't be his animal anymore. Cat. He shifted and sighed. He looked at her closely. I can see you've made up your mind. And you know I'll do anything in my power to stop his hand. I'm on your side in anything to do with Randa, always. It's just... it's just that... She knew. It was just that Randa paid little heed to his son, the medicine maker. There was very little in Raffin's power to do while his father lived. I'm worried for you, Cat. That's all. We all are. Giddon was quite desperate. Giddon. She sighed. Giddon proposed marriage to me. Great hills! Before or after you saw Ellis? After. She gestured impatiently. Giddon thinks marriage is the solution to all my problems. Hmm. Well, how did it go? How did it go? She felt like laughing, though there was no humor in it. It began badly and progressed to worse, and ended with my coming to the realization that Poe is a mind reader and a liar. Raffin considered her for a moment. He started to speak, then stopped. His eyes were very gentle. Dear Katza, he finally said, You've had a rough few days, what with Randa and Giddon and Poe. And Poe the roughest, though all the danger might lie with Randa. Poe the wound she would remove, if she could choose one to remove. Randa could never hurt her as Poe had. They sat quietly. The fire crackled beside her. The fire was a luxury. There was barely a chill to the air. But Helda had wanted her hair to dry more quickly, so they'd set the great logs burning. Her hair fell now in curls around her shoulders. She pushed it behind her ears and tied it into a knot. His grace has been a secret since he was a child, Cat. Here they came, then. The explanations and the rationalizations... She looked away from him and braced herself. His mother knew he'd only be used as a tool if the truth came out. Imagine the uses of a child who can sense reactions to the things he says or who knows what someone's doing on the other side of a wall. Imagine his uses when his father is the king. His mother knew he wouldn't be able to relate with people or form relationships because no one would trust him. No one would want anything to do with him. Think about it, Katza. Think about what that would be like. 
She looked up at him then, her eyes on fire, and his face softened. What a thing for me to say. Of course, you don't need to imagine it. No, for it was her reality. She hadn't had the luxury of hiding her grace. We can't blame him for not telling us sooner. To be honest, I'm touched that he told us at all. He told me just after you left. He has some ideas about the kidnapping, Cat. Yes, as he must have ideas about a great many things he was in no position to know anything about. A mind reader could never be short on ideas. What are his ideas? Why don't you let him tell you about it? I don't crave the company of a mind reader. He's leaving tomorrow, Cat. She stared at him. What do you mean he's leaving? He's leaving the court. For good. He's going to Sunder and then Monsey, possibly. He hasn't worked out the details. Her eyes swam with tears. She seemed unable to control this strange water that flowed into her eyes. She stared at her hands, and one tear plopped into her palm. I think I'll send him to tell you about it. He climbed from the bed and came to her. He bent down and kissed her forehead. Dear Katza, he said, and then he left the room. She stared at the checked pattern of her marble floor and wondered how she could feel so desolate that her eyes filled with tears. She couldn't remember crying, not once in her life, not until this fool Lenid had come to her court and lied to her and then announced that he was leaving. He hovered just inside the doorway. He seemed unsure whether to come closer or keep his distance. She didn't know what she wanted either. She only knew she wanted to remain calm and not look at him and not think any thoughts for him to steal. She stood, crossed into her dining room, went to the window and looked out. The courtyard was empty and yellow in the light of the lowering sun. She felt him moving into the entrance behind her. Forgive me, Katza. I beg you to forgive me. Well, and that was easily answered. She did not forgive him. The trees in Randa's garden were still green, and some of the flowers still in bloom. But soon the leaves would turn and fall. The gardeners would come with their great rakes and scrape the leaves from the marble floor and carry them away in wheelbarrows. She didn't know where they carried them. To the vegetable gardens, she guessed, or to the fields. They were industrious, the gardeners. She did not forgive him. She heard him move a step closer. How, how did you know, if you would tell me? She rested her forehead on the glass pane. And why don't you use your grace to find the answer to that? He paused. I could, possibly if you were thinking about it specifically, but you're not, and I can't wander around inside you and retrieve any information I want any more than I can stop my grace from showing me things I don't want. She didn't answer. Katza, all I know right now is that you're angry, furious from the top of your head to your toes, and that I've hurt you, and that you don't forgive me, or trust me. That's all I know at this moment, and my grace only confirms what I see with my own eyes. She sighed sharply and spoke into the window pane. Giddon told me he didn't trust you. And when he told me, he used the same words you'd used before. The same words exactly. And... She waved her hand in the air. There were other hints. But Giddon's words made it clear. He was closer now, leaning against the table, most likely, with his hands in his pockets and his eyes on her back. She focused on the view outside. Two ladies crossed the courtyard below her on each other's arms. The curls of their hair sat gathered at the tops of their heads and bobbed up and down. I haven't been very careful with you. Careful to hide it. I'd go so far as to say I've been careless at times. He paused, and his voice was quiet, as if he was talking down to his boots. It's because I've wanted you to know. And that did not absolve him. He had taken her thoughts without telling her, and he had wanted to tell her, and that did not begin to absolve him. I couldn't tell you, Katza. 
Not possibly, he said, and she swung around to face him. Stop it! Stop that! Stop responding to my thoughts! I won't hide it from you, Katza. I won't hide it anymore! He wasn't leaning against the table, hands in pockets. He was standing, clutching his hair. His face... She would not look at his face. She turned away, turned back to the window. I'm not going to hide it from you anymore, Katza. Please, let me explain it. It's not as bad as you think. It's easy for you to say. You're not the one whose thoughts are not your own. Almost all of your thoughts are your own. My grace only shows me how you stand in relation to me. Where you are nearby physically, and what you're doing, and any thoughts or feelings or instincts you have regarding me. I... I suppose it's meant to be a kind of self-preservation, he finished lamely. Anyway, it's why I can fight you. I sense the movement of your body without seeing it. And more to the point, I feel the energy of your intentions toward me. I know every move you intend to make against me before you make it. She almost couldn't breathe at that extraordinary statement. She wondered vaguely if this was how it felt to her victims, to be kicked in the chest. I know when someone wants to hurt me, and how. I know if a person looks on me kindly, or if he trusts me. I know if a person doesn't like me. I know when someone intends to deceive me. As you've deceived me about being a mind reader. He continued doggedly. Yes, that's true. But all you've told me about your struggles with Randa, Katza, I needed to hear from your mouth. All you've told me about Raffin or Gidden. When I met you in Mergen's courtyard, do you remember? When I met you, I didn't know why you were there. I couldn't look into your mind and know you were in the process of rescuing my grandfather from Mergen's dungeons. I wasn't even sure my grandfather was in the dungeons, for I hadn't gotten close enough to him to sense his physical presence yet. Nor had I spoken with Mergen. I'd learned nothing yet from Mergen's lies. I didn't know you'd attacked every guard in the castle. All I knew for sure was that you didn't know who I was, and you didn't know whether to trust me, but you didn't want to kill me because I was Lenid, and possibly because of something to do with some other Lenid, though I couldn't be certain who or how he factored into it. And also that you, I don't know how to explain it, but you felt trustworthy to me. That's all. That's all I knew. It was on the basis of that information that I decided to trust you. It must be convenient to know if another person is trustworthy. We wouldn't be here now if I had that capability. I'm sorry. I can't tell you how sorry. I've hated not telling you. It's rankled me every day since we became friends. We are not friends. She whispered it into the glass of the window. If you're not my friend, then I have no friends. Friends don't lie. Friends. Try to understand. How could I have become your friend without lying? How much have I risked to tell you and Raffin the truth? What would you have done differently, Katza, if this were your grace and your secret? Hidden yourself in a hole and dared to burden no one with your grievous friendship? I will have friends, Katza. I will have a life, even though I carry this burden. He stopped for a moment, his voice rough and choked and Katza fought against his distress, fought to keep it from touching her. She found that she was gripping the window frame very hard. You would have me friendless, Katza, he finished quietly. You would have my grace control every aspect of my life and shut me off from every happiness. She didn't want to hear these words, words that called to her sympathy, to her understanding. She who had hurt so many with her own grace and been reviled because of it. She who still struggled to keep her grace from mastering her, and who, like him, had never asked for the power it gave her. Yes, I didn't ask for this. I would turn it off for you if I could. Rage, then. Rage again, because she couldn't even feel sympathy without him knowing it. This was madness. She could not comprehend the madness of this situation. How did his mother relate to him, or his grandfather? How could anyone? She took a breath and tried to consider it piece by piece. You're fighting, she said, her eyes on the darkening courtyard. You expect me to believe your fighting isn't graced? I'm an exceptional natural fighter. All of my brothers are. The royal family is well known in Lenid for hand fighting, 
But my grace, it's an enormous advantage in a fight to anticipate every move your opponent makes against you. Combined with that, my immediate sense of your body, a sense that goes beyond sight, you can understand why no one has ever beaten me, save you. She thought about that and found she couldn't believe it. But you're too good. You must have a fighting grace as well. You couldn't fight me so well if you didn't. Katza, think about it. You're five times the fighter I am. When we fight, you're holding back. Don't tell me you aren't, because I know you are. And I'm not holding back. Not a bit. And you can do anything you want to me, and I can't hurt you. It hurts when you strike me. It hurts you for only an instant. And besides, if I hit you, it's only because you've let me, because you're too busy wrenching my arm out of its socket to care that I'm hitting you in the stomach. How long do you think it would take you to kill me, or break my bones, if you decided to? If she truly decided to? He was right. If her purpose were to hurt him, to break his arm or his neck, she didn't think it would take her very long. When we fight, you go to great pains to win without hurting me. That you usually can is a mark of your phenomenal skill. I've never hurt you once, and believe me, I've tried. It's a front. The fighting is only a front. Yes. My mother seized on it the instant it became clear that I shared the skill of my brothers, and that my grace magnified that skill. Why didn't you know I would strike you in Mergen's courtyard? I did know, but only in the last instant, and I didn't react quickly enough. Until that first strike, I didn't realize your speed. I'd never encountered the like of it before. The mortar was cracking in the frame of the window. She pulled out a small chunk and rolled it between her fingers. Does your grace make mistakes, or are you always right? He breathed. It almost sounded like a laugh. It's not always exact, and it's always changing. I'm still growing into it. My sense of the physical is pretty reliable, as long as I'm not in an enormous crowd. I know where people are and what they're doing, but what they feel toward me. There's never been a time when I thought someone was lying and they weren't or a time when I thought someone intended to hit me and they didn't. But there are times when I'm not sure, when I have a sense of something, but I'm not sure. Other people's feelings can be very complicated and difficult to understand. She hadn't thought of that, that a person might be difficult to understand, even to a mind reader. I'm more sure of things now than I used to be. When I was a child, I was rarely sure. These enormous waves of energy and feeling and thought were always crashing into me, and most of the time I was drowning in them. For one thing, it's taken me a long time to learn to distinguish between thoughts that matter and thoughts that don't. Thoughts that are just thoughts, fleeting, and thoughts that carry some kind of relevant intent. I've gotten much better at that, but my grace still gives me things I've no idea what to do with. It sounded ridiculous to her, thoroughly ridiculous and she had thought her own grace overwhelming. Alongside his, it seemed quite straightforward. It's hard to get a handle on it sometimes, my grace. She turned sideways for a moment. Did you say that because I thought it? No, I said it because I thought it. She turned back to the window. I thought it too, or something like it. Well, I imagine it's a feeling you would understand. She sighed again. There were things about this she could understand, though she didn't want to. How close do you have to be to someone, physically, for your grace to sense them? It differs, and it's changed over time. What do you mean? If it's someone I know well, my range is broad. For strangers, I need to be closer. I knew when you neared the castle today. I knew when you burst into the courtyard and leaped out of your saddle. And I felt your anger strong and clear as you flew up to Raffin's rooms. My range for you is broader than most. It was darker outside now than it was in her dining room. She saw him suddenly in the reflection of the window. He was leaning back against the table, as she had pictured him before. His face, his shoulders, his arms sagged. Everything about him sagged. He was unhappy. He was looking down at his feet, but as she watched him he raised his eyes and met hers in the glass. She felt the tears again, suddenly, and she grasped at something to say.
Do you sense the presence of animals and plants, rocks and dirt? I'm leaving tomorrow. Do you know when an animal is near? Will you turn around so I can see you while we speak? Can you read my mind more easily when I'm facing you? No, I just like to see you, Katza. That's all. His voice was soft and sorry. He was sorry about all of this, sorry for his grace. His grace that was not his fault and that would have driven her away had he told her of it at the beginning. She turned to face him. I didn't used to sense animals and plants or landscapes, but lately that's been changing. Sometimes I'll get a fuzzy sense of something that isn't human. If something moves, I might sense it. It's erratic. Katza watched his face. I'm going to sunder. Katza folded her arms across her stomach and said nothing. When Mergen questioned me after your rescue, it became obvious to me the object you'd taken was my grandfather. It became just as obvious Mergen had been keeping him for someone else. But I couldn't tell who, not without asking questions that would have given away what I knew. She listened vaguely. She was tired, overwhelmed by too many things in the present to focus on the details of the kidnapping. I'm beginning to think it's something to do with Monsi. We've ruled out the Midlands, Wester, Nander, Estel, Sunder, and you'll remember, I've been to most of those courts. I know I was not lied to, except in Sunder. Lenid is not responsible, I'm sure of it. She'd lost her fury somewhere as they'd talked. She didn't feel it any more. She wished she did, because she preferred it to the emptiness that had settled in its place. She was sorry for everything that had changed now with Poe. Sorry to see it all go. Katza, I need you to listen to me. She blinked and worked her mind back to the words he had spoken. But King Lek of Monsi is a kind man. He would have no reason. He might, though I don't know what it is. Something isn't right, Katza. Some impressions I got from Mergen that I dismissed at the time. Perhaps I dismissed them in error. And my father's sister, Queen Ashen, she wouldn't behave as you told me. She's so stoical. She is strong. She wouldn't have hysterics and lock herself and her child away from her husband. I swear to you, if you knew her... He stopped, his brow furrowed. He kicked the floor. I've a feeling Monsi has something to do with it. I don't know if it's my grace or just instinct. Anyway, I'm going back to Sunder to see what I can learn of it. Grandfather's doing better, but for his own sake, I want him to stay hidden until I get to the bottom of this. That was it, then. He was going to Sunder to get to the bottom of it. And it was good that he was going, for she didn't want him in her head. But neither did she want him to go, and he must know that since she had thought it. And now, did he know that she knew that he knew since she had thought that, too? This was absurd. It was impossible. Being with him was impossible. But still she didn't want him to go. I hoped you would come with me, he said, and she stared at him open-mouthed. We'd make a good team. I don't even know where I'm going for sure, but I hoped you would consider coming, if you're still my friend. She couldn't think what to say. Doesn't your grace tell you if I'm your friend? Do you know yourself? She tried to think, but there was nothing in her mind. She knew only that she was numb and sad and completely without any clarity of feeling. I can't know your feelings if you don't know them yourself. He looked to the door suddenly, and then there was a knock, and a steward burst in without waiting for Katz's response. At the sight of his pale, tight face, it all came flooding back to her. Randa. Randa wanted to see her, most likely wanted to kill her. Before this confusion with Poe, she had disobeyed Randa. The king orders you to come before him at once, my lady, the steward said. Forgive me, my lady. He says that if you don't, he'll send his entire guard to fetch you. Very well. Tell him I'll go to him immediately. Thank you, my lady. The steward turned and scampered away. Katza scowled after him. His entire guard. What does he think they could do to me? I should have told the steward to send them, just for the amusement of it. She looked around the room. I wonder if I should take a knife. 
Poe watched her with narrowed eyes. What have you done? What's this about? I've disobeyed him. He sent me to torture some poor, innocent lord, and I decided I wouldn't. Do you think I should take a knife? She walked across to her weapons room. He followed her. To do what? What do you think will happen at this meeting? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, Poe, if he angers me, I fear I'll want to kill him. And what if he threatens me and gives me no choice? She threw herself into a chair and dropped her head down on the council table. How could she go to Randa now, of all times, when there was a whirlwind in her head? She would lose herself at the sound of his voice. She would do something dreadful. Poe slid into the chair next to her and sat sideways, facing her. Katza, listen to me. You're the most powerful person I've ever met. You can do whatever you want, whatever you want in the world. No one can make you do anything, and your uncle can't touch you. The instant you walk into his presence, you have all the power. If you wish not to hurt him, Katza, then you have only to choose not to. But what will I do? You'll figure it out. You only have to go in knowing what you won't do. You won't hurt him. You won't let him hurt you. You'll figure the rest out as you go along. She sighed into the table. She didn't think much of his plan. It's the only possible plan, Katza. You have the power to do whatever you want. She sat up and turned to him. You keep saying that, but it's not true. I don't have the power to stop you from sensing my thoughts. He raised his eyebrows. You could kill me. I couldn't, for you would know I meant to kill you, and you'd escape me. You'd stay far away from me always. Ah, uh, but I wouldn't. You would, if I wished to kill you. I wouldn't. On that senseless note, she threw her arms into the air. Enough! Enough of this! She stood up from the table and marched out of her apartments to answer the king's call. Chapter 15 Her first thought when she entered the throne room was to wish she'd brought a knife after all. Her second thought was to wish that Poe's sense of bodies had extended to this room, so that he might have warned her of what was waiting for her here, and she might have known not to come. A long blue carpet led from the doors to Randa's throne. The throne was raised high on a platform of white marble. Randa sat high on his throne, blue robes and bright blue eyes, his face hard, his smile frozen. An archer to either side of him, an arrow notched in each bow, and trained, as she entered the room, on her forehead, on the place just above her blue and green eyes. Two more archers, one in each far corner, also with arrows notched. The king's guard lined the carpet on either side, three men deep, swords drawn and held at their sides. Randa usually kept a tenth this many guards in his throne room. Impressive. It was an impressive battalion Randa had arranged in preparation for her appearance. But as Katza took stock of the room, it occurred to her that Burn or Drowden or Thigpen would have done better. It was good he was an unwarring king, for Randa was not so clever when it came to assembling battalions. This one he'd assembled all wrong. Too few archers, and too many of these clumsy, armored, lumbering men who would trip all over each other if they tried to attack her. Tall, broad men who could shield her easily from an arrow's flight. And armed, all of them armed with swords, and each with a dagger in his opposite belt. Swords and daggers she might as well be carrying on her own person, so easily could she snatch them from their owners. And the king himself raised high on a platform, a long blue carpet leading straight to him, like a pathway to direct the flight of her blade. If a fight erupted in this room, it would be a massacre. Katza stepped forward, her eyes and ears finely tuned to the archers. 
Randa's archers were good, but they were not graced. Katza spared a moment to dryly pity the guards at her back, if this encounter came down to arrow dodging. And then, when she'd progressed about halfway to the throne, her uncle called out, Stop there! I've no wish for your closer company, Katza. Her name sounded like steam hissing down the carpet when Randa spoke it. You return to court today with no woman, no dowry, my underlord and my captain injured by your hand. What do you have to say for yourself? When a battalion of soldiers didn't trouble her, why should one voice rile her so? She forced herself to hold his contemptuous eyes. I didn't agree with your order, Lord King. Can I possibly have heard you correctly? You didn't agree with my order? No, Lord King. Randa sat back, his smile twisted tighter now. Charming. Charming, truly. Tell me, Katza, what precisely possessed you with the notion that you are in a position to consider the king's orders, to think about them, to form opinions regarding them? Have I ever asked you to share your thoughts on anything? No, Lord King. Have I ever encouraged you to bestow upon us your sage advice? No, Lord King. Do you imagine it is your wit, your stunning intellect, that warrants your position in this court? And here was where Randa was clever. This was how he'd kept her a caged animal for so long. He knew the words to make her feel stupid and brutish and turn her into a dog. Well, and if she must be a dog, at least she would no longer be in this man's cage. She would be her own. She would possess her own viciousness, and she would do what she liked with it. Even now, she felt her arms and legs beginning to thrill with readiness. She narrowed her eyes at the king. She could not keep the challenge out of her voice. And what exactly is the purpose of all these men, uncle? Randa smiled blandly. These men will attack if you make the slightest move, and at the end of this interview they'll accompany you to my dungeons. And do you imagine I'll go willingly to your dungeons? I don't care if you go willingly or not. That's because you think these men could force me to go against my will. Katza, of course, we all have the highest regard for your skill. But even you have no chance against two hundred guards and my best archers. The end of this conversation will see you either in my dungeons or dead. Katza saw and heard everything in the room. The king and his archers, the arrows notched and aimed, the guards ready with their swords, her arms in red sleeves, her feet beneath red skirts. The room was still completely still, accepting the breath of the men around her and the tingling she felt inside her. She held her hands at her sides, away from her body, so that everyone could see them. She breathed around a thing that she recognized now as hatred. She hated this king. Her body was alive with it. Uncle, let me explain what will happen the instant one of your men makes a move toward me. Let's say, for instance, one of your archers lets an arrow fly. You've not come to many of my practices, Uncle. You haven't seen me dodge arrows. But your archers have. If one of your archers releases an arrow, I'll drop to the floor. The arrow will doubtless hit one of your guards. The sword and the dagger of that guard will be in my hands before anyone in the room has time to realize what's happened. A fight will break out with the guards, but only seven or eight of them can surround me at once, uncle, and seven or eight are nothing to me. As I kill the guards, I'll take their daggers and begin throwing them into the hearts of your archers. 
who of course will have no sighting on me once the brawl with the guards has broken out. I'll get out of the room alive, uncle, but most of the rest of you will be dead. Of course, this is only what will happen if I wait for one of your men to make a move. I could move first. I could attack a guard, steal his dagger, and hurl it into your chest this instant. Randa's mouth was fixed into a sneer, but under this he had begun to tremble. A threat of death, given and received, and Katza felt it ringing in her fingertips. And she saw that she could do it now. She could kill him right now. The disdain in his eyes would disappear, and his sneer would slide away. Her fingers itched, for she could do it now with the snatch of a dagger. And then what? A small voice inside herself whispered, and Katza caught her breath, stricken. And then what? A bloodbath, one she'd be lucky to escape. Raffin would become king, and his first inheritance would be the task of killing the murderer of his father, a charge he couldn't avoid if he meant to rule justly as the king of the Midlands, and a charge that would break his heart and make her an enemy and a stranger. And Poe would hear of it as he was leaving. He'd hear that she'd lost control and killed her uncle that she'd caused her own exile and broken Raffin's spirit. He would return to Lenid and watch from his balcony as the sun dropped behind the sea. And he'd shake his head in the orange light and wonder why she'd allowed this to happen when she held so much power in her hands. Where is your faith in your power? The voice whispered now. You don't have to shed blood. And Katza saw what she was doing here in this throne room. She saw Randa, pale, gripping the arms of his throne so hard it seemed he might break them. In a moment he would motion to his archers to strike out of fear, out of the terror of waiting for her to make the first move. Tears came to her eyes. Mercy was more frightening than murder because it was harder, and Randa didn't deserve it. And even though she wanted what the voice wanted, she didn't think she had the courage for it. Poe thinks you have the courage, the voice said fiercely. Pretend that you believe he's right. Believe him for just a moment. Pretend. Her fingers were screaming, but maybe she could pretend long enough to get out of this room. Katza raised burning eyes to the king. Her voice shook. I'm leaving the court. Don't try to stop me. I promise you'll regret it if you do. Forget about me once I'm gone, for I won't consent to live like a tracked animal. I'm no longer yours to command. His eyes were wide and his mouth open. She turned and rushed down the long carpet, her ears tuned to the silence, readying her to spin around at the first hint of a bowstring or a sword. As she passed through her uncle's great doors, she felt the weight of hundreds of astonished eyes on her back, and none of them knew she had been only a breath, a twitch, away from changing her mind. Part 2 The Twisted King Chapter 16 They left well before daylight. Raffin and Ban saw them off, the two medicine makers bleary-eyed, Ban yawning endlessly. The morning was cold, and Katza was wide awake and quiet for she was shy of her riding partner, and she felt strange about Raffin, so strange that she wished he wasn't there. If Raffin hadn't been there watching her go, then perhaps she'd have been able to pretend she wasn't leaving him. With Raffin there, there was no pretense, 
and she was unable to do anything about the strange, painful water that rose into her eyes and throat every time she looked at him. They were impossible, these two men, for if one did not make her cry, the other did. What Helda would make of it she could only imagine, and she hadn't liked saying goodbye to Helda either, or Al. No, there was little to be happy of this morning, except that she was not, at least, leaving Poe. And he was probably standing there beside his horse, registering her every feeling on the matter. She gave him a withering look for good measure, and he raised his eyebrows and smiled and yawned. Well, and he'd better not ride as if he were half asleep, or she'd leave him in the dust. She was not in the mood to dawdle. Raffin fussed back and forth between their horses, checking saddles, testing the holes of their stirrups. I suppose I needn't worry about your safety, with the two of you riding together. We'll be safe. Katza yanked at a strap that held a bag to her saddle. She tossed a bag over her horse's back to Poe. You have the list of council contacts in Sunder? And the maps? You have food for the day? You have money? Katza smiled up at him then, for he sounded as she imagined a mother would sound if her child were leaving forever. Poe's a prince of Leonid. Why do you think he rides such a big horse if not to carry his bags of gold? Raffin's eyes laughed down at her. Take this. He closed her hands over a small satchel. It's a bag of medicines, in case you should need them. I've marked them so you'll know what each is for. Poe came forward then and held his hand out to Ban. Thank you for all you've done. He took Raffin's hand. You'll take care of my grandfather in my absence? He'll be safe with us. Poe swung onto the back of his horse and Katza took Ban's hands and squeezed them, and then she stood before Raffin and looked up into his face. Well, you'll let us know how you're faring, when you're able? Of course. He looked at his feet and cleared his throat. He rubbed his neck and sighed. How she wished again that he weren't here, for the tears would spill onto her cheeks and she couldn't stop them. Well... And I'll see you again some day, my love. She reached up for him then and wrapped her arms around his neck, and he lifted her up off the ground and hugged her tight. She breathed into the collar of his shirt and held on. And then her feet were on the ground again. She turned away and climbed into her saddle. We leave now, she said to Poe. As their horses cantered out of the stable yard, she didn't look back. Their route was rough and changeable, for their only certain plan was to follow whatever path seemed likely to bring them closer to the truth of the kidnapping. Their first destination was an inn, south of Mergen City, three days' ride from Randa City, an inn sitting along the route which they supposed the kidnappers had taken. Mergen's spies frequented the inn, as did merchants and travelers from the port cities of Sunder, often even from Monsi. It was as good a place to start as any, Poe thought, and it didn't take them out of their way if their ultimate destination was Monsi. They didn't travel anonymously. Katz's eyes identified her to anyone in the Seven Kingdoms who had ears to hear the stories. Poe was conspicuously a Leonid, and enough the subject of idle talk to be recognized by virtue of his own eyes and by the Graceling company he kept. The story of Katza's hasty departure from Randa's court with the Leonid prince would spread. Any attempt to disguise themselves would be foolish. Katza didn't even bother to change from the blue tunic and trousers that marked her as a member of Randa's family. Their purpose would be assumed, for it was well enough agreed that the Graceling Leonid searched for his missing grandfather, and it would now be supposed that the Graceling lady assisted him. Their inquiries, the route they chose, the very dinners they ate would be the stuff of gossip. But still, they would be safe in their deception, for no one would know that Katza and Poe searched not for the grandfather, but for the motive of his kidnapping. No one would know that Katza and Poe knew of Mergen's involvement and suspected Lek of Monsey. <laughs>
and no one could even guess how much Poe could learn by asking the most mundane questions. He rode well, and almost as fast as she would have liked. The trees of the southern forest flew past. The pounding of hooves comforted her and numbed her sense of the distance stretching between her and the people she'd left behind. She was glad of Poe's company. Their riding was companionable. But then, when they stopped to stretch their legs and eat something, she was shy of him again and didn't know how to be with him or what to say. Sit with me, Katza. He sat on the trunk of a great fallen tree, and she glared at him from around her horse. Katza, dear Katza, I won't bite. I'm not sensing your thoughts right now except to know that I make you uncomfortable. Come and talk to me. And so she came and sat beside him, but she didn't talk, and she didn't exactly look at him either, for she was afraid of becoming trapped in his eyes. Katza, he said finally, when they had sat and chewed in silence for a number of minutes, you'll get used to me in time. We'll find the way to relate to each other. How can I help you with this? Should I tell you whenever I sense something with my grace, so you can come to understand it? It didn't sound very appealing to her. She'd prefer to pretend that he sensed nothing. But he was right. They were together now, and the sooner she faced this, the better. Yes. Very well, then, I will. Do you have any questions for me? You have only to ask. I think if you always know what I feel about you, then you should always tell me what you're feeling about me, as you feel it. Always. Hmm. He glanced at her sideways. I'm not wild about that idea. Nor am I wild about you knowing my feelings, but I have no choice. Hmm. He rubbed his head. I suppose, in theory, it'd be fair. It would. Very well. Let's see. I'm very sympathetic about your having left Raffin. I think you're brave to have defied Randa as you did with that Ellis fellow. I don't know if I could have gone through with it. I think you have more energy than anyone I've ever encountered, though I wonder if you aren't a bit hard on your horse. I find myself wondering why you haven't wanted to marry Giddon, and if it's because you've intended to marry Raffin, and if so, whether you're even more unhappy to have left him than I realized. I'm very pleased you've come with me. I'd like to see you defend yourself for real, Fight someone to the death, for it would be a thrilling sight. I think my mother would take to you. My brothers, of course, would worship you. I think you're the most quarrelsome person I've ever met, and I really do worry about your horse. He stopped then, broke a piece of bread, and chewed and swallowed. She stared at him, her eyes wide. That's all for now. You can't possibly have been thinking all those things. In that moment, she said, and then he laughed, and the sound was a comfort to her, and she fought against the gold and silver lights that shone in his eyes and lost. When he spoke, his voice was soft. And now I'm wondering how it is you don't realize your eyes ensnare me, just as mine do you. I can't explain it, Katza, but you shouldn't let it embarrass you for we're both overtaken by the same foolishness. A flush rose into her neck, and she was doubly embarrassed by his eyes and by his words. But there was relief for her, too, because if he was also foolish, then her foolishness bothered her less. I thought you might be doing it on purpose, with your eyes. I thought it might be a part of your grace to trap me with your eyes and read my mind. It's not. It's nothing like that. Most people won't look into my eyes. Most people fear them. Yes. Most people don't look into my eyes for very long either. They're too strange. She looked at his eyes then, leaned in and really studied them, as she hadn't had the courage to do before. Your eyes are like lights. They don't seem quite natural. He grinned. My mother says when I opened my eyes on the day they settled, she almost dropped me, she was so startled. What color were they before? Gray, like most Leonid. And yours? I've no idea. No one's ever told me. 
and I don't think there's anyone left I could ask. Your eyes are beautiful, he said, and she felt warm suddenly, warm in the sun that dappled through the treetops and rested on them in patches, and as they climbed back into their saddles and returned to the forest road, she didn't feel exactly comfortable with him, but she felt at least that she could look him in the face now and not fear she was surrendering her entire soul. The road led them around the outskirts of Mergen City and became wider and more traveled. Whenever Katza and Poe were seen, they were stared at. It would soon be known in the inns and houses around the city that the two Graceling fighters traveled south together along Mergen Road. Are you sure you don't want to stop in on King Mergen and ask him your questions? It would be much faster, wouldn't it? He made it quite clear after the robbery that I was no longer welcome at his court. He suspects I know what was stolen. He's afraid of you. Yes, and he's the type to do something foolish. If we arrived at his court, he'd probably mount an offensive, and we'd have to start hurting people. I'd prefer to avoid that, wouldn't you? If there's going to be an enormous mess, let it be at the court of the guilty king, not the king who's merely complicitous. We'll go to the inn. Yes, we'll go to the inn. The forest road narrowed again and grew quieter once they left Mergen City behind. They stopped before night fell. They set up camp some distance from the road, in a small clearing with a mossy floor, a cover of thick branches, and a trickle of water that seemed to please the horses. This is all a man needs. I could live here quite contented. What do you think, Katza? Are you hungry for meat? I'll catch us something. Even better. But it'll be dark in a few minutes. I wouldn't want you to get lost, even in the pitch dark. Katza smiled then and stepped across the stream. It'll only take me a few minutes. And I never get lost, even in the pitch dark. You won't even take your bow? Are you planning to throttle a moose with your bare hands, then? I've a knife in my boot, she said, and then wondered for a moment if she could throttle a moose with her bare hands. It seemed possible. But right now she only sought a rabbit or a bird, and her knife would serve as weapon. She slipped between the gnarled trees and into the damp silence of the forest. It was simply a matter of listening, remaining quiet, and making herself invisible. When she came back minutes later with a great, fat, skinned rabbit, Poe had built a fire. The flames cast orange light on the horses and on himself. It was the least I could do, and I see you've already skinned that hair. I am beginning to think I won't have much responsibility as we travel through the forest together. Does it bother you? You're welcome to do the hunting yourself. Perhaps I can stay by the fire and mend your socks, and scream if I hear any strange noises. He smiled then. Do you treat Giddon like this when the two of you travel? I imagine he finds it quite humiliating. Poor Poe. You may content yourself with reading my mind, if you wish to feel superior. He laughed. I know you're teasing me, and you should know I'm not easily humiliated. You may hunt for my food and pound me every time we fight, and protect me when we're attacked if you like. I'll thank you for it. But I'd never need to protect you if we were attacked, and I doubt you need me to do your hunting either. True. But you're better than I am, Katza, and it doesn't humiliate me. He fed a branch to the fire. It humbles me, but it doesn't humiliate me. She sat quietly as night closed in and watched the blood drip from the hunk of meat she held on a stick over the fire. She listened to it sizzle as it hit the flames. She tried to separate in her mind the idea of being humbled from the idea of being humiliated, and she understood what Poe meant. She wouldn't have thought to make the distinction. He was so clear with his thoughts, while hers were a constant storm that she could never make sense of and never control. She felt suddenly and sharply that Poe was smarter than she, world smarter, and that she was a brute in comparison, an unthinking and unfeeling brute. Katza? She looked up. The flames danced in the silver and gold of his eyes and caught the hoops in his ears. His face was all light. Tell me, whose idea was the council? It was mine. And who has decided what missions the council carries out? I have, ultimately. 
Who has planned each mission? I have, with Raffin and all and the others. He watched his meat cooking over the fire. He turned it and shook it absently, so the juice fell spitting into the flames. He raised his eyes to her again. I don't see how you can compare us and find yourself lacking in intelligence or unthinking or unfeeling. I've had to spend my entire life hammering out the emotions of others and myself in my mind. If my mind is clearer sometimes than yours, it's because I've had more practice. That's the only difference between us. He focused on his meat again. She watched him, listening. I wish you would remember the council. I wish you would remember that when we met, you were rescuing my grandfather for no other reason than that you didn't believe he deserved to be kidnapped. He leaned into the fire then and added another branch to the flames. They sat quietly, huddled in the light, surrounded by darkness. Chapter 17 In the morning, she woke before he did. She followed the dribble of water downstream until she found a place where it formed something larger than a puddle but smaller than a pool. There she bathed as well as she could. She shivered, but she didn't mind the coldness of air and water. It woke her completely. When she tried to untie her hair and untangle it, she met with the usual frustration. She yanked and tugged, but her fingers could not find a way through the knots. She tied it back up. She dried herself as best she could and dressed. When she walked back into the clearing, he was awake, tying his bags together. Would you cut my hair off if I asked you? He looked up, eyebrows raised. You're not thinking of trying to disguise yourself. No, it's not that. It's just that it drives me mad, and I've never wanted it. And I'd be so much more comfortable if I could have it all off. Hmm. He examined the great knot gathered at the nape of her neck. It is rather wound together, like a bird's nest, he said, and at her glare he laughed. If you truly wanted me to, I could cut it off, but I don't imagine you'd be particularly pleased with the result. Why don't you wait until we've reached the inn and have the innkeeper's wife do it, or one of the women in town? Katza sighed. Very well. I can live with it for one more day. Poe disappeared down the path from which she'd come. She rolled up her blanket and began to carry their belongings to the horses. The road grew narrower as they continued south, and the forest grew thicker and darker. Poe led, despite Katz's protests. He insisted that when she set the pace, they always started out reasonably, but without fail, before long they were racing along at breakneck speed. He was taking it upon himself to protect Katz's horse from its rider. You say you're thinking of the horse, Katz said, when they stopped once to water the horses at a stream that crossed the road. But I think it's just that you can't keep up with me. He laughed at that. You're trying to bait me, and it won't work. By the way... It occurs to me that we haven't practiced our fighting since I uncovered your deception and you agreed to stop lying to me. No, nor since you punched me in the jaw because you were angry with Randa. She couldn't hold back her smile. Fine. You'll lead. But what about our practices? Don't you want to continue them? Of course. Tonight, perhaps, if it's still light when we stop. They rode quietly. Katz's mind wandered and she found that when it wandered to anything to do with Poe, she would check herself and proceed carefully. If she must think of him, then it would be nothing significant. He would gain nothing from his intrusions into her mind as they rode along this quiet forest path. It occurred to her how susceptible he must be to intrusions. What if he were working out some complicated problem in his mind, concentrating very hard, and a great crowd of people approached? or even a single person, who saw him and thought his eyes strange, or admired his rings, or wanted to buy his horse? Did he lose his concentration when other people filtered into his mind? How aggravating that would be! And then she wondered, could she get his attention 
without saying a word? If she needed his help or wanted to stop, could she call to him in his mind? It must be possible. If a person within his range wanted to communicate with him, he must know it. She looked at him riding before her, his back straight and his arms steady, his white shirt sleeves rolled to the elbows, as always. She looked at the trees then, and at her horse's ears, and at the ground before her. She cleared her mind of anything to do with Poe. I'll hunt down a goose for dinner, she thought. The leaves on these trees are just beginning to change color. The weather is so lovely and cool. And then, with all her might, she focused her attention on the back of Poe's head and screamed his name inside her mind. He pulled on his reins so hard that his horse screeched and staggered and almost sat down. Her own horse nearly collided with his, and he looked so startled and flabbergasted and irritated that she couldn't help it. She exploded with laughter. What in the name of Leonid is wrong with you? Are you trying to scare me out of my wits? Is it not enough to ruin your own horse, but you must ruin mine as well? She knew he was angry, but she couldn't stop laughing. Forgive me, Poe. I was only trying to get your attention. And I suppose it never occurs to you to start small. If I told you my roof needed rebuilding, you'd start by knocking down the house. Oh, Poe, don't be angry. She stifled the laugh that rose into her throat. Truly, Poe, I had no idea it would startle you like that. I didn't think I could startle you. I didn't think your grace allowed it. She coughed and forced her face into a mask of penitence, which wouldn't have fooled even the most incompetent of mind-readers. But she hadn't meant it. Truly she hadn't, and he must know that. And finally his hard mouth softened, and a flicker of a smile played across his face. Look at me, he said, unnecessarily, for the smile had already trapped her. Now, say my name, in your mind, as if you wanted to get my attention, quietly as quietly as you would if you were speaking it aloud. She waited a moment, and then she thought it. Poe? He nodded. That's all it takes. Well, that was easy. And you'll notice it caused no abuse to the horse. Very funny. Can we practice while we're riding? And for the rest of the day she called to him on occasion, in her mind. Every time he raised his hand to show that he'd heard even when she whispered. So then she decided to stop calling to him, for it was clear that it worked, and she didn't want to badger him. He looked back at her then and nodded, and she knew that he had understood her. And she rode behind him with her eyes wide and tried to make some sense of their having had an entire conversation of sorts without saying a word. They made camp beside a pond, surrounded by great sundering trees. As they unhooked their bags from the horses, Katza was sure she saw a goose through the reeds, waddling around on the opposite shore. Poe squinted. It does appear to be a goose, and I wouldn't mind a drumstick for dinner. So Katza set out, approaching the creature quietly. It didn't notice her. She decided to walk right up to it and break its neck, as the kitchen women did in the chicken houses of the castle. But as she snuck forward, the goose heard her and began to squawk and run for the water. She ran after the bird, and it spread its massive wings and took to the air. She leaped and wrapped her arms around its middle. She brought it down straight into the pond, surprised by its size. And now she was wrestling in the water with an enormous, flapping, biting, splashing, kicking goose, but only for a moment, for her hands were around its neck, and its neck was snapped before it could close its sharp beak around any part of her body. She turned to the shore then, and was surprised to find Poe standing there, gaping. She stood in the pond, the water streaming from her hair and clothing, and held the huge bird up by the neck for him to see. I got it. He stared at her for a moment, his chest rising and falling for he had run, apparently, at the sight of the underwater struggle. He rubbed his temples. Katza, what in Leonid are you doing? What do you mean? 
I've caught us a goose. Why didn't you use your knife? You're standing in the pond. You're soaked through. It's only water. It was time I washed my clothing anyway. Katza. I wanted to see if I could do it. What if I'm ever traveling without weapons and I need to eat? It's good to know how to catch a goose without weapons. You could have stood at our camp and shot it across the pond if you wanted. I've seen your aim. But now I know I can do this. He shook his head and held out a hand. Come out of there before you catch a chill and give me that. I'll pluck it while you change into dry clothing. I never catch a chill, she said as she waded to shore. He laughed then. Oh, Katza, I'm sure you don't. He took the goose from her hands. Do you still have a fight in you? We can practice while your goose is cooking. Fighting him was different now that she knew his true advantages. It was a waste of her energy, she realized, to fake a blow. She could have no mental advantage over him. No amount of cleverness would serve her. Her only advantages were her speed and her ferocity. And now that she knew this, it became easy enough to adjust her strategy. She didn't waste time being creative. She only pummeled him as fast and as hard as she could. He might know where she aimed her next blow, but after a barrage of hits, he simply couldn't keep up with her anymore. He couldn't move fast enough to block her. They struggled and wrestled as the light faded and the night moved in. Over and over again he surrendered and heaved himself back up to his feet, laughing and moaning. This is good practice for me, but I can't see what you have to gain from it, other than the satisfaction of beating me to a pulp. We'll have to come up with some new drills, something to challenge both of our graces. Keep fighting me once the sky is dark. You'll find us more evenly matched then. It was true. The night sky closed in around them, a black sky with no moon and no stars. Eventually, Katza could no longer see, could only make out his vaguest outline. Her blows, as she threw them, were approximate. He knew she couldn't see, and moved in ways that would confuse her. His defense became stronger, and his own strikes hit her squarely. She stopped him. It's that exact? Your sense of my hands and feet? Hands and feet? Fingers and toes. You're so physical, Katza. You've so much physical energy. I sense it constantly. Even your emotions seem physical sometimes. She squinted at him and considered. Could you fight a person blindfolded? I never have. I could never have tried it, of course, without arousing suspicion. But yes, I could though it would be easier on flat ground. My sense of the forest floor is too inconsistent. She stared at him, a black shape against a blacker sky. Wonderful. It's wonderful. I envy you. We must fight more often at night. He laughed. I won't complain. It'd be nice to be on the offensive every once in a while. They fought just a bit longer, until they both tripped over a fallen branch and Poe landed on his back half-submerged in the pond. He came up spluttering. I think we've <coughs> done enough barreling around in the dark. Shall we check on your goose? The goose sizzled over the fire. Katza poked at it with her knife, and the meat fell away from the bone. It's perfect. I'll cut you your drumstick. She glanced up at him, and in that moment he pulled his wet shirt over his head. She forced her mind blank, blank as a new sheet of paper, blank as a starless sky. He came to the fire and crouched before it. He rubbed the water from his bare arms and flicked it into the flames. She stared at the goose and sliced his drumstick carefully and thought of the blankest expression on the blankest face she could possibly imagine. It was a chilly evening. She thought about that. The goose would be delicious. They must eat as much of it as possible. They must not waste it. She thought about that. I hope you're hungry. I don't want this goose to go to waste. I'm ravenous. He was going to sit there shirtless, apparently, until the fire dried him. A mark on his arm caught her eye, and she took a breath and imagined a blank book full of page after empty page. But then a similar mark on his other arm drew her attention, and her curiosity got the better of her. She couldn't help herself. She squinted at his arms. And it was all right. This was acceptable.
for there was nothing wrong with being curious about the marks that seemed to be painted onto his skin. Dark, thick bands, like a ribbon wrapped around each arm, in the place where the muscles of his shoulder ended and the muscles of his arm began. The bands, one circling each arm, were decorated with intricate designs that she thought might be a number of different colors. It was hard to tell in the firelight. It's a leaned ornamentation, like the rings in my ears. But what is it? Is it paint? It's a kind of dye. And it doesn't wash away? Not for many years. He reached into one of his bags and pulled out a dry shirt. He slipped it down over his head, and Katza thought of a great blank field of snow and breathed a small sigh of relief. She handed him his drumstick. The Leonid people are fond of decoration. Do the women wear the markings? No, only the men. Do the people? Yes. But no one ever sees it. Leonid clothing doesn't show a man's upper arms, does it? No, it doesn't. It's a decoration hardly anyone sees. She caught a smile in his eyes that flashed at her in the light. What? What are you grinning about? It's meant to be attractive to my wife. Katza nearly dropped her knife into the fire. You have a wife? Great seas, no. Honestly, Katza, don't you think I would have mentioned her? He was laughing now, and she snorted. I never know what you'll choose to mention about yourself, Poe. It's meant for the eyes of the wife I'm supposed to have. Whom will you marry? He shrugged. I hadn't pictured myself marrying anyone. She moved to his side of the fire and sliced the other drumstick for herself. She went back and sat down. Aren't you concerned about your castle and your land? About producing heirs? He shrugged again. Not enough to attach me to a person I don't wish to be attached to. I'm content enough on my own. Katza was surprised. I had thought of you as more of a social creature when you're in your own land. When I'm in Leonid, I do a decent job of folding myself into normal society when I must. But it's an act, Katza. It's always an act. It's a strain to hide my grace, especially from my family. When I'm in my father's city, there's a part of me that's simply waiting until I can travel again, or return to my own castle where I'm left alone. This she could understand perfectly. I suppose if you married, it could only be to a woman trustworthy enough to know the truth of your grace. He barked out a short laugh. Yes, the woman I married would have to meet a number of rather impossible requirements. He threw the bone from his drumstick into the fire and cut another piece of meat from the goose. He blew on the meat to cool it. And what of you, Katza? You've broken Giddens' heart with your departure, haven't you? His very name filled her with impatience. Giddon. And can you really not see why I wouldn't wish to marry him? I can see a thousand reasons why you wouldn't wish to marry him. But I don't know which is your reason. Even if I wished to marry, I wouldn't marry Giddon. But I won't marry, not anyone. I'm surprised you hadn't heard that rumor. You were at Randa's court long enough. Oh, I heard it. But I also heard you were some kind of feckless thug and that Randa had you under his thumb, neither of which turned out to be true. She smiled then and threw her own bone into the fire. One of the horses wickered. Some small creature slipped into the pond, the water closing around it with a gulp. She suddenly felt warm and content and full of good food. Raffin and I talked once about marrying, for he's not wild about the idea of marrying some noble woman who thinks only of being rich or being queen. And, of course, he must marry someone. He has no choice in the matter. And to marry me would be an easy solution. We get along. I wouldn't try to keep him from his experiments. He wouldn't expect me to entertain his guests. He wouldn't keep me from the council. She thought of Raffin bending over his books and his flasks. He was probably working on some experiment right now, with Ban at his side. By the time she returned to court, perhaps he would be married to some lady or another. He married, and she not there for him to come to and talk of it. She not there to tell him her thoughts, if he wished to hear them, as he always did. In the end, it was out of the question. We laughed about it, for I couldn't even begin to consider it seriously. I wouldn't ever consent to be queen. And Raffin will require children, which I'd also never consent to. And I won't be so tied to another person, not even Raffin. 
She squinted into the fire and sighed over her cousin, whose responsibilities were so heavy. I hope he'll fall in love with some woman who'll make a happy queen and mother. That would be the best thing for him. Some woman who wants a whole roost of children. Poe tilted his head at her. Do you dislike children? I've never disliked the children I've met. I've just never wanted them. I haven't wanted to mother them. I can't explain it. She remembered Gidden then, who had assured her that this would change, as if he knew her heart, as if he had the slightest understanding of her heart. She threw another bone into the fire and hacked another piece of meat from the goose. She felt Poe's eyes and looked up at him, scowling. Why are you glaring at me, when for all I can tell, you're not angry with me? She smiled. I was only thinking Gidden would have found me a very vexing wife. I wonder if he would have understood when I planted a patch of sea bane in the gardens. Or perhaps he would have thought me charmingly domestic. Poe looked puzzled. What's sea bane? I don't know if you have another name for it in Leonid. It's a small purple flower. A woman who eats its leaves will not bear a child. They wrapped themselves in their blankets and lay before the dying fire. Poe yawned a great deep yawn, but Katza wasn't tired. A question occurred to her, but she didn't want to wake him if he was falling asleep. What is it, Katza? I'm awake. She didn't know if she would ever get used to that. I was wondering whether I could wake you by calling to you inside your mind when you're sleeping. I don't know. I don't sense things while I'm sleeping. But if I'm in danger or if someone approaches, I always wake. You may try it. He yawned again. If you must. I'll try it another night, when you're less tired. Aren't you ever tired, Katza? I'm sure I am, she said, though she couldn't bring a specific example to mind. Do you know the story of King Lek of Mansi? I didn't know there was a story. There is. A story from ages ago, and you should know it if we're to travel to his kingdom. I'll tell it to you, and perhaps you'll feel more tired. He rolled onto his back. She lay on her side and watched the line of his profile in the light of the dying fire. The last king and queen of Mansi were kind people. Not particularly great state minds, but they had good advisors, and they were kinder to their people than most today could even imagine for a king and queen. But they were childless. It wasn't a good thing, Katza, as it would be for you. They wanted a child desperately, so that they might have an heir. But also just because they wanted one, as I suppose most people do. And then one day, a boy came to their court. A handsome boy of about thirteen years. Clever looking, with a patch over one eye, for he'd lost an eye when he was younger. He didn't say where he came from, or who his parents were, or what had happened to his eye. He only came to court begging and telling stories in return for food and money. The servants took him in, for he told such wonderful stories, wild stories about a place beyond the Seven Kingdoms, where monsters came out of the sea and air, and armies burst out of holes in the mountains, and the people are different from anyone we've ever known. Eventually, the king and queen learned of him, and he was brought before them to tell his stories. The boy charmed them completely, charmed them from the first day. They pitied him for his poverty and loneliness and his missing eye. They began to bring him into their presence for meals, or ask for him when they'd returned from long journeys, or call him to their rooms in the evenings. They treated him like a noble boy. He was educated and taught to fight and ride. They treated him almost as if he were their own son. And when the boy was sixteen and the king and queen still didn't have a child of their own, the king did something extraordinary. He named the boy his heir. Even though they knew nothing of his past? Even though they knew nothing of his past. And this is where the story truly becomes interesting, Katza. For not a week after the king had named the boy his heir, the king and queen died of a sudden sickness, and their two closest advisers fell into despair and threw themselves into the river. Or so the story goes. I don't know that there were any witnesses. Katza propped herself on her elbow and stared at him. Do you think that's strange? I've always thought it strange. But the Monsignor people never questioned it, 
and all in my family who've met Lek tell me I'm foolish to wonder. They say Lek is utterly charming, even his eye patch is charming. They say he grieved for the king and queen terribly and couldn't possibly have had anything to do with their deaths. I've never known this story. I didn't even know Lek was missing an eye. Have you met him? I haven't, but I've always had a feeling I wouldn't take to him as others have, despite his great reputation for kindness to the small and the powerless. He yawned and turned onto his side. Well, and I suppose we'll both learn soon enough whether we take to him, if things go as I expect. Good night to you, Katza. We may reach the inn tomorrow. Katza closed her eyes and listened to his breath grow steady and even. She considered the tale he'd told. It was hard to reconcile King Lek's pleasant reputation with this story. Still, perhaps he was innocent. Perhaps there was some logical explanation. She wondered what reception they would receive at the inn, and whether they'd be lucky enough to cross paths with someone who held the information they sought. She listened to the sounds of the pond and the breeze in the grasses. When she thought Poe had fallen asleep, she said his name aloud once, quietly. He didn't stir. She thought his name once, quietly, like a whisper in her mind. Again, he didn't stir, and his breathing didn't change. He was asleep. Katza exhaled slowly. She was the greatest fool in all the seven kingdoms. Why, when she fought with him almost every day, when she knew every part of his body, why, when she'd sat on his stomach and wrestled with him on the ground and could probably identify his armhold faster than any wife would recognize the embrace of her own husband, had the sight of his arms and his shoulders so embarrassed her? She had seen a thousand shirtless men before, in the practice rooms, or when traveling with Giddon and all. Raffin practically undressed in front of her, they were so used to each other. It was like his eyes. Unless they were fighting, Poe's body had the same effect on her as his eyes. His breathing changed, and she froze her thoughts. She listened as his breathing settled back into a rhythm. It was not going to be simple with Poe. Nothing with Poe was going to be simple. But he was her friend, and so she would travel with him. She would help him uncover the kidnapper of his grandfather. And by all means, she would take care not to tumble him into any more ponds. And now she must sleep. She turned her back to him and willed her mind to darkness. Chapter 18 The inn was a great, tall building made of solid lumber. The farther south one rode into Sunder, the heavier and thicker the wood of the trees, and the stronger and more imposing the houses and inns. Katza had not spent much time in central Sunder. Her uncle had sent her there two or three times, perhaps. But the wild forests and simple, sturdy little towns, too far from the borders to be involved in the nonsense of the king's, had always pleased Katza. The walls of the inn felt like castle walls, but darker and warmer. They sat at a table, in a room full of men sitting at tables, heavy, dark tables built from the same wood as the walls. It was the time of day when men of the town and travelers alike poured into the inn's great eating room and sat down to talk and laugh over a cup of something strong to drink. The room had recovered from the hush that afflicted it when Poe and Katza first walked through the door. The men were noisy now and jovial, and if they did peek at the Graceling royalty over their cups and around their chairs, well, at least they didn't stare outright. Poe sat back in his chair. His eyes flicked lazily around the room. He drank from his cup of cider, and his finger traced the wet ring it left on the table. He leaned his elbow on the table and propped his head in his hand. He yawned. He looked, Katza thought, as if he only needed a lullaby, and he would nod off to sleep. It was a good act. His eyes flashed at her then, and with them a glimmer of a smile. I don't think we'll stay long at this inn. There are men in this room who've already taken an interest in us. 
Poe had informed the innkeeper that they would offer money for any information about the kidnapping of Grandfather Tealiff. Men, particularly Sundaran men, if men are like their king, would do a great deal for money. They would change allegiances. They would tell truths they had promised not to reveal. They would also make up stories, but it didn't matter for Poe could tell as much from a lie as he could from the truth. Katza sipped from her cup and looked out into the sea of men. The finery of the merchants stood out among the muted browns and oranges of the people of the town. Katza was the only woman in the room, save a harried serving girl, the innkeeper's daughter, who ran among the tables with a tray full of cups and pitchers. She was small in stature, dark, and pretty, and a bit younger than Katza. She caught no one's eye as she worked and didn't smile, except to the occasional townsman old enough to be her father. She had brought Katza and Poe their drinks silently, with only a quick, shy glance at Poe. Most of the men in the room showed her the proper respect, but Katza didn't much like the smiles on the faces of the merchants whose table she served at the moment. How old is that girl, do you think? Do you think she's married? Poe watched the table of merchants and sipped from his drink. Sixteen or seventeen, I guess. She's not married. How do you know? He paused. I don't. It was a guess. It didn't sound like a guess. He drank from his cup. His face was impassive. It hadn't been a guess. This she knew. And it occurred to her suddenly how he could know such a thing with such certainty. She took a moment to nurse her irritation on behalf of every girl who'd ever admired Poe and thought her feelings private. You're impossible. You're no better than those merchants. And besides, just because she has her eyes on you doesn't mean... And that's not fair. I can't help what I know. My error was in revealing it to you. I'm not used to traveling with someone who knows my grace. I spoke before thinking how unfair it would be to the girl. She rolled her eyes. Spare me your confessions. If she's unmarried, I don't understand why her father sends her out to serve these men. I'm not certain she's safe among them. Her father stands at the bar most of the time. No one would dare harm her. But he's not there always. He's not there now. And just because they don't assault her doesn't mean they respect her. Or that they would not seek her out later. The girl circled the table of merchants pouring cider into each cup. When one of the men reached for her arm, she recoiled. The merchants burst into laughter. The man reached out to her then and drew back, reached out and drew back, taunting her. His friends laughed harder. And then the man at the girl's other side grabbed her wrist and held on, and there was a great whoop from the men. She tried to pull away, but the laughing man wouldn't let go. Red with shame, she looked into none of their faces, only pulled at her arm. She was too much like a dumb, confused rabbit caught in a trap. And suddenly Katza was standing, and Poe was standing too, and he had Katza by the arm. For an instant, Katza appreciated the strange symmetry, except that unlike the serving girl, she could break from Poe's grip, and unlike the merchant, Poe had good reason to hold her arm and Katza wouldn't break from the grip of his fingers, for she didn't need to. Her rise to her feet had been enough. The room froze into stillness. The man dropped the girl's arm. He stared at Katza with a white face and an open mouth. Fear, as familiar to Katza as the feel of her own body. The girl stared too, and caught her breath, and pressed her hand to her chest. Sit down, Katza. Poe's voice was low. It's over now. Sit down. She did sit down. The room let out its breath. After a few moments, voices murmured and then talked and laughed again. But Katza wasn't sure that it was over. Perhaps it was over with this girl and these merchants, but there would be a new group of merchants tomorrow, and these merchants would move on and find themselves another girl. Later that evening, as Katza prepared for bed, two girls came to her room to cut her hair. Is it too late, my lady? 
asked the elder, who carried scissors and a brush. No, the sooner I have it off, the better. Please come in. They were young, younger than the serving girl. The younger, a child of ten or eleven years, carried a broom and a dustpan. They sat Katza down and moved around her shyly. They spoke little, breathless around her, not quite frightened but near to it. The older girl untied Katza's hair and began to work her fingers through the tangle. Forgive me if I hurt you, my lady. It won't hurt me, and you needn't unravel the knots. I want you to cut it all off, as short as you can, as short as a man's. The eyes of both girls widened. I've cut the hair of many men. The older girl said, "You may cut mine just as you've cut theirs. The shorter you cut it, the happier I'll be." The scissors snipped around Katz's ears, and her head grew lighter and lighter. How odd to turn her neck and not feel the pull of hair, the heavy snarl swinging around behind her. The younger girl held the broom and swept the hair clippings away the instant they fell to the floor. Is it your sister I saw serving drinks in the eating room? Yes, my lady. How old is she? Sixteen, my lady. And you? I'm fourteen, and my sister eleven, my lady. Katza watched the younger girl collecting hair with a broom taller than she was. Does anyone teach the girls of the inn to protect themselves? Do you carry a knife? Our father protects us, and our brother. The girl said simply. The girls clipped and swept, and Katz's hair fell away. She thrilled at the unfamiliar chill of air on her neck, and wondered if other girls in Sunder and across the Seven Kingdoms carried knives, or if they all looked to their fathers and brothers for every protection. A knock woke her. She sat up. It came from the door that adjoined her room to pose. She hadn't been asleep long, and it was midnight. And enough moonlight spilled through her window so that if it wasn't Poe who knocked, and if it was an enemy, she could see well enough to beat the person senseless. All these thoughts swept through her mind in the instant she sat up. Katza, it's only I. His voice called through the keyhole. It's a double lock. You must unlock it from your side. She rolled out of bed, and where was the key? My key was hanging beside the door. He called, and she took a moment to glare in his general direction. I only guessed you were looking for the key. It wasn't my grace, so you needn't get all huffy about it. Katza felt along the wall. Her fingers touched a key. Doesn't it make you nervous to holler like that? Anyone could hear you. You could be revealing your precious grace to a whole legion of my lovers. His laughter came muffled through the door. I would know if anyone heard my voice, and I'd also know if you were in there with a legion of lovers. Katza, have you cut your hair? She snorted. Wonderful. That's just wonderful. I've no privacy, and you sense even my hair. She turned the key in the lock and swung the door open. Poe straightened. A candle in his hand. Great seas! What do you want? He held his candle up to her face. Poe, what do you want? She did a far better job than I would have done. I'm going back to bed. Katza said, and she reached for the door. All right, all right. The men, the merchants, the Sundaran men who are bothering that girl. I think they intend to come to us this night and speak to us. How do you know? Their rooms are below us. She shook her head, disbelieving. No one in this inn has privacy. My sense of them is faint, Katza. I cannot sense everyone down to the ends of their hair, as I do you. She sighed. What an honor then to be me. They're coming in the middle of the night. Yes. Do they have information? I believe they do. Do you trust them? Not particularly. I think they'll come soon, Katza. When they do, I'll knock on your outer door. Katza nodded. Very well, I'll be ready. She stepped back into her room and pulled the door behind her. She lit a candle, splashed water on her face, and prepared herself for the arrival of the late night merchants. Six merchants had sat around the table in the eating room and laughed at the serving girl. 
When Poe's knock brought her to the door, she found him standing in the hallway with all six, each carrying a candle that cast a dark light over a bearded face. They were tall and broad-backed, all six of them, enormous next to her, and even the smallest taller and broader than Poe. Quite a band of bullies. She followed them back to Poe's room. You're awake and dressed, my lord prince, my lady, the biggest of the merchants said as they filed into Poe's chamber. It was the man who'd first tried to grab the girl's arm, the one who'd first teased her. Katza registered the mockery as he spoke their titles. He had no more respect for them than they had for him. The one who'd taken the girl's wrist stood beside him, and those two seemed to be the leaders of the group. They stood together in the middle of the room, facing Poe, while the other four faded into the background. They were well spread out, these merchants. Katza moved to the side door, the door that led to her room, and leaned against it with her arms crossed. She was steps from Poe and the two leaders, and she could see the other four. It was more precaution than was necessary. But it didn't hurt for any of them to know she was watching. We've been receiving visitors throughout the night, Poe said, an easy lie. You're not the only travelers at the inn who have information about my grandfather. Be careful of the others, Lord Prince, said the biggest merchant. Men will lie for money. Poe raised an eyebrow. Thank you for your warning. He slouched against the table behind him and put his hands in his pockets. Katza swallowed her smile. She rather enjoyed Poe's cocky laziness. What information do you have for us? How much will you pay? I'll pay whatever the information warrants. There are six of us. I'll give it to you in coins divisible by six if that's what you wish. I meant, Lord Prince, that it's not worth our time to divulge information if you'll not compensate us enough for six men. Poe chose that moment to yawn. When he spoke, his voice was calm, even friendly. I won't haggle over a price when I don't know the breadth of your information. You'll be fairly compensated. If that doesn't satisfy you, you're free to leave. The man rocked on his feet for a moment. He glanced sideways at his partner. His partner nodded, and the man cleared his throat. Very well. We have information that links the kidnapping to King Burn of Wester. How interesting, Poe said, and the farce had begun. Poe asked all the questions one would ask if one were conducting this interrogation seriously. What was the source of their information? Was the man trustworthy who had spoken of Byrne? What was the motivation for the kidnapping? Had Byrne the assistance of any other kingdoms? Was Grandfather Tealiff in Byrne's dungeons? How were Byrne's dungeons guarded? Well, lady, Poe said, with a glance in her direction. We'll have to send word quickly, so that my brothers know to investigate the dungeons of Burn of Wester. You won't travel there yourselves? The man was surprised, and disappointed most likely, that he hadn't managed to send Poe and Katza on a futile mission. We go south and east, to Monsi and King Lek. Lek was not responsible for the kidnapping. I never said he was. Lek is blameless. You waste your energies searching Monsi when your grandfather is in Wester. Poe yawned again. He shifted his weight against the table and crossed his arms. He looked back at the man blandly. We don't go to Monsi in search of my grandfather. It is a social visit. My father's sister is the queen of Monsi. She's been most distressed by the kidnapping. We mean to call on her. Perhaps we can bring the comfort of your news to the Monsian court. One of the merchants in the background cleared his throat. A lot of sickness there, he said from his corner. At the Monsian court? Poe's eyes moved to the man calmly. Is that so? The man grunted. Hmm. I have family in Lex's service. Distant family. Two little girls who worked in his shelter, cousins of some kind. Well, they died a few months back. What do you mean, in his shelter? Lex animal shelter. He rescues animals, Lord Prince. You'll know that. Yes, of course, but I didn't know about the shelter. The man seemed to enjoy being the center of Poe's attention. He glanced at his companions and lifted his chin. Well, Lord Prince, 
He's got hundreds of them, dogs, squirrels, rabbits, bleeding from slashes on their backs and bellies. Poe narrowed his eyes. Slashes on their backs and bellies, he repeated carefully. You know, as if they'd run into something sharp, the man said. Poe stared at him for a moment. Of course. And any broken bones? Any sickness? The man considered. I've never heard tell of any of that, Lord Prince. Just lots of cuts and slashes that take a wondrous long time to heal. He's got a staff of children who help him nurse the little creatures to recovery. They say he's very dedicated to his animals. Poe pursed his lips. He glanced at Katza. I see. And do you know what sickness the girls died of? The man shrugged. Children are not very strong. We've moved to a different topic now, the biggest merchant said, interrupting. We agreed to give you information about the kidnapping, not about this. We'll be wanting more money to compensate. And anyway, I'm suddenly dying of a sickness called boredom, his partner said. Oh, ho, ho, said the first. Perhaps you have a more amusing diversion in mind. With different company, said the man in the corner. They were laughing now, the six of them chuckling over a private joke Katza had a feeling she understood. Alas, for protective fathers and locked bedroom doors, the partner said very low to his friends, but not too low for Katza's sensitive ears. She surged toward the men before the burst of laughter had even begun. Poe blocked her so fast that she knew he must have started imperceptibly first. Stop, he said to her softly. Think. Breathe. The wave of impulsive anger swept over her, and she allowed his body to block her path to the merchant, to the two of them, to all six of them, for these men were all the same to her. You're the only man in seven kingdoms who can keep that wildcat on a leash, said one of the two men. She wasn't sure which one, for she was distracted by the effect the words had on Poe's face. It's fortunate for us she has such a sensible keeper, the man continued. And you're a lucky fellow yourself. The wild ones are the most fun if you can control them. Poe looked at her, but he didn't see her. His eyes snapped. Silver ice and gold fire. The arm that blocked her stiffened, and his hand tightened into a fist. He inhaled, endlessly it seemed. He was furious. She saw this, and she thought he was going to strike the man who had spoken. And for a panicky moment, she didn't know whether to stop him or help him. Stop him. She would stop him, for he wasn't thinking. She took his forearms and gripped them tightly. She thought his name into his head. Poe, stop, think, she thought into his mind, just as he had said to her. Think. He began to breathe out as slowly as he'd breathed in. His eyes refocused and he saw her. He turned around and stood beside her. He faced the two men. It didn't even matter which of them had spoken. Get out. His voice was very quiet. We would have our payment. Poe took a step toward the men, and they stepped back. He held his arms at his sides with a casual calmness that didn't fool anyone in the room. Have you the slightest notion to whom you're speaking? He asked. Do you imagine you'll receive a coin of my money when you've spoken this way? You're lucky I let you go without knocking your teeth from your mouths. Are you sure we shouldn't? Katza said looking into the eyes of each man, one after the other. I'd like to do something to discourage them from touching the innkeeper's daughter. We won't, one of them gasped. We won't touch anyone, I swear it. You'll be sorry if you do. Sorry for the rest of your short, wretched lives. We won't, my lady, we won't. They backed to the door, their faces white, their smirks vanished now. It was only a joke, my lady. I swear it. Get out. Your payment is that we won't kill you for your insults. The men scrambled from the room. Poe slammed the door behind them. Then he leaned his back against the door and slid down until he sat on the floor. He rubbed his face with his hands and heaved a deep sigh.
Katza took a candle from the table and came to crouch before him. She tried to measure his tiredness and his anger in the bend of his head and the hardness of his shoulders. He dropped his hands from his face and rested his head against the door. He watched her face for a moment. I truly thought I might hurt that man very badly. I didn't know you were capable of such temper. Apparently I am. Poe, Katza said, as a thought occurred to her. How did you know I intended to attack them? My intentions were toward them, not you. Yes, but my sense of your energy heightened suddenly, and I know you well enough to guess when you're likely to take a swing at someone. He half smiled tiredly. No one could ever accuse you of being inconsistent. She snorted. She sat on the floor before him and crossed her legs. And now will you tell me what you learned from them? Yes. He closed his eyes. What I learned. To start with, other than that fellow in the corner, they barely spoke a true word. It was a game. They wanted to trick us into paying them for false information, to get back at us for the incident in the eating room. They're small-minded. Very small-minded. But they've helped us nonetheless. It's Lek, Katza. I'm sure of it. The man lied when he said Lek was not responsible. And yet, and yet there was something else very strange that I could make no sense of. He shook his head and stared into his hands, thinking. It's so odd, Katza. I felt this strange defensiveness rise in them. What do you mean, defensiveness? As if they all truly believed Lek's innocence and wished to defend him to me. But you just said Lek is guilty. He is guilty, and these men know it. But they also believe him innocent. That makes utterly no sense. He shook his head again. I know, but I'm sure of what I sensed. I tell you, Katza, when the man said that Lek was not responsible for the kidnapping, he was lying. But when he said a moment later, Lek is blameless, he meant it. He believed himself to be telling the truth. Poe gazed up at the dark ceiling. Are we supposed to conclude that Lek kidnapped my grandfather, but for some innocent reason? It simply cannot be. Katza couldn't comprehend the things Poe had learned, any more than she could comprehend the manner in which he'd learned them. None of this makes sense. He came down out of his thoughts for a moment and focused on her. Katza, I'm sorry. This must be overwhelming to you. I am capable of sensing quite a lot, you see, from people who want to fool me but don't know to guard their thoughts and feelings. She couldn't understand it. She gave up trying to make sense of the king who was both guilty and innocent. She watched Poe as he became distracted by his thoughts again and stared again into his hands. The merchants hadn't known to guard their thoughts and feelings. If it was a thing that could be done, then she at least wanted to learn how to do it. She felt his eyes and realized he was watching her. You do keep some things from me. She started, then focused on blankness for a moment. Or you have, since you've learned of my grace. I mean, I've felt you keeping things from me. You're doing it now. And I can tell you it works, because my grace shows me nothing. I'm always a bit relieved when it works, Katza. Truly, I don't wish to take your secrets from you. He sat up straight his face lit with an idea. You know, you could always knock me unconscious. I wouldn't stop you. Katza laughed then. I wouldn't. I've promised you I won't hit you, except in our practices. But it's self-defense in this case. It is not. It is, he insisted, and she laughed again at his earnestness. I'd rather strengthen my mind against you than knock you out every time I have a thought I don't want you to know. Yes, well... And I'd prefer that also, believe me. But I grant you permission to knock me out, if ever you need to. I wish you wouldn't. You know how impulsive I am. I don't care. If you grant me permission, I'll probably do it, Poe. I'll probably... He held up his hand. It's an equalizer. When we fight, you hold your grace back. I can't hold my grace back, so you must have the right to defend yourself. She didn't like it. But she could not miss his point, and she could not miss his willingness, his dear willingness, to give over his grace for her. You will always have a headache, she warned. Perhaps Raffin included his salve for headaches among the medicines. <laughs>
I should like to change my hair now that you've changed yours. Blue would suit me, don't you think? She was laughing again, and she swore to herself that she wouldn't hit him. She wouldn't unless she were entirely desperate. And then the candle on the floor beside them dimmed and died. Their conversation had gotten entirely off track. They were leaving for Monsey early in the morning, most likely, and it was the middle of the night, and everyone in the inn and the town slept. Yet here they were, sitting on the floor, laughing in the dark. We leave for Monsey tomorrow, then? We'll fall asleep on our horses. I'll fall asleep on my horse. You'll ride as if you've slept for days, as if it's a race between us to see who reaches Monsey first. And what will we find when we get there? A king who's innocent of the things of which he's guilty? He rubbed his head. I've always thought it strange that my mother and father have no suspicions about Lek, even knowing his story. And now these men seem to think him blameless in the kidnapping, even knowing he's not. Can he be so kind in the rest of his life that everyone forgives his crimes or fails to see them? He sat for a moment quietly. I've wondered. It occurs to me recently that he could be graced, that he could have a grace that changes the way people think of him. Are there such graces? I don't even know. It had never occurred to her, but he could be graced. With one eye missing, he could be graced and no one would ever know. No one would even suspect, for who could suspect a grace that controlled suspicions? He could have the grace of fooling people, the grace of confusing people with lies, lies that spread from kingdom to kingdom. Imagine it, Katza, people carrying his lies in their own mouths and spreading them to believing ears, absurd lies, erasing logic and truth all the way to lean it. Can you imagine the power of a person who had such a grace? He could create whatever reputation for himself he wished. He could take whatever he wanted, and no one would ever hold him responsible. Katza thought of the boy who was named heir, and the king and queen who died shortly thereafter, the advisors who supposedly jumped into the river together, and a whole kingdom of mourners who never thought to question the boy who had no family, no past, no Monsian blood flowing through his veins, but who had become king. But his kindness, the animals— that man spoke of the animals he restores to health. And that's the other thing. That man truly believed in Lex philanthropy. But am I the only person who finds it a bit odd that there should be so many slashed-up dogs and squirrels in Monsey that need rescuing? Are the trees and the rocks made of broken glass? But he's a kind man if he cares for them. Poe peered at Katza strangely. You're defending him, too, in the face of logic that tells you not to just like my parents and just like those merchants. He's got hundreds of animals with bizarre cuts that don't heal, Katza, and children in his employ dying of mysterious illnesses, and you're not the slightest bit suspicious. He was right. Katza saw it, and the truth in all its gruesomeness trickled into her mind. She began to have a conception of a power that spread like a bad feeling, like a sickness itself, seizing all minds that it touched. Could there be a grace more dangerous than one that replaced sight with a fog of falseness? Katza shuddered, for she would be in the presence of this king soon enough. She wasn't certain what defense even she could raise against a man who could fool her into believing his innocent reputation. Her eyes traced Poe's silhouette, dark against the black door. His white shirt was the only part of him truly visible, a luminous gray in the darkness. She wished suddenly that she could see him better. He stood and pulled her to her feet. He pulled her to the window and looked down into her face. The moonlight caught a glimmer in his silver eye and a gleam in the gold of his ear. She didn't know why she had felt so anxious or why the lines of his nose and his mouth, or the concern in his eyes, should comfort her. What is it? What's bothering you? If Lek has this grace, as you suspect... Yes? How will I protect myself from him? He considered her seriously. Well, and that's easy. <laughs>
My grace will protect me from him, and I'll protect you. You'll be safe with me, Katza. In her bed, thoughts swirled like a windstorm in her mind, but she ordered herself to sleep. In an instant, the storm quieted. She slept under a blanket of calm. Chapter 19 There were two ways to get to Lex City from the inn or from any point in Sunder. One was to travel south to one of the Sunderan ports and sail southeast to Monport, the westernmost port city of the Mansian Peninsula, where a road led north to Lex City, across flatland just east of Mansi's highest peaks. This route was traveled by merchants who carried goods and most parties containing women, children, or the elderly. The other way was shorter but more difficult. It led southeast through a sundering forest that grew thicker and wilder and rose to meet the mountains that formed Monsey's border with Sunder and Estel. The path became too rocky and uneven for horses. Those who crossed the mountain pass did so on foot. An inn on either side of the pass bought or kept the horses of those who approached the mountains and sold or returned them to those who came from the mountains. This was the route Katza and Poe would take. Lex City was the walk of a day or so beyond the mountain pass, less if they purchased new horses. The walk to the city wound through valleys grown lush with the water that flowed down from the mountaintops. It was a landscape of rivers and streams, similar to that of inland Lenid, Poe told Katza, or so the Mansian queen had written, which made it a landscape unlike anything Katza had ever seen. As they rode, Katza couldn't content herself with imagining the strange landscapes ahead, for when she'd awakened to morning in the Sundaran Inn, the windstorm of the night before had returned to her mind. Poe's grace would protect Poe from Lek, and Poe would protect her. With Poe, Katza would be safe. He'd said it simply, as if it were nothing. But it wasn't nothing for Katza to rely on someone else's protection. She'd never done such a thing in her life. And besides, wouldn't it be easier for her to kill Lek immediately, before he said a word or raised a finger, or gag him, immobilize him, find some way to disempower him completely, maintain control and ensure her own defense? Katza didn't need protection. There would be a solution. There would be a way for her to protect herself from Lek, if indeed he had the power they suspected. She only needed to think of it. Late in the morning, the skies began to drip. By afternoon, the drizzle had turned to rain, a cold, relentless rain that beat down and hid the forest road from their sight. Finally, they stopped, soaked to the skin, to see what they could do about shelter before night fell. The tangle of trees on either side of the road provided some cover. They tethered the horses under an enormous pine that smelled of the sap dripping from its branches with the rainwater. It's as dry a place as we're likely to find. A fire will be impossible, but at least we won't sleep in the rain. A fire is never impossible. I'll build it, and you find us something to cook on it. So Poe set out into the trees with his bow, somewhat skeptically, and Katza set to work building a fire. It wasn't easy, with the world around her soaked right through, but the pine tree had protected some of the needles nestled closely to its trunk, and she uncovered some leaves and a stick or two that were not quite waterlogged. With the strike of her knife, a number of gentle breaths, and whatever protection her own open arms could give, a flame began to lick its way through the damp little tower of kindling. It warmed her face as she leaned into it. 
it pleased her. She'd always had a way with fires. With Al and Gidden, the fire had always been her responsibility. Further evidence, of course, that she didn't need to rely on anyone for her survival. She left the flicker of light and scrambled to find it more food. When Poe came back, dripping, to their camp, she was grateful for the fat rabbit in his hand. My grace is definitely still growing, he said, wiping water from his face. Since we entered this forest, I've noticed a greater sensitivity to animals. This rabbit was hiding in the hollow of a tree, and it seems to me I shouldn't have known he was there. He stopped at the sight of her small, smoky fire. He watched as she breathed into it and fed it with her collection of twigs and branches. Katza, how did you manage it? You're a wonder. She laughed at that. He crouched beside her. It's good to hear you laugh. You've been so quiet today. You know, I'm quite cold, though I didn't realize it until I felt the heat of these flames. Poe warmed himself, saw to their dinner, and chatted. Katza began to open their bags and hang blankets and clothing from the lowest branches of the pine to dry them as best they could. When the meat of the rabbit was propped sizzling above the flames, Poe joined her. He unrolled their maps and held a soggy corner near the fire. He opened Raffin's packet of medicines and inspected them, setting the labeled envelopes onto rocks to dry. It was comfortable, their camp, with the drops plopping down from above and the warmth of the fire and the smell of burning wood and cooking meat. Poe's patter of conversation was comfortable. Katza kept the fire alive and smiled at his talk. She fell asleep that night in a blanket partly dried, secure in the certainty that she could survive anywhere on her own. She woke in the middle of the night in a panic, certain that Poe had gone and that she was alone. But it must have been the tail end of a dream, snagging into her consciousness as it departed, for she could hear his breath through the even fall of rain. When she turned over and sat up, she could make out his form on the ground beside her. She reached out and touched his shoulder, just to make sure. He had not left her. He was here, and they were traveling together through the Sundaran forest to the Monsian border. She lay down again and watched the outline of his sleeping body in the darkness. She would accept his protection after all, if truly she needed it. She was not too proud to be helped by this friend. He'd helped her in a thousand ways already. And she would protect him as fiercely, if it were ever his need, if a fight ever became too much for him, or if he needed shelter, or food, or a fire in the rain or anything she could provide. She would protect him from everything. That was settled then. She closed her eyes and slipped into sleep. Katza didn't know what was wrong with her when she woke the next morning. She couldn't explain the fury she felt toward him. There was no explanation and perhaps he knew that because he asked for none. He only commented that the rain had stopped, watched her as she rolled her blanket, deliberately not looking at him, and carried his things to the horses. As they rode, still she did not look at him, and though he couldn't have missed the force of her fury, he made no comment. She wasn't angry that there was a person who could provide her with help and protection. That would be arrogance, and she saw that arrogance was foolishness. She should strive for humility, and there was another way he'd helped her. He'd gotten her thinking about humility. But it wasn't that. It was that she hadn't asked for a person whom she trusted, whom she would do so much for, whom she would give herself over to. She hadn't asked for a person whose absence, if she woke in the middle of the night, would distress her. Not because of the protection he would then fail to give, but simply because she wished his company. She hadn't asked for a person whose company she wished. Katza couldn't bear her own inanity. She drew herself into a shell of sullenness and chased away every thought that entered her mind.
When they stopped to rest the horses beside a pond swollen with rainwater, he leaned against a tree and ate a piece of bread. He watched her calmly, silently. She didn't look at him, but she was aware of his eyes on her, always on her. Nothing was more infuriating than the way he leaned against the tree and ate bread and watched her with those gleaming eyes. What are you staring at? She finally demanded. This pond is full of fish and frogs, catfish, hundreds of them. Don't you think it's funny I should know that with such clarity? She would hit him for his calmness and his latest ability to count frogs and catfish he couldn't see. She clenched her fists and turned, forced herself to walk away. Off the road, into the trees, past the trees, and then she was running through the forest, startling birds into flight. She ran past streams and patches of fern and hills covered with moss. She shot into a clearing with a waterfall that fell over rocks and plummeted into a pool. She yanked off her boots, pulled off her clothing, and leaped into the water. She screamed at the cold that surrounded her body all at once, and her nose and mouth filled with water. She surfaced, coughed and snorted, teeth chattering. She laughed at the coldness and scrambled to shore. And now, standing in the dirt, the cold raising every hair of her body on end, she was calm. It was when she returned to him, chilled and clear-headed, that it happened. He sat against the tree, his knees bent and his head in his hands. His shoulders slumped, tired, unhappy. Something tender caught in her breath at the sight of him, and then he raised his eyes and looked at her, and she saw what she had not seen before. She gasped. His eyes were beautiful. His face was beautiful to her in every way, and his shoulders and hands, and his arms that hung over his knees, and his chest that was not moving because he held his breath as he watched her, and the heart in his chest. This friend. How had she not seen this before? How had she not seen him? She was blind. And then tears choked her eyes, for she had not asked for this. She had not asked for this beautiful man before her with something hopeful in his eyes that she did not want. He stood, and her legs shook. She put her hand out to her horse to steady herself. I don't want this. Katza, I hadn't planned for it either. She gripped the edges of her saddle to keep herself from sitting down on the ground between the feet of her horse. You, you have a way of upending my plans, he said. And she cried out and sank to her knees, then heaved herself up furiously before he could come to her and help her and touch her. Get on your horse, right now. We're riding. She mounted and took off without even waiting to be sure he followed. They rode, and she allowed only one thought to enter her mind over and over. I don't want a husband. I don't want a husband. She matched it to the rhythm of her horse's hooves. And if he knew her thought, all the better. When they stopped for the night, she did not speak to him, but she couldn't pretend he wasn't there. She felt every move he made without seeing it. She felt his eyes watching her across the fire he built. It was like this every night, and this was how it would continue to be. He would sit there gleaming in the light of the fire, and she unable to look at him, because he glowed, and he was beautiful, and she couldn't stand it. Please, Katza, he finally said. At least talk to me. She swung around to face him. What is there to talk about? You know how I feel and what I think about it. And what I feel? Doesn't that matter? His voice was small, so unexpectedly small in the face of her bitterness that it shamed her. She sat down across from him. Poe, oh, 
forgive me. Of course it matters. You may tell me anything you feel. He seemed suddenly not to know what to say. He looked into his lap and played with his rings. He took a breath and rubbed his head. And when he raised his face to her again, she felt that his eyes were naked, that she could see right through them into the lights of his soul. She knew what he was going to say. I know you don't want this, Katza, but I can't help myself. The moment you came barreling into my life, I was lost. I'm afraid to tell you what I wish for, for fear you'll, oh, I don't know, throw me into the fire, or more likely refuse me, or worst of all, despise me, he said, his voice breaking and his eyes dropping from her face, his face dropping into his hands. I love you. You're more dear to my heart than I ever knew anyone could be. And I've made you cry. And there... I'll stop. She was crying, but not because of his words. It was because of a certainty she refused to consider while she sat before him. She stood. I need to go. He jumped up. No, Katza, please. I won't go far, Poe. I just need to think, without you in my head. I'm afraid if you leave, you won't come back. Poe. This assurance, at least, she could give him. I'll come back. He looked at her for a moment. I know you mean that now, but I'm afraid once you've gone off to think, you'll decide the solution is to leave me. I won't. I can't know that. No, you can't. But I need to think on my own, and I refuse to knock you out, so you have to let me go. And once I'm gone, you'll just have to trust me as any person without your grace would have to do, and as I have to do always, with you. He looked at her with those naked, unhappy eyes again. Then he took a breath and sat down. Put a good ten minutes between us, if you want privacy. Ten minutes was a far greater range than she'd understood his grace to encompass, but that was an argument for another time. She felt his eyes on her back as she passed through the trees. She groped forward, hands and feet, in search of darkness, distance, and solitude. Alone in the forest, Katza sat on a stump and cried. She cried like a person whose heart is broken and wondered how, when two people loved each other, there could be such a broken heart. She couldn't have him, and there was no mistaking it. She could never be his wife. She could not steal herself back from Randa only to give herself away again, belong to another person, be answerable to another person, build her very being around another person, no matter how she loved him. Katza sat in the darkness of the Sundaran forest and understood three truths. She loved Poe, she wanted Poe, and she could never be anyone's but her own. After a while, she began to thread her way back to the fire. Nothing had changed in her feeling, and she wasn't tired. But Poe would suffer if he didn't sleep, and she knew he wouldn't sleep until she had returned. He was lying on his back, wide awake, staring up at a half-moon. She went to him and sat before him. He watched her with soft eyes and didn't say anything. She looked back at him and opened up her feelings to him, so that he would understand what she felt, what she wanted, and what she couldn't do. He sat up. He watched her face for a long time. You know, I'd never expect you to change who you are if you were my wife, he finally said. It would change me to be your wife. He watched her eyes. Yes, I understand you. A log fell into the fire. They sat quietly. His voice, when he spoke, was hesitant. It strikes me that heartbreak isn't the only alternative to marriage. <laughs> 
What do you mean? He ducked his head for a moment. He raised his eyes to her again. I'll give myself to you, however you'll take me, he said, so simply that Katza found she wasn't embarrassed. She watched his face. And where would that lead? I don't know, but I trust you. She watched his eyes. He offered himself to her. He trusted her as she trusted him. She hadn't considered this possibility when she'd sat alone in the forest crying. She hadn't even thought of it. And his offer hung suspended before her now, for her to reach out and claim. And that which had seemed clear and simple and heartbreaking was confused and complicated again, but also touched with hope. Could she be his lover and still belong to herself? That was the question, and she didn't know the answer. I need to think. Think here, please. I'm so tired, Katza. I'll fall right asleep. She nodded. All right. I'll stay. He reached up and wiped away a tear that sat on her cheek. She felt the touch of his fingertip in the base of her spine and fought against it, against allowing him to know of it. He lay down. She stood and moved to a tree outside the light of their fire. She sat against it and watched Poe's silhouette, waiting for him to fall asleep. Chapter 20 The notion of having a lover was to Katza something like discovering a limb she'd never noticed before, an extra arm or toe. It was unfamiliar, and she poked and prodded it as she would have prodded an alien toe unexpectedly her own. That the lover would be Poe reduced her confusion somewhat. It was by thinking of Poe and not of the notion of a lover that Katza became comfortable enough to consider what it would mean to lie in his bed but not be his wife. It took more than the thinking of one night. They moved through the sunder and forest, and they talked and rested and made camp as before, but their silences were perhaps a bit less easy than they had been, and Katza broke off occasionally to keep her own company and think in solitude. They did not practice fighting, for Katza was shy of his touch, and he didn't press it upon her. He pressed nothing upon her, even conversation, even his gaze. They moved as quickly as the road allowed, but the farther they traveled, the more the road resembled a trail at best, winding through overgrown gullies and around trees the size of which Katza had never seen, trees with trunks as wide as the horses were long, and branches that groaned far above them. They had to duck sometimes to avoid curtains of vines hanging from the branches. The land rose as they moved east, and streams crisscrossed the forest floor. Their route at least provided some distraction for Poe. He couldn't stop looking around, his eyes wide. It's wild, this forest. Have you ever seen anything like this? It's gorgeous. Gorgeous and full of animals fattening themselves for winter easy hunting, and easy finding shelter. But Katza felt palpably that the horses were moving as slowly as her mind. I think we would move faster on our feet. You'll miss the horses when we have to give them up. And when will that be? It looks possibly ten days away on the map. I'll prefer traveling by foot. You never tire, do you? I do, if I haven't slept for a long time. Or if I'm carrying something very heavy. I felt tired when I carried your grandfather up a flight of stairs. He glanced at her, eyebrows high. You carried my grandfather up a flight of stairs? Yes, at Randa's castle. After a day and night of hard riding? Yes. His laugh burst out, but she didn't see the joke. I had to do it, Poe. If I hadn't, the mission would have failed. He weighs as much as you, and half as much again. Well, and I was tired by the time I got to the top. You wouldn't have been so tired. I'm bigger than he is, Katza. I'm stronger. And I would have been tired had I spent the night on my horse. I had to do it. I had no choice. Your grace is more than fighting. She didn't respond to that. 
and after a moment's puzzlement she forgot it. Her mind returned to the matter at hand, as it couldn't help but do, with Poe always before her. What was the difference between a husband and a lover? If she took Poe as her husband, she would be making promises about a future she couldn't yet see. For once she became his wife, she would be his wife forever. And no matter how much freedom Poe gave her, she would always know that it was a gift. Her freedom would not be her own. It would be Poe's to give or to withhold. That he would never withhold it made no difference. If it did not come from her, it was not really hers. If Poe were her lover, would she feel captured, cornered into a sense of forever? Or would she still have the freedom that sprang from herself? They were lying on opposite sides of a dying fire one night when a new worry occurred to her. What if she took more from Poe than she could give to him? Poe? She heard him turn onto his side. Yes? How will you feel if I'm forever leaving? If one day I give myself to you and the next I take myself away, with no promises to return? Katza, a man would be a fool to try to keep you in a cage. But that doesn't tell me how you'll feel, always to be subject to my whim. It isn't your whim. It's the need of your heart. You forget that I'm in a unique position to understand you, Katza. Whenever you pull away from me, I'll know it's not for lack of love. Or if it is, I'll know that too, and I'll know it's right for you to go. But you're not answering my question. How will you feel? There was a pause. I don't know. I'll probably feel a lot of things, but only one of the things will be unhappiness. And unhappiness I'm willing to risk. Katza stared up into the treetops. Are you sure of that? He sighed. I'm certain. He was willing to risk unhappiness. And there was the crux of the matter. She couldn't know where this would lead, and to proceed was to risk all kinds of unhappiness. The fire gasped and died. She was frightened, for as their camp turned to darkness, she also found herself choosing risk. The next day, Katza would have given anything for a clear, straight path for hard riding and thundering hooves to drown out all feeling. Instead, the road wound back and forth, up rises and into gullies, and she didn't know how she kept herself from screaming. Nightfall led them into a hollow where water trickled into a low, still pool. Moss covered the trees and the ground. Moss hung from the vines that hung from the trees and dripped into the pool that shone green like the floor of Randa's courtyard. You seem a bit edgy. Why don't you hunt? I'll build a fire. She allowed the first few animals she stumbled across to escape. She thought that if she plunged deeper into the forest and took more time, she might wear down some of her jitters. But when she returned to camp much later with a fox in hand, nothing had changed. He sat calmly before the fire, and she thought she might burst apart. She threw their meat onto the ground beside the flames. She sat on a rock and dropped her head into her hands. She knew what it was rattling around inside her. It was fear, plain and cold. She turned to him. I understand why we shouldn't fight each other when one of us is angry. But is there harm in fighting when one of us is frightened? He looked into the fire and considered her question evenly. He looked into her face. I think it depends on what you hope to gain by fighting. I think it'll calm me. I think it'll make me comfortable with... with you being near. She rubbed her forehead, sighing. It'll return me to myself. He watched her. It does seem to have that effect on you. Will you fight me now, Poe? He watched her for a moment longer and then moved away from the fire and motioned for her to follow. She walked after him, dazed, her mind buzzing so crazily it was numb, 
and when they faced each other, she found herself staring at him dumbly. She shook her head to clear it, but it did no good. Hit me! He paused for a fraction of a second. Then he swung at her face with one fist, and she flashed her arm upward to block him. The explosion of arm on arm woke her from her stupor. She would fight him, and she would beat him. He hadn't beaten her yet, and he wouldn't beat her tonight, no matter the darkness and no matter the whirlwind in her mind. For now that they fought, the whirlwind had vanished. Katz's mind was clear. She hit hard and fast, with hand, elbow, knee, foot. He hit hard, too, but it was as if every blow focused some energy inside her. Every tree they slammed into, every root they tripped over, centered her. She fell into the comfort of fighting with Poe, and the fight was ferocious. When she wrestled him to the ground and he pushed her face away, she called out, Wait! Blood! I taste blood! He stopped struggling. Where? Not your mouth? I think it's your hand. He sat up and she crouched beside him. She took his hand and squinted into his palm. Is it bleeding? Can you tell? It's nothing. It was the edge of your boot. We shouldn't be fighting in boots. We can't fight barefoot in the forest, Katza. Truly, it's nothing. Nonetheless, there's blood on your mouth, he said, in a funny, distracted sort of voice that made plain how little he cared about his injured hand. He raised a finger and almost touched her lip, and then dropped his finger, as if he realized suddenly that he was doing something he shouldn't. He cleared his throat and looked away from her. And she felt it then, how near he was. She felt his hand and his wrist warm under her fingers. He was here, right here, breathing before her. She was touching him, and she felt the risk, as if it were water splashing cold on her skin. She knew that this was the moment to choose. She knew her choice. He turned his eyes back to her, and in them she saw that he understood. She climbed into his arms. They clung to each other, and she was crying, as much from relief to be holding him as from the fear of what she did. He rocked her in his lap and hugged her, and whispered her name over and over, until finally her tears stopped. She wiped her face on his shirt. She wrapped her arms around his neck. She felt warm in his arms, and calm, and safe, and brave. And then she was laughing laughing at how nice it felt, how good his body felt against hers. He grinned at her, a wicked gleaming grin that made her warm everywhere. And then his lips touched her throat and nuzzled her neck. She gasped. His mouth found hers. She turned to fire. Some time later, as she lay with him in the moss, clinging to him, Hypnotized by something his lips did to her throat, she remembered his bleeding hand. Later, he growled, and then she remembered the blood on her mouth, but that only brought his mouth to hers again, tasting, seeking, and his hands fumbling at her clothing, and her hands fumbling at his, and the warmth of his skin as their bodies explored each other. And after all, they knew each other's bodies as well as any lover's. But this touch was so different, straining toward instead of against. Paul, she said once, when one clear thought pierced her mind. It's in the medicines. There is sea bane in the medicines. And his hands and his mouth and his body returned her to mindlessness. He made her drunk. This man made her drunk and every time his eyes flashed into hers, she could not breathe. She expected the pain when it came, but she gasped at its sharpness. It was not like any pain she had felt before. He kissed her and slowed and would have stopped, but she laughed and said that this one time she would consent to hurt and bleed at his touch. He smiled into her neck and kissed her again, and she moved with him through the pain.
the pain became a warmth that grew, grew and stopped her breath and took her breath and her pain and her mind away from her body so that there was nothing but her body and his body and the light and fire they made together. They lay afterward, warmed by each other and by the heat of the fire. She touched his nose and his mouth. She played with the hoops in his ears. He held her and kissed her, and his eyes flickered into hers. Are you all right? She laughed. I have not lost myself. And you? He smiled. I'm very happy. She traced the line of his jaw to his ear and down to his shoulder. She touched the markings that ringed his arms. And Raffin thought we'd end this way, too. Apparently, I'm the only one who didn't see it coming. Raffin will make a very good king, Poe said, and she laughed again and rested her head in the crook of his arm. Let's pick up the pace tomorrow, she said, thinking of men who were not good kings. Yes, all right. Are you in pain still? No. Why do you suppose it happens that way? Why does a woman feel that pain? She had no answer to that. Women felt it. That was all she knew. Let me clean your hand. I'll clean you first. She shivered as he left her to go to the fire and find water and cloths. He leaned into the light, and brightness and shadows moved across his body. He was beautiful. She admired him, and he flashed a grin at her. Almost as beautiful as you are conceited, she thought at him, and he laughed out loud. It struck her that this should feel strange, to be lying here, watching him, teasing him, to have done what they'd done and be what they'd become. But instead it felt natural and comfortable, inevitable and only the smallest bit terrifying. Chapter 21 They had entire conversations in which she didn't say a word, for Poe could sense when Katza desired to talk to him, and if there was a thing she wanted him to know, his grace could capture that thing. It seemed a useful ability for them to practice, and Katza found that the more comfortable she grew with opening her mind to him, the more practiced she became with closing it as well. It was never entirely satisfying, closing her mind, because whenever she closed her feelings from him, she must also close them from herself. But it was something. They found it was easier for him to pick up her thoughts than it was for her to formulate them. She thought things to him, word by word at first, as if she were speaking, but silently. Do you want to stop and rest? Shall I catch us some dinner? I've run out of water. Of course I understand you when you're that precise, but you don't need to try so hard. I can understand images, too, or feelings, or thoughts in unformed sentences. This was also hard for her at first. She was afraid of being misunderstood and she formulated her images as carefully as she'd formulated her words. Fish roasting over their fire. A stream. The herbs, the sea bane that she must eat with dinner. If you only open a thought to me, Katza, I'll see it, no matter how you think it. If you intend me to know it, I will. But what did it mean to open a thought to him, to intend for him to know it? She tried simply reaching out to his mind whenever she wanted him to know something. Poe? And then leaving it to him to collect the essence of the thought. It seemed to work. She practiced constantly, both communicating with him and closing him out. Slowly, the tightness of her mind loosened. Beside the fire one night, protected from the rain by a shelter of branches she'd built, she asked to see his rings. He placed his hands into hers. She counted. Six plain gold rings, 
of varying widths on his right hand. On his left, one plain gold, one thin with an inlaid gray stone running through the middle, one wide and heavy with a sharp glittery white stone, this the one that must have scratched her that night beside the archery range, and one plain and gold like the first, but engraved all around with a design she recognized from the markings on his arms. It was this ring that made her wonder if the rings had meaning. Yes, every ring worn by Alinid means something. This with the engraving is the ring of the king's seventh son. It's the ring of my castle and my princehood, my inheritance. Do your brothers have a different ring and markings on their arms that are different from yours? They do. She fingered the great heavy ring with the jagged white stone. This is the ring of a king. Yes, this ring is for my father. And this, he said, fingering the small one with a gray line running through the middle, for my mother, this plain one for my grandfather. Was he never king? His older brother was king. When his brother died, he would have been king had he wished it. But his son, my father, was young and strong and ambitious. My grandfather was old and unwell and content to pass the kingship to his son. And what of your father's mother? And your mother's father and mother? Do you wear rings for them? No, they're dead. I never knew them. She took his right hand. And these? You don't have enough fingers for the rings on this hand. These are for my brothers, one for each. The thickest for the oldest, and the thinnest for the youngest. Does this mean that your brothers all wear an even thinner ring for you? That's right. And my mother and grandfather, too. And my father. Why should yours be the smallest, just because you're the youngest? That's the way it is, Katza. But the ring they wear for me is different from the others. It has a tiny inlaid gold stone and a silver. For your eyes? Yes. It's a special ring for your grace? The leaned honor the graced. Well, and that was a novel idea. She hadn't known that anyone honored the graced. You don't wear rings for your brother's wives or their children? He smiled. No, thankfully. But I would wear one for my own wife, and if I had children, I'd wear a ring for each. My mother has four brothers, four sisters, seven sons, two parents, and a husband. She wears nineteen rings. And that is absurd. How could she use her fingers? He shrugged. I've no difficulty using mine. He raised her hands to his mouth then and kissed her knuckles. You wouldn't catch me wearing that many rings. He laughed, turned her hands over, and kissed her palms and her wrists. I wouldn't catch you doing anything you didn't want to do. And here was what was rapidly becoming her favorite aspect of Poe's grace. He knew, without her telling him, the things she did want to do. He dropped to his knees before her now, with a smile that looked like mischief. His hand grazed her side and then pulled her closer. His lips brushed her neck. She caught her breath, forgot whatever retort she'd been about to form, and enjoyed the gold chill of his rings on her face and her body and every place that he touched. You believe Lek cuts those animals up himself, she said to him one day while they were riding. Don't you? He glanced back at her. I realize it's a disgusting accusation, but yes, that's what I believe. And I also wonder about the sickness that man spoke of. You think he's killing people off. Poe shrugged and didn't answer. Do you think Queen Ashen closed herself away from him because she figured out that he's graced? I've wondered about that, too. But how could she have figured it out? Shouldn't she be completely under his spell? I've no idea. Perhaps he went too far with his abuses, and she had a moment of mental clarity. He raised a branch that hung in their path and ducked under it. Perhaps his grace only works to a point. Or perhaps there was no grace. Perhaps it was no more than a ridiculous notion they'd come up with in a desperate attempt to explain unexplainable circumstances but a king and queen had died, and no one had called foul. A king had kidnapped a grandfather, and no one suspected him. A one-eyed king. <laughs>
it was a grace, or if it was not, it was something unnatural. The path grew thinner and more overgrown, and they walked with the horses more than they rode. And now all the trees seemed to change color at once, the leaves orange and yellow and crimson and purple and brown. Only a day or two to go before they reached the inn that would take their horses, and then the steep climb into the mountains, with their belongings on their backs. There would be snow in the mountains, Poe said, and there would not be many travelers. They would need to move cautiously and watch for storms. But you're not worried, are you, Katza? Not particularly. Because you never get cold, and you can bring down a bear with your hands and build us a fire in a blizzard using icicles for kindling. She would not humor him by laughing, but she couldn't suppress a smile. They had encamped for the evening. She was fishing, and when she fished, he always teased her, for she didn't fish with a line as he would have. She fished by removing her boots, rolling up the legs of her trousers, and wading into the water. She'd then snatch up any fish that came within range of her grasp and throw it to Poe, who sat on shore laughing at her, scaling and gutting their dinner, and keeping her company. It's not many people whose hands are faster than a fish. Katza snatched at a silver pink glimmer that flashed past her ankles, then tossed the fish to Poe. It's not many people who know that a horse has a stone caught in its hoof, even when the horse shows no signs of it either. I may be able to kill my dinner as easily as I kill men, but at least I'm not conversing with the horses. I don't converse with the horses. I've only started to know if they want us to stop, and once we've stopped, it's usually easy enough to find what's wrong. Well, regardless, it seems to me that you're not in a position to marvel at the strangeness of my grace. Poe leaned back on his elbows and grinned. I don't think your grace is strange, but I think it's not what you think it is. She grabbed at a dark flash in the water and threw a fish to him. What is it then? Now that I don't know, but a killing grace can't account for all the things you can do, the way you never tire, or suffer from the cold, or from hunger. I tire. Other things too, the knack you have with fire in a rainstorm. I'm just more patient than other people. Poe snorted. Yes, patience has always struck me as one of your defining characteristics. He dodged the fish that flew at his head and sat back again, laughing. Your eyes are bright as you stand in that water with the sun setting before you. You're beautiful. Stop it. And you're a fool. Come out of there, wildcat. We've enough fish. She waded to shore, meeting her at the edge of the water. He pulled her up onto the moss. Together they gathered up the fish and walked to the fire. I tire, and I feel cold and hunger. All right, if you say so, but just compare yourself to other people. Compare herself to other people. She sat down and dried her feet. Shall we fight tonight? She nodded absently. He set the fish above the flames and hummed and washed his hands. And flashed his light at her from across the fire. She sat, and thought to herself about what she found when she compared herself to other people. She did feel cold sometimes, but she didn't suffer from it as other people did, and she felt hunger sometimes, but she could go long with little food, and hunger did not make her weak. She couldn't remember ever feeling weak exactly, for any reason. Nor could she remember ever having been ill. She thought back and was certain she'd never even had a cough. She stared into the fire. They were a bit unusual. These things, she could see that, and she knew there was more. She fought and rode and ran and tumbled, but her skin rarely bruised or broke. She'd never broken a bone. And she didn't suffer from pain the way other people did. Even when Poe hit her very hard, the pain was easily manageable. If she was being honest, she'd have to admit that she didn't quite understand what other people meant when they complained of pain. She didn't tire as other people did. She didn't need much sleep. Most nights she made herself sleep, only because she knew she should. Poe. He looked up from the fire. Can you tell yourself to go to sleep? 
What do you mean? I mean, can you lie down and make yourself fall asleep? Whenever you want, instantly? He squinted at her. No, I've never heard of such a thing. Hmm. He studied her for a moment longer, and then seemed to decide to let her be. She barely noticed him. It had never occurred to her before that the control she had over her sleep might be unusual, and it wasn't just that she could command herself to sleep. She could command herself to sleep for a specific amount of time, and whenever she woke, she always knew exactly what time it was. At every moment of the day, in fact, she always knew the time. Just as she always knew exactly where she was and what direction she was facing. Which way is north? He looked up again and considered the light. He pointed in a direction that was loosely north, but not exactly. How did she know that with such certainty? She never got lost. She never had trouble building a fire or shelter. She hunted so easily. Her vision and her hearing were better than those of anyone she'd ever known. She stood abruptly. She strode the few steps back to the pond and stared into it without seeing it. The physical needs that limited other people did not limit her. The things from which other people suffered did not touch her. She knew instinctively how to live and thrive in the wilderness. And she could kill anyone at the slightest threat to her survival. Katza sat on the ground suddenly. Could her grace be survival? The instant she asked it, she denied it. She was just a killer, had always been just a killer. She'd killed a cousin in plain view of Randa's court, a man who wouldn't have hurt her, not really. She'd murdered him without a thought, without hesitation, just as she'd very nearly murdered her uncle. But she hadn't murdered her uncle. She'd found a way to avoid it and stay alive. And she hadn't meant for that cousin to die. She'd been a child, her grace unformed. She hadn't lashed out to kill him. She'd only lashed out to protect herself, to protect herself from his touch. She'd forgotten this somewhere along the line, when the people of the court had begun to shy away from her, and Randa had begun to use her skill for his own purposes and call her his child killer. Her grace was not killing. Her grace was survival. She laughed then, for it was almost like saying her grace was life, and of course that was ridiculous. She stood again and turned back to the fire. Poe watched her approach. He didn't ask what she was thinking. He didn't intrude. He would wait until she wanted to tell him. She looked at him, measuring her from across the flames. He was plainly curious. I've been comparing myself to other people. I see, he said cautiously. She peeled back the skin of one of the roasting fish and sliced off a piece. She chewed on it and thought. Poe? He looked up at her. If you learned that my grace wasn't killing, but survival... He raised his eyebrows. Would it surprise you? He pursed his lips. No. It makes much more sense to me. But it's like saying my grace is life. Yes. It's absurd. Is it? I don't think so. And it's not just your own life. You've saved many lives with your grace. She shook her head. Not as many as I've hurt. Possibly. But you have the rest of your life to tip the balance. You'll live long. The rest of her life to tip the balance. Cats peeled the flesh of another fish away from its bones. She broke the flaky meat apart and ate it. And thought about that. Smiling. Chapter 22 The trees gave way suddenly, and the mountains came upon them all at once. And with the mountains, the town that would take their horses.
The buildings were made of stone or of heavy sunder and wood, but it was the town's backdrop that stopped Katz's breath. She'd seen the hills of Estel, but she'd never seen mountains. She'd never seen silver trees that climbed straight up into the sky, and rock and snow that climbed even higher, to peaks impossibly high that shone gold in the sun. It reminds me of home. Leenid is like this? Parts of Leenid. My father's city stands near mountains like these. Well, it reminds me of nothing, for I've never seen anything like it. I almost can't believe I'm seeing it now. There was no camping and no hunting for them that night. Their meal was cooked for them and served by the rough, friendly wife of the innkeeper, who seemed unconcerned with their graceling eyes and wanted to know everything they'd seen on their journey and everyone they'd passed. They ate in a room warm from the fire in a great stone fireplace. Hot stew, hot vegetables, hot bread, and the entire eating room to themselves. Chairs to sit on, and a table, and plates and spoons. Their baths afterwards warm. Their bed warm, and softer than Katza had remembered a bed could be. It was luxury, and they enjoyed it for they knew it was the last such comfort they were likely to experience for some time. They left before sunlight broke over the peaks, with provisions wrapped by the innkeeper's wife and cold water from the inn's well. They carried most of their belongings, all that they had not left behind with the horses, one bow and one quiver on Katz's back, as she was the better shot. Neither of their swords, though both carried dagger and knife, their bedrolls, little clothing, coins, the medicines, the maps, the list of council contacts. The sky they climbed toward turned purple, then orange and pink. The mountain path bore the signs of the crossings of others, fires gone cold, boot impressions in the dirt. In some places, huts had been built for the use of travelers, empty of furniture but with crude, functional fireplaces built by the combined efforts of Sunder, Estel, and Monsi, in a time long ago when the kingdoms worked together for the safe passage of travelers across their borders. A roof and four walls can save you in a blizzard in the mountains. Were you ever caught in the mountains during a blizzard? I was once with my brother Silvern. We were out climbing and a storm surprised us. We found the hut of a woodsman. If we hadn't, we'd likely be dead. We were trapped for four days. For four days we ate nothing but the bread and apples we'd brought along, and the snow. Our mother almost gave us up for lost. Which brother is Silvern? My father's fifth son. It's a shame you hadn't the animal sense then that you have now. You could have gone out and unearthed a mole or a squirrel. And lost myself on the way back to the hut. Either that, or return to a brother who'd think it was awfully suspicious that I managed to hunt in a blizzard. They climbed over dirt and grass that gave way at times to rock, climbed always with the mountain peaks rising before them. It felt good to be out of the forest, to climb, to move fast. The vast, empty sky glinted its sun onto her face and filled her lungs with air. She was content. Why have you never trusted your brothers with your grace? My mother forbade me when I was a child, absolutely forbade me to tell them. I hated to keep it from them particularly Silvern and Skye, who's closest in age to me. But now I know my brothers as men, and I see my mother was right. Why? Aren't they to be trusted? They are with most things. But they're all made of ambition, Katza, every one of them, constantly playing off each other to gain favor with my father. As things stand now, I'm no threat to them, because I'm the youngest and have no ambition. And they respect me, for they know it would take all six of them together to beat me in a fight. But if they knew the truth of my grace, they'd try to use me. They wouldn't be able to help themselves. But you wouldn't let them. No, but then they'd resent me. And I'm not sure one of them wouldn't give in to the temptation to tell his wife, or his advisors, and my father would learn. It would all fall apart. They stopped at a trickle of water. Katza drank some and washed her face. Your mother had foresight. Above all, she feared my father learning of it. He lowered his flask into the water. He's not an unkind father, but it's hard to be king. Men will trick power away from a king however they can. I would have been too useful to him. 
He couldn't have resisted using me. He simply couldn't. And that was the greatest thing my mother feared. Did he never want to use you as a fighter? Certainly. And I've helped him. Not as you've helped Randa. My father isn't the bully Randa is. But it was my mind that my mother feared him using. She wanted my mind to be my own and not his. It didn't seem right to Katza that a mother should have to protect her child from its father. But she didn't know much of mothers and fathers. She hadn't had a mother or a father to protect her from Randa's use. Perhaps rather than fathers, it was kings that were the danger. Your grandfather agreed that no one should know the truth of your grace? My grandfather agreed. Would your father be very angry if he learned the truth now? He'd be furious with me, my mother, and my grandfather. They'd all be furious, and rightfully so. It's a huge deception we've pulled off, Katza. You had to. Nonetheless, it would not be easily forgiven. Katza pulled herself onto a jumble of stones and stopped to look around. They seemed no closer to the tops of the peaks that rose before them. It was only by looking back to the forest far below that she knew they'd climbed. That and the drop in temperature. She shifted her bags and stepped back onto the trail. And then the thought of queens protecting children from kings registered more deeply in her mind. Poe, Lek has a daughter. Yes, Bitterblue. She's ten. Bitterblue could have a role in this strange affair. If Lek was trying to hurt her, it would explain Queen Ashen hiding away with her. Poe stopped in his tracks and turned to look at her anxiously. If he cuts up animals for pleasure, I hate to think what he would want with his own daughter. The question hung in the air between them, eerie and horrible. Katza thought suddenly of the two dead little girls. Let's hope you're wrong, Poe said, his hand to his stomach as if he felt ill. Let's move faster, just in case I'm right. They set off almost at a run. They followed the path upward, through the mountains that separated them from Mansi and whatever truth it contained. They woke the next morning on the floor of a dusty hut to a dead fire and a winter cold that seeped through the crack under the door. The frozen stars melted as Katza and Poe climbed, and light spread across the horizon. The path grew steeper and more rocky. The pace of their climb pushed away the chill and the stiffness that Katza didn't feel, but that Poe complained of. I've been thinking about how we should approach Lex Court. He climbed from one rock to another and jumped to a third. What were you thinking? Well, I'd like to be more certain of our suspicions before meeting him. Should we find an inn outside the court and stay there our first night? That's my thought. But we shouldn't waste any time. No. If we can't learn anything helpful in one night, then perhaps we should go ahead and present ourselves to the court. They climbed and Katza wondered what that would be like, whether they would pose as friends to the court and infiltrate it gradually, or whether they would enter on the offensive and instigate an enormous fight. She pictured Lek as a smirking, insincere man standing at the end of a velvet carpet, his single eye narrowed and clever. She imagined herself shooting an arrow into his heart so that he crumpled to his knees, bled all over his carpet, and died at the feet of his stewards. At Poe's command, her strike. It would have to be at Poe's command, for until they knew the truth of his grace, she couldn't trust her own judgment. Poe, that's true, isn't it? He took a moment to gather her thoughts. I've some ideas about that as well. Once we're in Monsi, would you consent to do what I say, and only what I say, just until I have a sense of Lex's power? Would you ever consent to that? Of course I would, Poe, in this case. And you must expect me to behave strangely. I'll have to pretend I'm graced with fighting, no more, and that I believe every word he says. And I'll practice my archery and my knife-throwing, for I've a feeling that when all is asked and revealed, King Lek will find himself on the end of my blade. Poe shook his head and did not smile. I've a feeling it's not going to be that easy. The third day of their crossing was the windiest and the coldest. 
The mountain pass led them between two peaks that were hidden sometimes behind cyclones of snow. Their boots crunched through patches of snow, and flakes drifted onto their shoulders from the thin blue sky and melted into Katz's hair. I like winter in the mountains, she said. But Poe laughed. This isn't winter in the mountains. This is autumn in the mountains, and a mild autumn at that. Winter is ferocious. I think I should like that too, she said, and Poe laughed again. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. You'd thrive on the challenge of it. The weather held, so that Katz's declaration could not be put to the test. They moved as fast as the terrain would permit. For all his marveling at Katz's energy, Poe was strong and quick. He teased her for the pace she set, but he didn't complain. And if he stopped sometimes for food and water, Katza was grateful. For it reminded her to eat and drink as well, and it gave her an excuse to turn around and stare behind them, at the mountains that stretched from east to west, at the whole world she could see, for she was so high that she felt she could see the whole world. And then suddenly they reached the top of the pass. Before them the mountains plunged into a forest of pines, green valleys stretched beyond. Broken by streams and farmhouses and tiny dots that Katza guessed were cows, and a line, a river, that thinned into the distance and led to a miniature white city at the edge of their sight, Lek City. I can barely see it, but I trust your vision. I see buildings, and a dark wall around a white castle, and look, see the farmhouses in the valley. Surely you can make those out. And the cows? Do you see the cows? Yes, I can see them now that you mention it. It's gorgeous, Katza. Have you ever seen a sight so gorgeous? She laughed at his happiness. For a moment, as they looked down on Monsi, the world was beautiful, and without worry. The downhill scramble was more treacherous than the uphill climb. Poe complained that his toes were liable to burst through the front of his boots, and then he complained that he wished they would, for they ached from the constant downhill beat of his feet. And then Katza noticed that he stopped complaining altogether and sank into a preoccupation. Poe, we're moving fast. Yes. He shaded his eyes with his hand and squinted down at the fields of Monsi. I only hope it's fast enough. They camped that night beside a stream that ran with melting snow. She sat on a rock and watched his eyes that glimmered with worry. He glanced at her and smiled suddenly. Would you like something sweet to eat with this rabbit? Of course, but it makes little difference what I want if all we have is rabbit. He stood then and turned away into the scrub. Where are you going? He didn't answer. His boots scraped on rock as he disappeared into blackness. She stood. Poe. Don't worry your heart, Katza. His voice came from a distance. I'm only finding what you want. If you think I'm just going to sit here, sit down. You'll ruin my surprise. She sat, but she let him know what she thought of him and his surprise, rattling around in the dark and breaking his ankles on the rocks, most likely, so she'd have to carry him the rest of the way down the mountain. A few minutes passed, and she heard him returning. He stepped into the light and came to her, his hand cupped before him. When he knelt before her, she saw a little mound of berries in his palm. She looked into the shadows of his face. Winter berries. Winter berries. She took one from his hand and bit into it. It popped with a cold sweetness. She swallowed the soft flesh and watched his face, confused. Your Grace showed them to you. These winter berries. Yes. Poe, this is new, isn't it? That you should sense a plant with such clarity? It's not as if it were moving or thinking or about to crash down on top of you. He sat back on his heels. He tilted his head. The world is filling in around me, piece by piece. The fuzziness is clearing. To be honest, it's a bit disorienting. I'm ever so slightly dizzy. Katza stared at him. There was nothing to say in response to this. His grace was showing him winter berries, and he was ever so slightly dizzy.
tomorrow he would be able to tell her about a landslide on the other side of the world, and they would both faint. She sighed and touched the gold in his ear. If you put your feet into the stream, the snow water will soothe your toes, and I'll rub the warmth back into them when you're done. And if I'm cold in places other than my toes, will you warm me there, too? His voice was a grin, and she laughed into his face. But then he took her chin in his hand and looked into her eyes seriously. Katza, when we get closer to Lek, you must do whatever I tell you to. Do you promise? I promise. You must, Katza. You must swear it. Poe, I've promised it before, and I'll promise it again, and swear it too. I'll do what you say. He watched her eyes, and then he nodded. He emptied the last few berries into her hand and bent down to his boots. My toes are such a misery. I'm not sure it's wise to release them. They may revolt and run off into the mountains and refuse to return. She ate another winterberry. I expect I'm more than a match for your toes. The next day there were no more jokes from Poe, about his toes or anything else. He hardly spoke, and the farther they moved down the path that led to King Lek, the more anxious he seemed to become. His mood was contagious. Katza was uneasy. You'll do what I say when the time comes, he asked her once. She opened her mouth to give voice to a surge of irritation at the question she'd already answered and must now answer again. But at the sight of him trudging down the path beside her, tense and worried, she lost hold of her anger. I'll do what you say, Poe. 